Prefaces to Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Fricker. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. Sexual Inversion by Havelock Ellis. Preface to the Third Edition. It has been remarked by Professor Wilhelm Ostwald that the problem of homosexuality is a problem left over to us by the Middle Ages, which for five hundred years dealt with inverts as it dealt with heretics and witches. To regard the matter thus is to emphasize its social and humanitarian interest rather than its biological and psychological significance. It is no doubt this human interest of the question of inversion, rather than its scientific importance, great as the latter is, which is mainly responsible for the remarkable activity with which the study of homosexuality has been carried on during recent years. The result has been that, during the fourteen years that have passed since the last edition of this study was issued, so vast an amount of work has been carried on in this field that the preparation of a new edition of the book has been a long and serious task nearly every page has been rewritten or enlarged and the index of authors consulted has more than doubled in length the original portions of the book have been still more changed sixteen new histories have been added selected from others in my possession as being varied typical and full these extensive additions to the volume have rendered necessary various omissions many of the shorter and less instructive histories contained in earlier editions have been omitted as well as three appendices which no longer seem of sufficient interest to retain in order to avoid undue increase in the size of this volume already much larger than in the previous editions a new study of eonism or sexo-aesthetic inversion will be inserted in volume five where it will perhaps be at least as much in place as here Preface to the First Edition It was not my intention to publish a study of an abnormal manifestation of the sexual instinct before discussing its normal manifestations. It has happened, however, that this part of my work is ready first, and since I thus gain a longer period to develop the central part of my subject, I do not regret the change of plan. I had not at first proposed to devote a whole volume to sexual inversion. It may even be that I was inclined to slur it over as an unpleasant subject, and one that it was not wise to enlarge on. But I found in time that several persons for whom I felt respect and admiration were the congenital subjects of this abnormality. At the same time I realized that in England, more than in any other country, the law and public opinion combined to place a heavy penal burden and a severe social stigma on the manifestations of an instinct which to those persons who possess it frequently appears natural and normal. It was clear, therefore, that the matter was in special need of elucidation and discussion. There can be no doubt that a peculiar amount of ignorance exists regarding the subject of sexual inversion. I know medical men of many years' general experience who have never, to their knowledge, come across a single case. We may remember, indeed, that some fifteen years ago the total number of cases recorded in scientific literature scarcely equalled those of British race which I have obtained, and that before my first cases were published not a single British case, unconnected with the asylum or the prison, had ever been recorded. Probably not a very large number of people are even aware that the turning in of the sexual instinct towards persons of the same sex can ever be regarded as inborn, so far as any sexual instinct is inborn, and very few indeed would not be surprised if it were possible to publish a list of the names of sexually inverted men and women who at the present time are honourably known in church, state, society, art or letters it could not be positively affirmed of all such persons that they were born inverted but in most the inverted tendency seems to be instinctive and appears at a somewhat early age in any case however it must be realized that in this volume we are not dealing with subjects belonging to the lunatic asylum or the prison we are concerned with individuals who live in freedom some of them suffering intensely from their abnormal organization but otherwise ordinary members of society. In a few cases we are concerned with individuals whose moral or artistic ideals have widely influenced their fellows, who know nothing of the peculiar organization which has largely moulded those ideals. 
i am indebted to several friends for notes observations and correspondence on this subject more especially to one referred to as z and to another as q who have obtained a considerable number of reliable histories for me and have also supplied many valuable notes to josiah flint whose articles on tramps in atlantic monthly and harper's magazine have attracted wide attention for an appendix on homosexuality among tramps to doctors kiernan lidston and talbot for assistance at various points noted in the text and to dr k an american woman physician who kindly assisted me in obtaining cases and has also supplied an appendix other obligations are mentioned in the text all those portions of the book which are of medical or medico-legal interest including most of the cases have appeared during the last three years in the alienist and neurologist the journal of medical science the central blatt für nervenheilkunde the medico-legal journal and the archivo della psychopathie sessuale the cases as they appear in the present volume have been slightly condensed but nothing of genuine psychological interest has been admitted owing to some delay in the publication of the english edition of the work a german translation by my friend dr hans Kurler, editor of the central blatt für nervenheilkund has already appeared in the bibliothek für social wissenschaft the german edition contains some matter which has finally been rejected from the english edition as of minor importance on the other hand much has been added to the english edition and the whole carefully revised i have only to add that if it may seem that i have unduly ignored the cases and arguments brought forward by other writers it is by no means because i wish to depreciate the valuable work done by my predecessors in this field it is solely because i have not desired to popularize the results previously reached but simply to bring forward my own results if i had not been able to present new facts in what is perhaps a new light i should not feel justified in approaching the subject of sexual inversion at all End of the prefaces. Part one of Chapter One of Studies in the Psychologies of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Introduction sexual inversion as here understood means sexual instinct turned by inborn constitutional abnormality towards persons of the same sex it is thus a narrower term than homosexuality which includes all sexual attractions between persons of the same sex even when seemingly due to the accidental absence of the natural objects of sexual attraction a phenomenon of wide occurrence among all human races and among most of the higher animals it is only during recent years that sexual inversion has been recognized previously it was not distinguished from homosexuality in general and homosexuality was regarded as a national custom as an individual vice or as an unimportant episode in grave forms of insanity we have further to distinguish sexual inversion and all other forms of homosexuality from another kind of inversion which usually remains so far as the sexual impulse itself is concerned heterosexual that is to say normal inversion of this kind leads a person to feel like a person of the opposite sex and to adopt so far as possible the tastes habits and dress of the opposite sex while the direction of the sexual impulse remains normal this condition i term sexo-aesthetic inversion or eonism the nomenclature of the highly important form of sexual perversion with which we are here concerned is extremely varied and most investigators have been much puzzled in coming to a conclusion as to the best most exact and at the same time most colourless names to apply to it the first in the field in modern times was ulrichs who as early as eighteen sixty two used the appellation uranian urania based on the well-known myth in plato's banquet later he germanized this term into earning for the male and earning in for the female and referred to the condition itself as earningtum thus he invented a number of other related terms on the same basis some of these terms have had a considerable vogue but they are too fanciful and high-strung to secure general acceptance if used in other languages than german they certainly should not be used in their germanized shape and it is scarcely legitimate to use the term earning in english uranian is more correct 
in germany the first term accepted by recognized scientific authorities was contrary sexual feeling contraire sexual empfindung it was devised by westphal in eighteen sixty nine and used by kraft ebbing and moll though thus accepted by the earliest authorities in this field and to be regarded as a fairly harmless and vaguely descriptive term it is somewhat awkward and is now little used in germany it was never currently used outside germany it has been largely superseded by the term homosexuality this also was devised by a little-known hungarian doctor benkert who used the pseudonym kurtbeny in the same year eighteen sixty nine but at first attracted no attention it has philologically the awkward disadvantage of being a bastard term compounded of greek and latin elements but its significance sexual attraction to the same sex is fairly clear and definite while it is free from any question-begging association of either favourable or unfavourable character edward carpenter has proposed to remedy its bastardly linguistic character by transforming it into homogenic this however might mean not only towards the same sex but of the same kind and in german already possesses actually that meaning the term homosexual has the further advantage that on account of its classical origin it is easily translatable into many languages it is now the most widespread general term for the phenomena we are dealing with and it has been used by hirschfeld now the chief authority in this field as the title of his encyclopedic work the homosexualitat sexual inversion in french inversion sexuale and in italian inversione sessuale is the term which has from the first been chiefly used in france and italy ever since charcot and magnan in eighteen eighty two published their cases of this anomaly in the archive de neurologie it had already been employed in italy by tamasia in the revista sperimentale de Franiatria in eighteen seventy eight i have not discovered when and where this term sexual inversion was first used possibly it first appeared in english for long before the paper of charcot and magna i have noticed in an anonymous review of westphal's first paper in the journal of mental science then edited by dr maudsley for october eighteen seventy one that contraire sexual empfindung is translated as inverted sexual proclivity so far as i am aware sexual inversion was first used in english as the best term by j a simmons in eighteen eighty three in his privately printed essay Say a problem in greek ethics later in eighteen ninety seven the same term was adopted i believe for the first time publicly in english in the present work it is unnecessary to refer to the numerous other names which have been proposed a discussion of the nomenclature will be found in the first chapter of hirschfeld's work de homosexualitat and of some special terms in an article by schurten sexual problema december nineteen twelve it may suffice to mention the ancient theological and legal term sodomy sodomia because it is still the most popular term for this perversion though it must be remembered it has become attached to the physical act of intercourse per anum even when carried out heterosexually and has little reference to psychic sexual proclivity this term has its origin in the story narrated in genesis chapter nineteen of lot's visitors whom the men of sodom desired to have intercourse with and of the subsequent destruction of sodom and gomorrah this story furnishes a sufficiently good ground for the use of the term though the jews do not regard sodomy as the sin of sodom but rather inhospitality and hardness of heart to the poor and christian theologians also both catholic and protestant have argued that it was not homosexuality but their other offences which provoked the destruction of the cities of the plain in germany sodomy has long been used to denote bestiality or sexual intercourse with animals but this use of the term is quite unjustified in english there is another term buggery identical in meaning with sodomy and equally familiar bugger in french bugger, is a corruption of bulgar the ancient bulgarian heretics having been popularly supposed to practice this perversion the people of every country have always been eager to associate sexual perversions with some other country than their own the terms usually adopted in the present volume are sexual inversion and homosexuality 
the first is used more especially to indicate that the sexual impulse is organically and innately turned towards individuals of the same sex the second is used more comprehensively of the general phenomena of sexual attraction between persons of the same sex even if only of a slight and temporary character it may be admitted that there is no precise warrant for any distinction of this kind between the two terms the distinction in the phenomena is however still generally recognized thus ivan bloch applies the term homosexuality to the congenital form and pseudo homosexuality to its spurious or simulated forms those persons who are attracted to both sexes are now termed bisexual a more convenient term than psychosexual hermaphrodite which was formerly used there remains the normal person who is heterosexual before approaching the study of sexual inversion in cases which we may investigate with some degree of scientific accuracy there is interest in glancing briefly at the phenomena as they appear before us as yet scarcely or at all differentiated among animals among various human races and at various periods among animals in a domesticated or confined state it is easy to find evidence of homosexual attraction due merely to the absence of the other sex this was known to the ancients the egyptians regarded two male partridges as the symbol of homosexuality and aristotle noticed that two female pigeons would cover each other if no male was at hand buffon observed many examples especially among birds he found that if male or female birds of various species such as partridges fowls and doves were shut up together they would soon begin to have sexual relations among themselves the males sooner and more frequently than the females more recently st clair de ville observed that dogs rams and bulls when isolated first became restless and dangerous and then acquired a permanent state of sexual excitement not obeying the laws of heat and leading them to attempts to couple together the presence of the opposite sex at once restored them to normal conditions bombarda of lisbon states that in portugal it is well known that in every herd of bulls there is nearly always one bull who is ready to lend himself to the perverted whims of his companions it may easily be observed how a cow in heat exerts an exciting influence on other cows impelling them to attempt to play the bull's part la cassagne has also noted among young fowls and puppies etc that before ever having had relations with the opposite sex and while in complete liberty they make hesitating attempts at intercourse with their own sex this indeed together with similar perversions may often be observed especially in puppies who afterward become perfectly normal among white rats which are very sexual animals steinach found that when deprived of females the males practice homosexuality though only with males with whom they have long associated the weaker rats play the passive part but when a female is introduced they immediately turn to her although they are occasionally altogether indifferent to sex they never actually prefer their own sex with regard to the playing of the female part by the weaker rats it is interesting to observe that Ferre found among insects that the passive part in homosexual relationships is favoured by fatigue among cockchafers it was the male just separated from the female who would take the passive part on the rare occasions when homosexual relations occurred with a fresh male homosexuality appears to be specially common among birds it was among birds that it attracted the attention of the ancients and numerous interesting observations have been made in more recent times thus Celis, a careful bird watcher finds that the ruff the male of the mashtes of pugnax suffers from sexual repression owing to the coyness of the female the reeve and consequently the males often resort to homosexual intercourse it is still more remarkable that the reeves also even in the presence of the males will court each other and have intercourse we may associate this with the high erotic development of birds the difficulty with which tumescence seems to occur in them and their long courtships among the higher animals again female monkeys even when grown up as mole was informed behave in a sexual way to each other though it is difficult to say how far this is merely in play dr seitz director of the frankfurt zoological garden gave moll a record of his own careful observations of homosexual phenomena among the males and females of various animals confined in the garden 
in all such cases we are not concerned with sexual inversion but merely with the accidental turning of the sexual instinct into an abnormal channel the instinct being called out by an approximate substitute or even by diffused emotional excitement in the absence of the normal object it is probable however that cases of true sexual inversion in which gratification is preferably sought in the same sex may be found among animals although observations have rarely been made or recorded it has been found by muccioli an italian authority on pigeons that amongst belgian carrier pigeons inverted practices may occur even in the presence of many of the other sex this seems to be true inversion though we are not told whether these birds were also attracted towards the opposite sex the birds of this family appear to be specially liable to sexual perversion thus m j bailey maitre a breeder of great knowledge and a keen observer wrote to girard that they are strange creatures in their manners and customs and are apt to elude the most persistent observer no animal is more depraved mating between males and still more frequently between females often occurs at an early age up to the second year i have had several pairs of pigeons formed by subjects of the same sex who for many months behaved as if the mating were natural in some cases this had taken place among young birds of the same nest who acted like real mates though both subjects were males in order to mate them productively we have had to separate them and shut each of them up for some days with a female in the berlin zoological gardens also it has been noticed that two birds of the same sex will occasionally become attached to each other and remain so in spite of repeated advances from individuals of opposite sex this occurred for instance in the case of two males of the egyptian goose who were thus to all appearance paired and always kept together vigorously driving away any female that approached similarly a male australian sheldrake was paired to a male of another species among birds generally inverted sexuality seems to accompany the development of the secondary sexual character of the opposite sex which is sometimes found thus a poultry breeder describes a hen coloured dorking crowing like a cock only somewhat more harshly as a cockerel crows and with an enormous comb larger than is ever seen in the male this bird used to try to tread her fellow hens at the same time she laid early and regularly and produced grand chickens among ducks also it has occasionally been observed that the female assumes at the same time both male livery and male sexual tendencies it is probable that such observations will be multiplied in the future and that sexual inversion in the true sense will be found commoner among animals than at present it appears to be traces of homosexual practices sometimes on a large scale have been found among all the great divisions of the human race it would be possible to collect a considerable body of evidence under this head unfortunately however the travellers and others on whose records we are dependent have been so shy of touching these subjects and so ignorant of the main points for investigation that it is very difficult to discover sexual inversion in the proper sense in any lower race travellers have spoken vaguely of crimes against nature without defining the precise relationship involved nor inquiring how far any congenital impulse could be distinguished looking at the phenomena generally so far as they have been recorded among various lower races we seem bound to recognize that there is a widespread natural instinct impelling men towards homosexual relationships and that this has been sometimes though very exceptionally seized upon and developed for advantageous social purposes on the whole however unnatural intercourse sodomy has been regarded as an anti-social offence and punishable sometimes by the most serious penalties that could be invented this was for instance the case in ancient mexico in peru among the persians in china and among the hebrews and mohammedans even in very early history it is possible to find traces of homosexuality with or without an implied disapproval its existence in assyria and babylonia is indicated by the codex hammurabi and by inscriptions which do not on the whole refer to it favourably as regards egypt we learn from a Phaeum papyrus found by flinders petri translated by griffiths and discussed by Urfel, that more than four thousand years ago homosexual practices were so ancient that they were attributed to the gods horus and set the egyptians showed great admiration of masculine beauty and it would seem that they never regarded homosexuality as punishable or even reprehensible 
it is notable also that egyptian women were sometimes of very virile type and hirschfeld considers that intermediate sexual types were specially widespread among the egyptians one might be tempted to expect that homosexual practices would be encouraged whenever it was necessary to keep down the population aristotle says that it was allowed by law in crete for this end and professor haddon tells me that at torres straits a native advocated sodomy on this ground there seems however on the whole to be little evidence pointing to this utilization of the practice the homosexual tendency appears to have flourished chiefly among warriors and warlike peoples during war and the separation from women that war involves the homosexual instinct tends to develop it flourished for instance among the carthaginians and among the normans as well as among the warlike dorians scythians tartars and celts and when there has been an absence of any strong moral feeling against it the instinct has been cultivated and idealized as a military virtue partly because it counteracts the longing for the softening feminine influences of the home and partly because it seems to have an inspiring influence in promoting heroism and heightening esprit de corps in the lament of david over jonathan we have a picture of intimate friendship passing the love of women between comrades in arms amongst a barbarous warlike race there is nothing to show that such a relationship was sexual but among warriors in new caledonian friendships that were undoubtedly homosexual were recognized and regulated the fraternity of arms according to foley complicated with pederasty was more sacred than uterine fraternity we have moreover a recent example of the same relationships recognized in a modern european race the albanians Hahn, in the course of his Albanische Studien, says that the young men between sixteen and twenty-four law boys from about twelve to seventeen. A Gij marries at the age of twenty-four or twenty-five, and then he usually, but not always, gives up boy love. The following passage is reported by Hahn as the actual language used to him by an Albanian Gij. The lover's feelings for the boy is as pure as sunshine it places the beloved on the same pedestal as a saint it is the highest and most exalted passion of which the human breast is capable the sight of a beautiful youth awakens astonishment in the lover and opens the door of his heart to the delight which the contemplation of this loveliness affords love takes possession of him so completely that all his thought and feeling goes out in it if he finds himself in the presence of the beloved he rests absorbed in gazing on him absent he thinks of naught but him if the beloved unexpectedly appears he falls into confusion changes colour turns alternately pale and red his heart beats faster and impedes his breathing he has ears and eyes only for the beloved he shuns touching him with the hand kisses him only on the forehead sings his praise in verse a woman's never one of these love poems of an albanian gij runs as follows the sun when it rises in the morning is like you boy when you are near me when your dark eye turns upon me it drives my reason from my head it should be added that the professor weigand who knew the albanians well assured berth that the relations described by hahn are really sexual although tempered by idealism a german scholar who travelled in albania some years ago also assured neck that he could fully confirm Hahn's statements, and that, though it was difficult to speak positively, he doubted whether these relationships were purely ideal. While most prevalent among the Muslims, they are also found among the Christians, and receive the blessing of the priest in church. Jealousy is frequently aroused, the same writer remarks, and even murder may be committed on account of a boy. It may be mentioned here that among the Chukcheks, Kamshidals, and allied peoples, according to a Russian anthropological journal quoted in Sexual Problem, there are homosexual marriages among the men, and occasionally among the women, ritually consecrated and openly recognized. The Albanians, it is possible, belong to the same stock which produced the Dorian Greeks, and the most important and the most thoroughly known case of socially recognized homosexuality is that of Greece during its period of highest military as well as ethical and intellectual vigor. In this case, as in those already mentioned, the homosexual tendency was frequently regarded as having beneficial results, which caused it to be condoned, if not indeed fostered as a virtue.
plutarch repeated the old greek statement that the boeotians the lacedaemonians and the cretans were the most warlike storks because they were the strongest in love an army composed of loving homosexual couples it was held would be invincible it appears that the dorians introduced paederastia as the greek form of homosexuality is termed into greece they were the latest invaders a vigorous mountain race from the northwest the region including what is now albania who spread over the whole land the islands and asia minor becoming the ruling race homosexuality was of course known before they came but they made it honourable homer never mentions it and it was not known as legitimate to the aeolians or the ionians beth who has written a valuable study of dorian paederastia states that dorians admitted a kind of homosexual marriage and even had a kind of boy marriage by capture the scattered vestiges of this practice indicating beth believes that it was a general custom among the dorians before the invasion of greece such unions even received a kind of religious consecration it was moreover shameful for a noble youth in crete to have no lover it spoke ill for his character by paederastia a man propagated his virtues as it were in the youth he loved implanting them by the act of intercourse in its later greek phases paederastia was associated less with war than with athletics it was refined and intellectualized by poetry and philosophy it cannot be doubted that both aeschylus and sophocles cultivated boy love while its idealized presentation in the dialogues of plato has caused it to be almost identified with his name thus in the early charmides we have an attractive account of the youth who gives his name to the dialogue and the emotions he excites are described but even in the early dialogues plato only conditionally approved of the sexual side of paederastia and he condemned it altogether in the final laws the early stages of greek paederastia are very interestingly studied by beth die dorische knabenliebe rheinsches museum for philosophie j a simmons essay on the later aspects of paederastia especially as reflected in greek literature a problem in greek ethics is contained in the early german edition of the present study but though privately printed in eighteen eighty three by the author in an edition of twelve copies and since pirated in another private edition it has not yet been published in english paederastia in greek poetry has also been studied by paul brandt and by otto knapp who seeks to demonstrate the sensual side of paederastia on the other hand licht working for somewhat the same lines as beth deals with the ethical element in paederastia points out its beneficial moral influence and argues that it was largely on this ground that it was counted sacred licht has also published a learned study of paederastia in attic comedy and remarks that without paederastia greek comedy is unthinkable paederastia in the greek anthology has been fully explored by p stephanus kiefer who has studied socrates in relation to homosexuality concludes that he was bisexual but that his sexual impulses had been sublimated it may be added that many results of recent investigation concerning paederastia are summarized by hirschfeld and by edward carpenter it would appear that almost the only indications outside greece of paederastic homosexuality showing a high degree of tenderness and aesthetic feeling are to be found in persian and arabian literature after the time of the abbasids although this practice was forbidden by the koran in constantinople as neck was informed by german inverts living in that city homosexuality is widespread most cultivated turks being capable of relationships with boys as well as with women though very few are exclusively homosexual so that their attitude would seem to be largely due to custom and tradition adult males rarely have homosexual relations together one of the couple is usually a boy of twelve to eighteen years and this condition of things among the refined classes is said to resemble ancient greek paederastia but ordinary homosexual prostitution is prevalent it is especially recognized in the baths which abound in constantinople and are often open all night the attendants at these baths are youths who scarcely need an invitation to induce them to gratify the client in this respect the gratification usually consisting in masturbation mutual or one-sided as desired 
the practice though little spoken of is carried on almost openly and blackmailing is said to be unknown in the new turkey however it is stated by adler bay that homosexual prostitution has almost disappeared end of chapter one part one recording by john fricker Part two of chapter one of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, volume two, by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There is abundant evidence to show that homosexual practices exist and have long existed in most parts of the world outside Europe, when subserving no obvious social or moral end. How far they are associated with congenital inversion is usually very doubtful in china for instance it seems that there are special houses devoted to male prostitution though less numerous than the houses devoted to females for homosexuality cannot be considered common in china its prevalence among chinese abroad being due to the absence of women and it is chiefly found in the north when a rich man gives a feast he sends for women to cheer the repast by music and song and for boys to serve at table and to entertain the guests by their lively conversation the boys have been carefully brought up for this occupation receiving an excellent education and their mental qualities are even more highly valued than their physical attractiveness the women are less carefully brought up and less esteemed after the meal the lads usually return home with a considerable fee what further occurs the chinese say little about it seems that real and deep affection is often born of these relations at first platonic but in the end becoming physical not a matter for great concern in the eyes of the chinese in the chinese novels often of a very literary character devoted to masculine love it seems that all the preliminaries and transports of normal love are to be found while physical union may terminate the scene in china however the law may be brought into action for attempts against nature even with mutual consent the penalty is one hundred strokes with the bamboo and a month's imprisonment if there is violence the penalty is decapitation i am not able to say how far the law is a dead letter according to matignon so far as homosexuality exists in china it is carried on with much more decorum and restraint than it is in europe and he thinks it may be put down to the credit of the chinese that unlike europeans they never practice unnatural connection with women his account of the customs of the chinese confirms Marac's earlier account and he remarks that though not much spoken of homosexuality is not looked down upon he gives some interesting details concerning the boy prostitutes these are sold by their parents sometimes stolen from them about the age of four and educated whilst they are also subjected to a special physical training which includes massage of the gluteal regions to favour development dilation of the anus and epilation which is not however practised by chinese women at the same time they are taught music singing drawing and the art of poetry the waiters at the restaurants always know where these young gentlemen to be found when they are required to grace a rich man's feast they are generally accompanied by a guardian and usually nothing very serious takes place for they know their value and money will not always buy their expensive favours they are very effeminate luxuriously dressed and perfumed and they seldom go on foot there are however lower orders of such prostitutes homosexuality is easily traceable in india dubois referred to houses devoted to male prostitution with men dressed as women and imitating the ways of women burton in the terminal essay to his translation of the arabian nights states that when in eighteen forty five sir charles napier conquered and annexed sind three brothels of eunuchs and boys were found in the small town of karachi and burton was instructed to visit and report on them hindus in general however it appears hold homosexuality in abhorrence in afghanistan homosexuality is more generally accepted and burton stated that each caravan is accompanied by a number of boys and lads almost in women's attire with cold eyes and rouged cheeks long tresses and hennaed fingers and toes riding luxuriously in camel panniers if we turn to the new world we find that among the american indians from the eskimo of alaska downward to brazil and still farther south homosexual customs have been very frequently observed sometimes they are regarded by the tribe with honour sometimes with indifference sometimes with contempt but they appear to be always tolerated 
although there are local differences these customs on the whole seem to have much in common the best early description which i have been able to find is by langsdorf and concerns the aleuts of unalashka in alaska boys if they happen to be very handsome he says are often brought up entirely in the manner of girls and instructed in the arts women use to please men their beards are carefully plucked out as soon as they begin to appear and their chins tattooed like those of women they wear ornaments of glass beads upon their legs and arms bind and cut their hair in the same manner as the women and supply their place with the men as concubines this shocking unnatural and immoral practice has obtained here even from the remotest times nor have any measures hitherto been taken to repress and restrain it such men are known under the name of chopins among the cognagas lansdorf found the custom much more common than among the aleuts he remarked that although the mothers brought up some of their children in this way they seemed very fond of their offspring lisiansky at about the same period tells us that of all the customs of these islanders the most disgusting is that of men called chupans living with men and supplying the place of women these are brought up from their infancy with females and taught all the feminine arts they even assume the manner and dress of the women so nearly that a stranger would naturally take them for what they are not this odious practice was formerly so prevalent that the residence of one of these monsters in a house was considered as fortunate it is however daily losing ground he mentions a case in which a priest had nearly married two males when an interpreter chanced to come in and was able to inform him what he was doing the practice has however apparently continued to be fairly common among the alaska eskimos down to recent times thus dr engelman mentioned to me that he was informed by those who had lived in alaska especially near point barrow that as many as five such individuals regarded by uninstructed strangers as hermaphrodites might be found in a single comparatively small community it is stated by davidoff as quoted by holmberg that the boy is selected to be a chopin because he is girl-like this is a point of some interest as it indicates that the chopin is not effeminated solely by suggestion and association but is probably feminine by inborn constitution in louisiana florida yucatan etc somewhat similar customs exist or have existed in brazil men are to be found dressed as women and solely occupying themselves with feminine occupations they are not very highly regarded they are called kudinas i e circumcised among the pueblo indians of new mexico these individuals are called mujerados supposed to be a corruption of mujerego and are the chief passive agents in the homosexual ceremonies of these people they are said to be intentionally effeminated in early life by much masturbation and by constant horse-riding among all the tribes of the northwest united states sexual inverts may be found the invert is called a boté not man not woman by the montana and a burdash half man half woman by the washington indians the boté has been carefully studied by dr a b holder holder finds that the boté wears woman's dress and that his speech and manners are feminine the dress and manners are assumed in childhood but no sexual practices take place until puberty these consist in the practice of fellatio by the boté who probably himself experiences the orgasm at the same time the boté is not a pederast although pederasty occurs among these indians holder examined boté who was splendidly made prepossessing and in perfect health with much reluctance he agreed to a careful examination the sexual organs were quite normal though perhaps not quite so large as his physique would suggest but he had never had intercourse with a woman on removing his clothes he pressed his thighs together as a timid woman would so as to conceal completely the sexual organs holder says that the thighs really or to my fancy had the feminine rotundity he has heard a boté beg a male indian to submit to his caress and he tells that one little fellow while in the agency boarding school was found frequently surreptitiously wearing female attire he was punished but finally escaped from school and became a boté which vocation he has since followed at tahiti at the beginning of the nineteenth century turnbull found that there are a set of men in this country whose open profession is of such abomination that the laudable delicacy of our language will not admit it to be mentioned these are called by the natives mahoos they assume the dress attitude and manners of women 
and affect all the fantastic oddities and coquetries of the vainest of females they mostly associate with the women who court their acquaintance with the manners of the women they adopt their peculiar employments making cloth bonnets and mats and so completely are they unsexed that they had not been pointed out to me i should not have known them but as women i add with some satisfaction that the encouragement of this abomination is almost solely confined to the chiefs among the sakalaves of madagascar there are certain boys called sakatra as described by lasnet who are apparently chosen from childhood on account of weak or delicate appearance and brought up as girls they live like women and have their intercourse with men with or without sodomy paying the men who please them among the negro population of zanzibar forms of homosexuality which are believed to be congenital as well as acquired forms are said to be fairly common their frequency is thought to be due to arab influence the male congenital inverts show from their earliest years no aptitude for men's occupations but are attracted towards female occupations as they grow older they wear women's clothes dress their hair in women's fashion and behave altogether like women they associate only with women and with male prostitutes and they obtain sexual satisfaction by passive pederasty or in ways simulating coitus in appearance they resemble ordinary male prostitutes who are common in zanzibar but it is noteworthy that the natives make a clear distinction between them and male prostitutes the latter are looked down on with contempt while the former as being what they are by the will of god are tolerated homosexuality occurs in various parts of africa cases of effeminatio and passive sodomy have been reported from unyamwezi and uganda among the bangala of the upper congo sodomy between men is very common especially when they are away from home in strange towns or in fishing camps if however a man had intercourse with a woman per anum he was at one time liable to be put to death among the papuans in some parts of new guinea as already mentioned homosexuality is said to be well recognized and is resorted to for convenience as well perhaps as for malthusian reasons but in the rigo district of british new guinea where habitual sodomy is not practised dr seligman of the cambridge anthropological expedition to torres straits made some highly important observations on several men and women who clearly appear to be cases of congenital sexual inversion with some degree of aesthetic inversion and even some anatomical modification these people it may be noted belong to a primitive race uncontaminated by contact with white races and practically still in the stone age finally among other allied primitive people the australians it would appear that homosexuality has long been well established in tribal customs among the natives of kimberley western australia who are by no means of low type quick and intelligent with special aptitudes for learning languages and music if a wife is not obtainable for a young man he is presented with a boy wife between the ages of five and ten the age when a boy receives his masculine initiation the exact nature of the relations between the boy wife and his protector are doubtful they certainly have connection but the natives repudiate with horror and disgust the idea of sodomy further light is thrown on homosexuality in australia by the supposition of spencer and gillen that the mica operation urethral subincision an artificial hypospadius is for the purpose of homosexual intercourse clarch has discussed the homosexual origin of the mica operation on the basis of information he received from missionaries at niol niol on the northwest coast the sub-incised man acts as a female to the as yet unoperated boys who perform coitus in the incised opening both informed clarch in nineteen o six that at bulia in queensland the operated men are said to possess a vulva these various accounts are of considerable interest though for the most part their precise significance remains doubtful some of them however such as holder's description of the bote bowman's accounts of the homosexual phenomena in zanzibar and especially seligman's observations in british new guinea indicate not only the presence of aesthetic inversion but of true congenital sexual inversion the extent of the evidence will doubtless be greatly enlarged as the number of competent observers increases and crucial points are no longer so frequently overlooked 
On the whole, the evidence shows that among lower races homosexual practices are regarded with considerable indifference, and the real invert, if he exists among them, as doubtless he does exist, generally passes unperceived or joins some sacred caste which sanctifies his exclusively homosexual inclinations. Even in Europe today, a considerable lack of repugnance to homosexual practices may be found among the lower classes. In this matter, as folklore shows in so many other matters, the uncultured man of civilization is linked to the savage. In England, I am told, the soldier often has little or no objection to prostitute himself to the swell who pays him, although for pleasure he prefers to go with women, and Hyde Park is spoken of as a centre of male prostitution among the working masses of england and scotland q writes comradeship is well marked though not as in italy very conscious of itself friends often kiss each other though this habit seems to vary a good deal in different sections and coteries men commonly sleep together whether comrades or not and so easily get familiar occasionally but not so very often this relation delays for a time or even indefinitely actual marriage and in some instances is highly passionate and romantic there is a good deal of grossness no doubt here and there in this direction among the masses but there are no male prostitutes that i am aware of whose regular clients are manual workers this kind of prostitution in london is common enough but i have only a slight personal knowledge of it many youths are kept handsomely in apartments by wealthy men and they are of course not always inaccessible to others many keep themselves in lodgings by this means and others eke out scanty wages by the same device just like women in fact choir boys reinforce the ranks to a considerable extent and private soldiers to a large extent some of the barracks notably knightsbridge are great centres on summer evenings hyde park and the neighbourhood of albert gate is full of guardsmen and others plying a lively trade and with little disguise in uniform or out in these cases it sometimes only amounts to a chat on a retired seat or a drink at a bar sometimes recourse is had to a room in some known lodging-house or to one or two hotels which lend themselves to this kind of business in any case it means a covetable addition to tommy atkins pocket money and mr rafalovich speaking of london remarks the number of soldiers who prostitute themselves is greater than we are willing to believe it is no exaggeration to say that in certain regiments the presumption is in favour of the venality of the majority of the men it is worth noting that there is a perfect understanding in this matter between soldiers and the police who may always be relied upon by the former for assistance and advice i am indebted to my correspondent z for the following notes soldiers are no less sought after in france than in england or in germany and special houses exist for military prostitution both in paris and the garrison towns many facts known about the french army go to prove that these habits have been contracted in algeria and have spread to a formidable extent through whole regiments the facts related by ulrichs about the french foreign legion on the testimony of a credible witness who had been apathic in his regiment deserve attention this man who was a german told urix that the spanish french and italian soldiers were the lovers the swiss and the german their beloved in lucien descarves military novel sous off some details are given regarding establishments for male prostitution see pages three two two four one two and four one seven for description of the drinking shop called au ami de la May, where a few maids were kept for show and also of its frequenters including in particular the adjutant la prevotte ulrich's reports that in the austrian army lectures on homosexual vices are regularly given to cadets and conscripts a soldier who had left the army told a friend of mine that he and many of his comrades had taken to homosexual indulgences when abroad on foreign service in a lonely station he kept the practice up in england because the women of his class were so unattractive the captain of an english man-of-war said that he was always glad to send his men on shore after a long cruise at sea never feeling sure how far they might not all go if left without women for a certain space of time i may add that a hammond gives details as to the prevalence of homosexuality in the french army especially in algeria he regards it as extremely common although the majority are free a fragment of a letter by general lamoricier speaking of marshal chargarnier is quoted en afrique nous en étions tous mais lui en est resté ici 
this primitive indifference is doubtless also a factor in the prevalence of homosexuality among criminals although here it must be remembered two other factors congenital abnormality and the isolation of imprisonment have to be considered in russia tarnovsky observes that all pederasts are agreed that the common people are tolerably indifferent to their sexual advances which they call gentlemen's games a correspondent remarks on the fact patent to all observers that simple folk not infrequently display no greater disgust for the abnormalities of sexual appetite than they do for its normal manifestations he knows of many cases in which men of lower class were flattered and pleased by the attentions of men of higher class although not themselves inverted and from this point of view the following case which he mentions is very instructive a pervert whom i can trust told me that he had made advances to upward of one hundred men in the course of the last fourteen years and that he had only once met with a refusal in which case the man later on offered himself spontaneously and only once with an attempt to extort money permanent relations of friendship sprang up in most instances he admitted that he looked after these persons and helped them with his social influence and a certain amount of pecuniary support setting one up in business giving another something to marry on and finding places for others among the peasantry in switzerland i am formed homosexual relationships are not uncommon before marriage and such relationships are likely spoken of as dummheiten no doubt similar traits may be found in the peasantry of other parts of europe what may be regarded as true sexual inversion can be traced in europe from the beginning of the christian era though we can scarcely demonstrate the congenital element especially among two classes men of exceptional ability and criminals and also it may be added among those neurotic and degenerate individuals who may be said to lie between these two classes and on or over the borders of both homosexuality mingled with various other sexual abnormalities and excesses seems to have flourished in rome during the empire and is well exemplified in the persons of many of the emperors julius caesar augustus tiberius caligula claudius nero galba titus domitian nerva trajan hadrian commodus and heliogabalus many of them men of great ability and from a roman standpoint great moral worth are all charged on more or less solid evidence with homosexual practices in julius caesar the husband of all women and the wife of all men as he was satirically termed excess of sexual activity seems to have accompanied as is sometimes seen an excess of intellectual activity he was first accused of homosexual practices after a long stay in bithynia with king nicomedes and the charge was very often renewed caesar was proud of his physical beauty and like some modern inverts he was accustomed carefully to shave and epilate his body to preserve the smoothness of the skin hadrian's love for his beautiful slave antinous is well known the love seems to have been deep and mutual and antinous has become immortalized partly by the romance of his obscure death and partly by the new and strangely beautiful type which he has given to sculpture heliogabalus the most homosexual of all the company as he has been termed seems to have been a true sexual invert of feminine type he dressed as a woman and was devoted to the men he loved End of chapter 1, part 2. Recording by John Fricker. Part 3 of chapter 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, volume 2 by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Homosexual practices everywhere flourish and abound in prisons. There is abundant evidence on this point. I will only bring forward the evidence of Dr. Way, formerly physician to the Elmira Reformatory, New York. Sexuality, he wrote in a private letter, is one of the most troublesome elements with which we have to contend. I have no data as to the number of prisoners here who are sexually perverse. In my pessimistic moments I should feel like saying that all were, but probably eighty per cent would be a fair estimate and referring to the sexual influence which some men have over others he remarks that there are many men with features suggestive of femininity that attract others to them in a way that reminds me of a bitch in heat followed by a pack of dogs in sing sing prison of new york twenty per cent of the prisoners are said to be actively homosexual and a large number of the rest passively homosexual 
these prison relationships are not always of a brutal character mcmurtry states the attraction sometimes being more spiritual than physical prison life develops and fosters the homosexual tendency of criminals but there can be little doubt that that tendency or else a tendency to sexual indifference or bisexuality is a radical character of a very large number of criminals we may also find it to a considerable extent among tramps an allied class of undoubted degenerates who save for brief seasons are less familiar with prison life i am able to bring forward interesting evidence on this point by an acute observer who lived much among tramps in various countries and largely devoted himself to the study of them the fact that homosexuality is especially common among men of exceptional intellect was long since noted by dante in somma sapi che tutti fu cerci e literati grandi et di gran fama dan medismo peccato al mondo lerci it has often been noted since and remains a remarkable fact there cannot be the slightest doubt that intellectual and artistic abilities of the highest order have frequently been associated with a congenitally inverted sexual temperament there has been a tendency among inverts themselves to discover their own temperament in many distinguished persons on evidence of the most slender character but it remains a demonstrable fact that numerous highly distinguished persons of the past and the present in various countries have been inverts i may here refer to my own observations on this point in the preface mantegazza remarks that in his own restricted circle he is acquainted with a french publicist a german poet an italian statesman and a spanish jurist all men of exquisite taste and highly cultivated mind who are sexually inverted Kraft ebbing in the preface to his psychopathia sexualis referring to the numberless communications he has received from these stepchildren of nature remarks that the majority of the writers are men of high intellectual and social position and often possess very keen emotions rafalovich names among distinguished inverts alexander the great epaminondas virgil the great conde prince eugene etc mole in his berumt homosexuel discusses the homosexuality of a number of eminent persons for the most part with his usual caution and sagacity speaking of the alleged homosexuality of wagner he remarks with entire truth that the method of arguing the existence of homosexuality from the presence of feminine traits must be decisively rejected hirschfeld has more recently included in his great work die homosexualität two lists ancient and modern of alleged inverts among the distinguished persons of history briefly stating the nature of the evidence in each case they amount to nearly three hundred not all of them however can be properly described as distinguished thus we end in the list forty-three english names of these at least half a dozen were noblemen who were concerned in homosexual prosecutions but were of no intellectual distinction others again are of undoubted eminence but there is no good reason to regard them as homosexual this is the case for instance as regards swift who may have been mentally abnormal but appears to have been heterosexual rather than homosexual fletcher of whom we know nothing definite in this respect is also included as well as tennyson whose youthful sentimental friendship for arthur hallam is exactly comparable to that of montaigne for etienne de la boetie yet montaigne is not included in the list it may be added however that while some of the english names in the list are thus extremely doubtful it would have been possible to add some others who were without doubt inverts it has not i think been noted largely because the evidence was insufficiently clear that among moral leaders and persons with strong ethical instincts there is a tendency toward the more elevated forms of homosexual feeling this may be traced not only in some of the great moral teachers of old but also in men and women of our own day it is fairly evident why this should be so just as the repressed love of a woman or a man has in normally constituted persons frequently furnished the motive power for an enlarged philanthropic activity so the person who sees his own sex also bathed in sexual glamour brings to his work of human service an ardour wholly unknown to the normally constituted individual morality to him has become one with love i am not prepared here to insist on this point but no one i think who studies sympathetically the histories and experiences of great moral leaders can fail in many cases to note the presence of this feeling more or less finely sublimated from any gross physical manifestation 
if it is probable that in moral movements persons of homosexual temperament have sometimes become prominent it is undoubtedly true beyond possibility of doubt that they have been prominent in religion many years ago in eighteen eighty five the ethnologist elie recluse in his charming book les primitifs setting forth the phenomena of homosexuality among the eskimo inuit tribe clearly insisted that from time immemorial there has been a connection between the invert and the priest and showed how well this connection is illustrated by the eskimo chupans much more recently in his elaborate study of the priest Hornefer discusses the feminine traits of priests and shows that, among the most various peoples, persons of sexually abnormal and especially homosexual temperament have assumed the functions of priesthood. To the popular eye, the unnatural is the supernatural, and the abnormal has appeared to be specially close to the secret power of the world. Abnormal persons are themselves of the same opinion and regard themselves as divine as hornefer points out they often really possess special aptitude karsch in his gleichgeschlechtlich lieben der natervulke has brought out the high religious as well as social significance of castes of cross-dressed and often homosexual persons among primitive peoples at the same time edward carpenter in his remarkable book intermediate types among primitive folk has shown with much insight how it comes about that there is an organic connection between the homosexual temperament and unusual psychic or divinatory powers homosexual men were non-warlike and homosexual women non-domestic so that their energies sought different outlets from those of ordinary men and women they become the initiators of new activities thus it is that from among them would in some degree issue not only inventors and craftsmen and teachers but sorcerers and diviners medicine men and wizards prophets and priests such persons would be especially impelled to thought because they would realize that they were different from other people treated with reverence by some and with contempt by others they would be compelled to face the problems of their own nature and indirectly the problems of the world generally moreover carpenter points out persons in whom the masculine and feminine temperaments were combined would in many cases be persons of intuition and complex mind beyond their fellows and so able to exercise divination and prophecy in a very real and natural sense this aptitude of the invert for primitive religion for sorcery and divination would have its reaction on popular feeling more especially when magic and the primitive forms of religion began to fall into disrepute the invert would be regarded as the sorcerer of a false and evil religion and be submerged in the same ignominy this point has been emphasized by westermark in the instructive chapter on homosexuality in his great work on moral ideas he points out the significance of the fact at the first glance apparently inexplicable that homosexuality in the general opinion of medieval christianity was constantly associated even confounded with heresy as we see significantly illustrated by the fact that in france and england the popular designation for homosexuality is derived from the bulgarian heretics it was westermark believes chiefly as a heresy and out of religious zeal that homosexuality was so violently reprobated and so ferociously punished in modern europe we find the strongest evidence of the presence of what may fairly be called true sexual inversion when we investigate the men of the renaissance the intellectual independence of those days and the influence of antiquity seem to have liberated and fully developed the impulses of those abnormal individuals who would otherwise have found no clear expression and passed unnoticed murray the humanist may perhaps be regarded as a typical example of the nature and fate of the superior invert of the renaissance born in fifteen twenty six at murray limousin of poor but noble family he was of independent somewhat capricious character unable to endure professors and consequently he was mainly his own teacher though he often sought advice from jules cesar scalige murray was universally admired in his day for his learning and his eloquence and is still regarded not only as a great latinist and a fine writer but as a notable man of high intelligence and remarkable moreover for courtesy and polemics in an age when that quality was not too common his portrait shows a somewhat coarse and rustic but intelligent face he conquered honour and respect before he died in fifteen eighty five at the age of fifty nine 
in early life murray wrote wanton erotic poems to women which seem based on personal experience but in fifteen fifty three we find him imprisoned in the chatelet for sodomy and in danger of his life so that he thought of starving himself to death friends however obtained his release and he settled in toulouse but the very next year he was burnt in an effigy in toulouse as a huguenot and sodomist this being the result of a judicial sentence which had caused him to flee from the city and from france four years later he had to flee from padua owing to a similar accusation he had many friends but none of them protested against the charge though they aided him to escape from the penalty it is very doubtful whether he was a huguenot and whenever in his works he refers to pederasty it is with strong disapproval but his writings reveal passionate friendship for men and he seems to have expended little energy in combating a charge which if false was a shameful injustice to him it was after fleeing into italy and falling ill of a fever from fatigue and exposure that murray is said to have made the famous retort to the physician by his bedside who had said facianus experimentum in anima vili vilem animam appellas pro qua christus non dedignatus est mori a great humanist than murray erasmus himself seems as a young man when in the augustinian monastery of stein to have had a homosexual attraction to another brother afterwards prior to whom he addressed many passionately affectionate letters his affection seems however to have been unrequited as the renaissance developed homosexuality seems to have become more prominent among distinguished persons poliziano was accused of pederasty aretino was a pederast as pope julius the second seems also to have been ariosto wrote in his satires no doubt too extremely senza quel vizio son poci umanisti tasso had a homosexual strain in his nature but he was of weak and feminine constitution sensitively emotional and physically frail it is however among artists at that time and later that homosexuality may most notably be traced leonardo da vinci whose ideals as revealed in his work are so strangely bisexual lay under homosexual suspicion in his youth in fourteen seventy six when he was twenty-four years of age charges were made against him before the florentine officials for the control of public morality and were repeated though they do not appear to have been substantiated there is however some ground for supposing that leonardo was imprisoned in his youth throughout life he loved to surround himself with beautiful youths and his pupils were more remarkable for their attractive appearance than for their skill to one at least of them he was strongly attached while there is no record of any attachment to a woman freud who has studied leonardo with his usual subtlety considers that his temperament was marked by ideal homosexuality michelangelo one of the very chief artists of the renaissance period we cannot now doubt was sexually inverted the evidence furnished by his own letters and poems as well as by the researches of numerous recent workers parla greco scheffler j a simmons etc may be said to have placed this beyond question he belonged to a family of five brothers four of whom never married and so far as is known left no offspring the fifth only left one male heir his biographer describes michelangelo as a man of peculiar not altogether healthy nervous temperament he was indifferent to women only in one case indeed during his long life is there evidence even of friendship with a woman while he was very sensitive to the beauty of men and his friendships were very tender and enthusiastic at the same time there is no reason to suppose that he formed any physically passionate relationships with men and even his enemies seldom or never made this accusation against him we may probably accept the estimate of his character given by simmons michelangelo buonarotti is one of those exceptional but not uncommon men who are born with sensibilities abnormally deflected from the ordinary channel he showed no partiality for women and a notable enthusiasm for the beauty of young men he was a man of physically frigid temperament extremely sensitive to beauty of the male type who habitually philosophized his emotions and contemplated the living objects of his admiration as amiable not only for their personal qualities but also for their aesthetical attractiveness a temperament of this kind seems to have had no significance for the men of those days they were blind to all homosexual emotion which had no result in sodomy 
plato found such attraction a subject for sentimental metaphysics but it was not until nearly our own time that it again became a subject of interest and study yet it undoubtedly had profound influence on michelangelo's art impelling him to find every kind of human beauty in the male form and only a grave dignity or tenderness divorced from every quality that is sexually desirable in the female form this deeply rooted abnormality is at once the key to the melancholy of michelangelo and to the mystery of his art michelangelo's contemporary the painter bazzi seems also to have been radically inverted and to this fact he owed his nickname sodoma as however he was married and had children it may be that he was as we should now say of bisexual temperament he was a great artist who had been dealt with unjustly partly perhaps because of the prejudice of vasari whose admiration for michelangelo amounted to worship but who is contemptuous towards sodoma and grudging of praise partly because his work is little known out of italy and not very easy of access there reckless unbalanced and eccentric in his life sodoma revealed in his painting a peculiar feminine softness and warmth which indeed we seem to see also in his portrait of himself at monte olivietto maggiore and a very marked and tender feeling for masculine but scarcely virile beauty cellini was probably homosexual he was imprisoned on a charge of unnatural vice and is himself suspiciously silent in his autobiography concerning this imprisonment in the seventeenth century another notable sculptor who has been termed the flemish cellini jerome du quesnoy whose still more distinguished brother francois executed the mannequin piece in brussels was an invert having finally been accused of sexual relations with a youth in a chapel of the ghent cathedral where he was executing a monument for the bishop he was strangled and burned notwithstanding that much influence including that of the bishop was brought to bear in his behalf in more recent times winkelmann who was the initiator of a new greek renaissance and of the modern appreciation of ancient art lies under what seems to be a well-grounded suspicion of sexual inversion his letters to male friends are full of the most passionate expressions of love his violent death also appears to have been due to a love adventure with a man the murderer was a cook a wholly uncultivated man a criminal who had already been condemned to death and shortly before murdering winkelmann for the sake of plunder he was found to be on very intimate terms with him it is noteworthy that sexual inversion should so often be found associated with the study of antiquity it must not however be too hastily concluded that this is due to suggestion and that to abolish the study of greek literature and art would be largely to abolish sexual inversion what has really occurred in those recent cases that may be studied and therefore without doubt in the older cases is that the subject of congenital sexual inversion is attracted to the study of greek antiquity because he finds there the explanation and the apotheosis of his own obscure impulses undoubtedly that study tends to develop these impulses while it is peculiarly easy to name men of distinguished ability who either certainly or in all probability have been affected by homosexual tendencies they are not isolated manifestations they spring out of an element of diffused homosexuality which is at least as marked in civilization as it is in savagery it is easy to find illustrations in every country here it may suffice to refer to france germany and england in france in the thirteenth century the church was so impressed by the prevalence of homosexuality that it reasserted the death penalty for sodomy at the councils of paris twelve twelve and rouen twelve fourteen while we are told that even by rejecting a woman's advances as illustrated in marie de france's lay de l'anval a man fell under suspicion as a sodomist which was also held to involve heresy at the end of this century about twelve ninety four alain de lille was impelled to write a book de planctu natre in order to call attention to the prevalence of homosexual feeling he also associated the neglect of women with sodomy man is made woman he writes he blackens the honour of his sex the craft of magic venus makes him of double gender nobly beautiful youths have turned their hammers of love to the office of anvils and many kisses lie untouched on maiden lips the result is that the natural anvils that is to say the neglected maidens bewail the absence of their hammers and are seen sadly to demand them alain de lille makes himself the voice of this demand 
A few years later, at the beginning of the 14th century, sodomy was still regarded as very prevalent. At that time it was especially associated with the Templars, who, it has been supposed, brought it from the East. Such a supposition, however, is not required to account for the existence of homosexuality in France, nor is it necessary at a somewhat later period to invoke, as is frequently done, the Italian origin of Catherine de' Medici in order to explain the prevalence of homosexual practices at her court. Notwithstanding its prevalence, sodomy was still severely punished from time to time. Thus, in 1586, Dadon, who had formerly been rector of the University of Paris, was hanged and then burned for injuring a child through sodomy. In the 17th century, homosexuality continued, however, to flourish, and it is said that nearly all the numerous omissions made in the published editions of Talimon de Réaux's historiettes refer to sodomy. How prominent homosexuality was in the early 18th century in France, we learn from the frequent references to it in the letters of Madame, the mother of the regent, whose husband was himself effeminate and probably inverted. For the later years of the century, the evidence abounds on every hand. At this time, the Bastille was performing a useful function, until recently overlooked by historians as an isle de surete for abnormal persons whom it was considered unsafe to leave at large. Inverts, whose conduct became too offensive to be tolerated, were frequently placed in the Bastille, which, indeed, abounded in homosexual subjects, to a greater extent than any other class of sexual perverts. Some of the affairs which led to the Bastille have modern air, one such case on a large scale occurred in 1702 and reveals an organized system of homosexual prostitution. One of the persons involved in this affair was a handsome, well-made youth named Lebel, formerly a lackey but passing himself off as a man of quality. Seduced at the age of ten by a famous sodomist named Duplessis, he had since been at the disposition of a number of homosexual persons, including officers, priests, and marquises some of the persons involved in these affairs were burnt alive some cut their own throats others again were set at liberty or transferred to the bicetre during the latter part of the eighteenth century also we find another modern homosexual practice recognized in france the rendezvous or centre where homosexual persons could quietly meet each other inversion has always been easy to trace in germany Amianus Marcellinus bears witness to its prevalence among some German tribes in later Roman days. In medieval times, as Schultz points out, references to sodomy in Germany were far from uncommon. Various princes of the German imperial house and of other princely families in the Middle Ages were noted for their intimate friendships. At a later date, attention has been frequently called to the extreme emotional warmth which has often marked German friendship, even when there has been no suspicion of any true homosexual relationship. The 18th century, in the full enjoyment of that abandonment to sentiment initiated by Rousseau, proved peculiarly favourable to the expansion of the tendency to sentimental friendship. On this basis, a really inverted tendency, when it existed, could easily come to the surface and find expression we find this well illustrated in the poet heinrich von kleist who seems to have been of bisexual temperament and his feelings for the girl he wished to marry were indeed much cooler than those for his friend to this friend ernst von fuhl afterwards prussian war minister kleist wrote in eighteen o five at the age of twenty eight you bring the days of the greeks back to me i could sleep with you dear youth my whole soul so embraces you when you used to bathe in the lake of thun i would gaze with the real feelings of a girl at your beautiful body it would serve an artist to study from there follows an enthusiastic account of his friend's beauty and of the greek idea of the love of youths and kleist continues go with me to anspach and let us enjoy the sweets of friendship i shall never marry you must be my wife and children to me in all social classes and in all fields of activity germany during the nineteenth century produced a long series of famous or notorious homosexual persons at the one end we find people of the highest intellectual distinction such as alexander von humboldt whom nach a cautious investigator stated that he had good ground for regarding as an invert at the other end we find prosperous commercial and manufacturing people who leave germany to find solace in the free and congenial homosexual atmosphere of capri 
of these f a krupp the head of the famous essen factory may be regarded as the type in england and the same is true today of the united states although homosexuality has been less openly manifest and less thoroughly explored it is doubtful whether it has been less prevalent than in germany at an early period indeed the evidence may seem to show that it was more prevalent in the penitentials of the ninth and tenth century natural fornication and sodomy were frequently put together and the same penance assigned to both it was recognized that priests and bishops as well as laymen might fall into this sin though to the bishop nearly three times as much penance was assigned as to the layman among the normans everywhere homosexuality was markedly prevalent the spread of sodomy in france about the eleventh century is attributed to the normans and their coming seems to have rendered it at times almost fashionable at all events at court in england william rufus was undoubtedly inverted as later on were edward the second james the first and perhaps though not in so conspicuous a degree william the third Ordericus Vitalis, who was himself half Norman and half English, says that the Normans had become very effeminate in his time, and that after the death of William the Conqueror, sodomy was common both in England and Normandy. Guillaume de Nongis, in his chronicle for about 1120, speaking of the two sons of Henry and the company of young nobles who went down with them in the white ship, states that nearly all were considered to be sodomists, and Henry of Huntington, in his history, looked upon the loss of the white ship as a judgment of heaven upon sodomy. Anselm, in writing to Archdeacon William to inform him concerning the recent council at London, 1102, gives advice as to how to deal with people who have committed the sin of sodomy, and instructs him not to be too harsh with those who have not realized its gravity, for hitherto this sin has been so public that hardly any one has blushed for it, and many, therefore, have plunged into it without realizing its gravity so temperate a remark by a man of such unquestionably high character is more significant of the prevalence of homosexuality than much denunciation end of part three of chapter one recording by john fricker part four of chapter one of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In religious circles, far from courts and cities, as we might expect, homosexuality was regarded with great horror, though even here we may discover evidence of its wide prevalence. Thus, in the remarkable revelation of the monk of Evesham, written in English in 1196, we find that in the very worst part of purgatory are confined an innumerable company of sodomists, including a wealthy, witty, and learned divine, a doctor of laws, personally known to the monk, and whether these people should ever be delivered from purgatory was a matter of doubt. Of the salvation of no other sinners does the monk of Evesham seem so dubious sodomy had always been an ecclesiastical offence the statute of fifteen thirty three made it a felony and pollock and maitland consider that this affords an almost sufficient proof that the temporal courts had not punished it and that no one had been put to death for it for a very long time past the temporal law has never however proved very successful in repressing homosexuality at this period the renaissance movement was reaching england and here as elsewhere it brought with it if not an increase at all events a rehabilitation and often an idealization of homosexuality an eminent humanist and notable pioneer in dramatic literature nicholas Udall, to whom is attributed ralph royster doyster the first english comedy stands out as unquestionably addicted to homosexual tastes although he has left no literary evidence of this tendency he was an early adherent of the protestant movement and when headmaster of eton he was noted for his love of inflicting corporal punishment on the boys Tusser says he once received from Udall fifty-three stripes, for fault but small or none at all. Here there was evidently a sexual sadistic impulse, for in 1541, the year of Ralph Royster Doyster, Udall was charged with unnatural crime, and confessed his guilt before the Privy Council. He was dismissed from the headmastership and imprisoned, but only for a short time, and his reputation, his modern biographer states, was not permanently injured. 
he retained the vicarage of braintree and was much favoured by edward the sixth who nominated him to a prebend of windsor queen mary was also favourable and he became headmaster of westminster school an elizabethan lyrical poet of high quality whose work has had the honour of being confused with shakespeare's richard barnfield appears to have possessed the temperament at least of the invert his poems to male friends are of so impassioned a character that they arouse the protests of a very tolerant age very little is known of barnfield's life born in fifteen seventy four he published his first poem the affectionate shepherd at the age of twenty while still at the university it was issued anonymously revealed much fresh poetic feeling and literary skill and is addressed to a youth of whom the poet declares if it be sin to love a lovely lad oh then sin i in his subsequent volume cynthia fifteen ninety five barnfield disclaims any intention in the earlier poem beyond that of imitating virgil's second eclogue but the sonnets in this second volume are even more definitely homosexual than the earlier poem though he goes on to tell how at last he found a lass whose beauty surpassed that of the swain whom i never could obtain after the age of thirty-one barnfield wrote no more but being in easy circumstances retired to his beautiful manor-house and country estate in shropshire lived there for twenty years and died leaving a wife and son it seems probable that he was of bisexual temperament and that as not infrequently happens in such cases the homosexual element developed early under the influence of a classical education and university associations while the normal heterosexual element developed later and as may happen in bisexual persons was associated with the more commonplace and prosaic side of life barnfield was only a genuine poet on the homosexual side of his nature greater men of that age than barnfield may be suspected of homosexual tendencies marlowe whose most powerful drama edward the second is devoted to a picture of the relations between that king and his minions is himself suspected of homosexuality an ignorant informer brought certain charges of free thought and criminality against him and further accused him of asserting that they are fools who love not boys these charges have doubtless been coloured by the vulgar channel through which they passed but it seems absolutely impossible to regard them as the inventions of a mere gallows bird such as this informer was moreover marlowe's poetic work while it shows him by no means insensitive to the beauty of women also reveals a special and peculiar sensitiveness to masculine beauty marlowe clearly had a reckless delight in all things unlawful and it seems probable that he possessed the bisexual temperament shakespeare has also been discussed from this point of view all that can be said however is that he addressed a long series of sonnets to a youthful male friend these sonnets are written in lover's language of a very tender and noble order they do not appear to imply any relationship that the writer regarded as shameful or that would be so regarded by the world moreover they seem to represent but a single episode in the life of a very sensitive many-sided nature there is no other evidence in shakespeare's work of homosexual instinct such as we may trace throughout marlowe's while there is abundant evidence of a constant preoccupation with women while shakespeare thus narrowly escapes inclusion in the list of distinguished inverts there is much better ground for the inclusion of his great contemporary francis bacon aubrey in his laboriously compiled short lives in which he shows a friendly and admiring attitude towards bacon definitely states that he was a pederast aubrey was only a careful gleaner of frequently authentic gossip but a similar statement is made by sir simons dews in his autobiography dews whose family belonged to the same part of suffolk as bacon sprang from was not friendly to bacon but that fact will not suffice to account for his statement he was an upright and honourable man of scholarly habits and moreover a trained lawyer who had many opportunities of obtaining first-hand information for he had lived in the chancery office from childhood he is very precise as to bacon's homosexual practices with his own servants both before and after his fall and even gives the name of a very effeminate faced youth who was his catamite and bedfellow he states further that there had been some question of bringing bacon to trial for sodomy these allegations may be supported by a letter of bacon's own mother printed in spedding's life of bacon reproving him on account of what she had heard concerning his behaviour with the young welshman in his service whom he had made his bedfellows 
it is notable that bacon seems to have been specially attracted to welshmen one might even find evidence of this in the life of the welshman henry the seventh a people of vivacious temperament unlike his own this is illustrated by his long and intimate friendship with the mercurial sir toby matthew his alter ego a man of dissipated habits in early life though we are not told that he was homosexual bacon had many friendships with men but there is no evidence that he was ever in love or cherished any affectionate intimacy with a woman women play no part at all in his life his marriage which was childless took place at the mature age of forty-six it was effected in a business-like manner and though he always treated his wife with formal consideration it is probable that he neglected her and certain that he failed to secure her devotion it is clear that toward the end of bacon's life she formed a relationship with her gentleman usher whom subsequently she married bacon's writings it may be added equally with his letters show no evidence of love or attraction to women in his essays he is brief and judicial on the subject of marriage copious and eloquent on the subject of friendship while the essay on beauty deals exclusively with masculine beauty during the first half of the eighteenth century we have clear evidence that homosexuality flourished in london with the features which it presents to-day in all large cities everywhere there was a generally known name mollies applied to homosexual persons evidently having reference to their frequently feminine characteristics there were houses of private resort for them molly houses there were special public places of rendezvous whither they went in search of adventure exactly as there are to-day a walk in upper moorfields was especially frequented by the homosexual about seventeen twenty five a detective employed by the police about that date gave evidence as follows at the old bailey i takes a turn that way and leans over the wall in a little time the prisoner passes by and looks hard at me and at a small distance from me stands up against the wall as if he were going to make water then by degrees he sidles nearer and nearer to where i stood till at last he was close to me tis a very fine night says he ay say i and so it is then he takes me by the hand and after squeezing and playing with it a little he conveys it to his breeches whereupon the detective seizes the man by his sexual organs and holds him until the constable comes up and effects an arrest at the same period margaret clapp commonly called mother clapp kept a house in field lane holborn which was a noted resort of the homosexual to mother clapp's molly house thirty or forty clients would resort every night on sunday there might be as many as fifty for as in berlin and other cities to-day that was the great homosexual gala night there were beds in every room in this house we are told that the men would sit in one another's laps kissing in a lewd manner and using their hands indecently then they would get up dance and make curtsies and mimic the voices of women oh fie sir pray sir dear sir lord how can you serve me so i swear i'll cry out you're a wicked devil and you're a bold face eh ye dear little toad come bus they'd hug and play and toy and go out by couples into another room on the same floor to be married as they called it on the whole one gains the impression that homosexual practices were more prevalent in london in the eighteenth century bearing in mind its population at that time than they are to-day it must not however be supposed that the law was indulgent and its administration lax the very reverse was the case the punishment for sodomy when completely affected was death and it was frequently inflicted homosexual intercourse without evidence of penetration was regarded as attempt and was usually punished by the pillory and a heavy fine followed by two years imprisonment moreover it would appear that more activity was shown by the police in prosecution than is nowadays the case this is for instance suggested by the evidence of the detective already quoted to keep a homosexual resort was also a severely punishable offence mother clapp was charged at the old bailey in seventeen twenty six with keeping a sodomitical house she protested that she could not herself have taken part in these practices but that availed her nothing she could bring forward no witnesses on her behalf and was condemned to pay a fine to stand in the pillory and to undergo imprisonment for two years the cases were dealt with in a matter-of-fact way which seems to bear further witness to the frequency of the offence and with no effort to expend any specially vindictive harshness on this class of offenders 
if there was the slightest doubt as to the facts even though the balance of evidence was against the accused he was usually acquitted and the man who could bring witnesses to his general good character might often thereby escape in seventeen twenty one a religious young man married was convicted of attempting sodomy with two young men he slept with he was fined placed in the pillory and imprisoned for two months next year a man was acquitted on a similar charge and another man of decent aspect although the evidence indicated that he might have been guilty of sodomy was only convicted of attempt and sentenced to fine pillory and two years imprisonment in seventeen twenty three again a schoolmaster was acquitted on account of his good reputation of the charge of attempt on a boy of fifteen his pupil though the evidence seemed decidedly against him in seventeen thirty a man was sentenced to death for sodomy effected on his young apprentice this was a bad case and the surgeon's evidence indicated laceration of the perineum homosexuality of all kinds flourished it will be seen notwithstanding the fearless yet fair application of a very severe law in more recent times byron has frequently been referred to as experiencing homosexual affections and i have been informed that some of his poems nominally addressed to women were really inspired by men it is certain that he experienced very strong emotions towards his male friends my school friendships he wrote were with me passions when he afterward met one of these friends lord clare in italy he was painfully agitated and could never hear the name without a beating of the heart at the age of twenty-two he formed one of his strong attachments for a youth to whom he left seven thousand pounds in his will it is probable however that here as well as in the case of shakespeare and in that of tennyson's love for his youthful friend arthur hallam as well as montaigne for etienne de la boetti although such strong friendships may involve an element of sexual emotion we have no true and definite homosexual impulse homosexuality is merely simulated by the ardent and hyperesthetic emotions of the poet the same quality of the poet's emotional temperament may doubtless also be invoked in the case of goethe who is said to have written elegies which on account of their homosexual character still remain unpublished the most famous homosexual trial of recent times in england was that of oscar wilde a writer whose literary reputation may be said to be still growing not only in england but throughout the world wilde was the son of parents who were both of unusual ability and somewhat eccentric both these tendencies become in him more concentrated he was born with as it were a congenital antipathy to the commonplace a natural love of paradox and he possessed the skill to embody the characteristic in finished literary form at the same time it must not be forgotten beneath this natural attitude of paradox his essential judgments on life and literature were usually sound and reasonable his essay on the soul of man under socialism witnessed to his large and enlightened conception of life and his profound admiration of flaubert to the sanity and solidity of his literary taste in early life he revealed no homosexual tendencies he married and had children after he had begun to outgrow his youthful aesthetic extravagances however and to acquire success and fame he developed what was at first a simply inquisitive interest in inversion such inquisitive interest is sometimes the sign of an emerging homosexual impulse it proved to be so in wilde's case and ultimately he was found to be cultivating the acquaintance of youths of low class and doubtful character although this development occurred comparatively late in life we must hesitate to describe wilde's homosexuality as acquired if we consider his constitution and his history it is not difficult to suppose that homosexual germs were present in a latent form from the first and it may quite well be that wilde's inversion was of that kind which is now described as retarded though still congenital as is usual in england no active efforts were made to implicate wilde in any criminal charge it was his own action as even he himself seems to have vaguely realized beforehand which brought the storm about his head he was arrested tried condemned and at once there arose a general howl of execration joined in even by the judge whose attitude compared unfavorably with the more impartial attitude of the eighteenth-century judges in similar cases wilde came out of prison ambitious to retrieve his reputation by the quality of his literary work but he left reading jail merely to enter a larger and colder prison he soon realized that his spirit was broken even more than his health he drifted at last to paris where he shortly after died shunned by all but a few of his friends 
in a writer of the first order edward fitzgerald to whom we owe the immortal and highly individualized version of omar khayyam it is easy to trace an element of homosexuality though it appears never to have reached full unconscious development fitzgerald was an eccentric person who though rich and on friendly terms with some of the most distinguished men of his time was always out of harmony with his environment he felt himself called on to marry very unhappily a woman whom he had never been in love with and with whom he had nothing in common all his affections were for his male friends in early life he was devoted to his friend w k brown whom he glorified in euphranor to him brown was at once jonathan gamaliel apollo the friend the master the god there was scarcely a limit to his devotion and admiration on brown's premature death fitzgerald's heart was empty in eighteen fifty nine at lowestoft fitzgerald as he wrote to mrs brown used to wander about the shore at night longing for some fellow to accost me who might give some promise of filling up a very vacant place in my heart it was then that he met posh joseph fletcher a fisherman six feet tall said to be of the best suffolk type both in body and character posh reminded fitzgerald of his dear friend brown he made him captain of his lugger and was thereafter devoted to him posh was said fitzgerald a man of the finest saxon type with a complexion vif male et flamboyant blue eyes a nose less than roman more than greek and strictly auburn hair that any woman might envy further he was a man of simplicity of soul justice of thought tenderness of nature a gentleman of nature's grandest type in fact the greatest man fitzgerald had ever met posh was not however quite so absolutely perfect as this description suggests and various misunderstandings arose in consequence between the two friends so unequal in culture and social traditions these difficulties are reflected in some of the yet extant letters from the enormous mass which fitzgerald addressed to my dear poshy a great personality of recent times widely regarded with reverence as the prophet poet of democracy walt whitman has aroused discussion by his sympathetic attitude towards passionate friendship or manly love as he calls it in leaves of grass in this book in calamus drum taps and elsewhere whitman celebrates a friendship in which physical contact and a kind of silent voluptuous emotion are essential elements in order to settle the question as to the precise significance of calamus j a simmons wrote to whitman frankly posing the question the answer written from camden new jersey on august nineteenth eighteen ninety is the only statement of whitman's attitude towards homosexuality and it is therefore desirable that it should be set on record about the questions on calamus etc they quite daze me leaves of grass is only to be rightly constructed by and within its own atmosphere and essential character all its pages and pieces so coming strictly under that the calamus part has ever allowed the possibility of such construction as mentioned is terrible i am fain to hope that the pages themselves are not to even be mentioned for such gratuitous and quite at the same time undreamed and unwished possibility of morbid inferences which are disavowed by me and seem damnable it would seem from this letter that whitman had never realized that there is any relationship whatever between the passionate emotion of physical contact from man to man as he had experienced it and sung it and the act which with other people he would regard as a crime against nature this may be singular for there are many inverted persons who have found satisfaction in friendships less physical and passionate than those described in leaves of grass but whitman was a man of concrete emotional instinctive temperament lacking in analytical power receptive to all influences and careless of harmonizing them he would most certainly have refused to admit that he was the subject of inverted sexuality it remains true however that manly love occupies in his work a predominance which it would scarcely hold in the feelings of the average man whom whitman wishes to honour a normally constituted person having assumed the very frank attitude taken up by whitman would be impelled to devote far more space and far more ardour to the subject of sexual relationships with women and all that is involved in maternity than is accorded to them in leaves of grass 
some of whitman's extant letters to young men though they do not throw definite light on this question are of a very affectionate character and although a man of remarkable physical vigour he never felt inclined to marry it remains somewhat difficult to classify him from the sexual point of view but we can scarcely fail to recognize the presence of a homosexual tendency i should add that some friends and admirers of whitman are not prepared to accept the evidence of the letter to simmons i am indebted to q for the following statement of the objections i think myself that it is a mistake to give much weight to this letter perhaps a mistake to introduce it at all since if introduced it will of course carry weight and this for three or four reasons one that it is difficult to reconcile the letter itself with its strong tone of disapprobation with the general atmosphere of leaves of grass the tenor of which is to leave everything open and free two that the letter is in hopeless conflict with the calamus section of poems for whatever moral lines whitman may have drawn at the time of writing these poems it seems to me quite incredible that the possibility of certain inferences morbid or other was undreamed of three that the letter was written only a few months before his last illness and death and is the only expression of the kind that he appears to have given utterance to four that simmons's letter to which this was a reply is not forthcoming and we consequently do not know what rash expressions it may have contained leading whitman with his extreme caution to hedge his name from possible use to justify dubious practices i may add that i endeavoured to obtain simmons's letter but he was unable to produce it nor has any copy of it been found among his papers it should be said that whitman's attitude towards simmons was marked by high regard and admiration a wonderful man is addington simmons he remarked shortly before his own death some ways the most indicative and penetrating and significant man of our time simmons is a curious fellow i love him dearly he is of college breed and education horribly literary and suspicious and enjoys things a great fellow for delving into persons and into the concrete and even into the physiological and the gastric and wonderfully cute but on this occasion he delved in vain the foregoing remarks substantially contained in the previous editions of this book were based mainly on the information received from j a simmons's side but of more recent years interesting light has been thrown on this remarkable letter from walt whitman's side the boswellian patience enthusiasm and skill which horace traubel has brought to this full and elaborate work now in course of publication with walt whitman in camden clearly reveal in the course of various conversations whitman's attitude to simmons's question and the state of mind which led up to this letter whitman talked to traubel much about simmons from the twenty seventh of april eighteen eighty eight very soon after the date when traubel's work begins onward simmons had written to him repeatedly it seems concerning the passional relations of men with men as whitman expressed it he is always driving at me about that is that what calamus means because of me or in spite of me is that what it means i have said no but no does not satisfy him there is however no record from simmons side of any letter by whitman to simmons in this sense up to this date but read this letter read the whole of it it is very shrewd very cute in deadliest earnest it drives me hard almost compels me it is urgent persistent he sort of stands in the road and says i won't move till you answer my question you see this is an old letter sixteen years old and he is still asking the question he refers to it in one of his latest notes he is surely a wonderful man a rare cleaned-up man a white-souled heroic character you will be writing something about calamus some day said whitman to traubel and this letter and what i say may help to clear your ideas calamus needs clear ideas it may be easily innocently distorted from its natural its motive body of doctrine the letter dated february the seventh eighteen seventy two of some length is then reproduced it tells how much leaves of grass and especially the calamus section had helped the writer what the love of man for man has been in the past simmons wrote i think i know 
what it is here now i know also alas what you say it can and should be i dimly discern in your poems but this hardly satisfies me so desirous am i of learning what you teach some day perhaps in some form i know not what but in your own chosen form you will tell me more about the love of friends till then i wait said w well what do you think of that do you think that could be answered i don't see why you call that letter driving you hard it's quiet enough it only asks questions and asks the questions mildly enough i suppose you are right drive is not exactly the word yet you know how i hate to be catechized simmons is right no doubt to ask the questions i am just as much right if i do not answer them just as much right if i do answer them i often say to myself about calamus perhaps it means more or less than what i thought myself means different perhaps i don't know what it all means perhaps never did know my first instinct about all that simmons writes is violently reactionary is strong and brutal for no 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 then the thought intervenes that i maybe do not know all my own meanings i say to myself you too go away come back study your own book as alien or stranger study your own book see what it amounts to some time or other i will have to write to him definitely about calamus give him my word for it what i meant or mean it to mean again a month later may twenty fourth eighteen eighty eight whitman speaks to Trawbell of a beautiful letter from simmons you will see that he harps on the calamus poems again i don't see why it should but his recurrence to that subject irritates me a little i suppose you might say why don't you shut him up by answering him there is no logical answer to that i suppose but i may ask in my turn what right has he to ask me questions anyway w laughed a bit anyway the question comes back to me almost every time he writes he is courteous enough about it that is the reason i do not resent him i suppose the whole thing will end in an answer some day the letter follows the chief point in it that the writer hopes he has not been importunate in the question he has asked about calamus three years before i Trawbell said to w that's a humble letter enough i don't see anything in that to get excited about he doesn't ask you to answer the old question in fact he rather apologizes for having asked it w fired up who is excited as to that question he does ask it again and again asks it asks it asks it i laughed at his vehemence well suppose he does it does not harm besides you've got nothing to hide i think your silence might lead him to suppose that there was a nigger in your woodpile oh nonsense but for thirty years my enemies and friends have been asking me questions about the leaves i am tired of not answering questions it was very funny to see his face when he gave a humorous twist to the fling in his last phrase then he relaxed and added anyway i love simmons who could fail to love a man who could write such a letter i suppose he will yet have to be answered damn him it is clear that these conversations considerably diminish the force of the declaration in whitman's letter we see that the letter which on the face of it might have represented the swift and indignant reaction of a man who suddenly faced by the possibility that his work may be interpreted in a perverse sense emphatically repudiates that interpretation was really nothing of the kind simmons for at least eighteen years had been gently considerately even humbly yet persistently asking the same perfectly legitimate question if the answer was really an emphatic no it would more naturally have been made in eighteen seventy two than in eighteen ninety moreover in the face of this ever recurring question whitman constantly speaks to his friends of his great affection for simmons and his admiration for his intellectual cuteness feelings that would both be singularly out of place if applied to a man who was all the time suggesting the possibility that his writings contained inferences that were terrible morbid and damnable evidently during all those years whitman could not decide what to reply on the one hand he was moved by his horror of being questioned by his caution by his natural aversion to express approval of anything that could be called unnatural or abnormal on the other hand he was moved by the desire to let his work speak for itself by his declared determination to leave everything open and possibly by a more or less conscious sympathy for the inferences presented to him 
it was not until the last years of his life when his sexual life belonged to the past when weakness was gaining on him when he wished to put aside every drain on his energies that being constitutionally incapable of a balanced scientific statement he chose the simplest and easiest solution of the difficulty end of part four of chapter one recording by john fricker Part 5 of Chapter 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning another great modern writer, Paul Verlaine, the first of modern French poets, it seems possible to speak with less hesitation. A man who possessed in fullest measure the irresponsible impressionability of genius, Verlaine, as his work shows, and as he himself admitted, all his life oscillated between normal and homosexual love. At one period attracted to women, at another to men, he was without doubt, it seems to me, bisexual an early connection with another young poet arthur rimbaud terminated in a violent quarrel with his friend and led to verlaine's imprisonment at mons in after years he gave expression to the exalted passion of this relationship mon grand peche radio in l'aide et erabundi published in the volume entitled parallèlement and in later poems he has told of less passionate and less sensual relationships which yet were more than friendship for instance in the poem mon ami ma plus belle amitié ma meilleure in bonheur in this brief glance at some of the ethnographical historical religious and literary aspects of homosexual passion there is one other phenomenon which may be mentioned this is the alleged fact that while the phenomena exist to some extent everywhere we seem to find a special proclivity to homosexuality whether or not involving a greater frequency of congenital inversion is not usually clear among certain races and in certain regions in europe this would be best illustrated by the case of southern italy which in this respect is held to be distinct from northern italy although italians generally are franker than men of northern race in admitting their sexual practices how far the supposed greater homosexuality of southern italy may be due to greek influence and greek blood it is not very easy to say it must be remembered that in dealing with a northern country like england homosexual phenomena do not present themselves in the same way as they do in southern italy to-day or in ancient greece in greece the homosexual impulse was recognized and idealized a man could be an open homosexual lover and yet like epaminondas be a great and honored citizen of his country there was no reason whatever why a man who in mental and physical constitution was perfectly normal should not adopt a custom that was regarded as respectable and sometimes as even specially honorable but it is quite otherwise to-day in a country like england or the united states in these countries all our traditions and all our moral ideals as well as the law are energetically opposed to every manifestation of homosexual passion it requires a very strong impetus to go against this compact social force which on every side constrains the individual into the paths of heterosexual love that impetus in a well-bred individual who leads the normal life of his fellow men and who feels the ordinary degree of respect for the social feeling surrounding him can only be supplied by a fundamental usually it is probable inborn perversion of the sexual instinct rendering the individual organically abnormal it is with this fundamental abnormality usually called sexual inversion that we shall here be concerned there is no evidence to show that homosexuality in greece was a congenital perversion although it appears that coelius aurelianus affirms that in the opinion of parmenides it was hereditary aristotle also in his fragment on physical love though treating the whole matter with indulgence seems to have distinguished abnormal congenital homosexuality from acquired homosexual vice doubtless in a certain proportion of cases the impulse was organic and it may well be that there was an organic and racial predisposition to homosexuality among the greeks or at all events the dorians but the state of social feeling however it originated induced a large proportion of the ordinary population to adopt homosexuality as a fashion or it may be said the environment was peculiarly favourable to the development of latent homosexual tendencies 
so that any given number of homosexual persons among the Greeks would have presented a far smaller proportion of constitutionally abnormal individuals than a like number in England. In a similar manner, though I do not regard the analogy as complete, infanticide, or the exposition of children, was practiced in some of the early Greek states by parents who were completely healthy and normal. In England, a married woman who destroys her child is in nearly every case demonstrably diseased or abnormal. For this reason, I am unable to see that homosexuality in ancient Greece, while of great interest as a social and psychological problem, throws light on sexual inversion as we know it in England or the United States. Concerning the wide prevalence of sexual inversion and of homosexual phenomena generally, there can be no manner of doubt. This question has been most fully investigated in Germany. In Berlin, Moll states that he has himself seen between 600 and 700 homosexual persons and heard of some 250 to 350 others. Hirschfeld states that he has known over 10,000 homosexual persons. There are, I am informed, several large cafes in Berlin which are almost exclusively patronized by inverts who come here to flirt and make acquaintances. As these cafes are frequented by male street prostitutes, Pupenjunge, the invert risks being blackmailed or robbed if he goes home or to a hotel with a café acquaintance. There are also a considerable number of homosexual Kneipen, small and unpretentious bar-rooms, which are really male brothels, the inmates being sexually normal working men and boys out of employment or in quest of a few marks as pocket money. These places are regarded by inverts as very safe, as the proprietors insist on good order and allow no extortion while the police, though of course aware of their existence, never interfere. Homosexual cafes for women are also found in Berlin. There is some reason for believing that homosexuality is especially prominent in Germany and among Germans. I have elsewhere referred to the highly emotional and sentimental traits which have frequently marked German friendships. Germany is the only country in which there is a definite and well-supported movement for the defense and social rehabilitation of inverts. The study of sexual inversion began in Germany, and the scientific and literary publications dealing with homosexuality issued from the German press probably surpass in quantity and importance those issued from all other countries put together. The homosexual tendencies of Germans outside Germany have been noted in various countries. Among my English cases I have found that a strain of German blood occurs much more frequently than we are entitled to expect. Parisian prostitutes are said to be aware of the homosexual tastes of Germans. It is significant that, as a German invert familiar with Turkey informed Nick, at Constantinople the procurers, who naturally supply girls as well as youths, regard Germans and Austrians as more tending to homosexuality than the foreigners from any other land. Germans usually deny, however, that there is any special German proclivity to inversion, and it would not appear that such statistics as are available, though all such statistics cannot be regarded as more than approximations, show any pronounced predominance of inversion among Germans. It is to Hirschfeld that we owe the chief attempt to gain some notion of the percentage of homosexual persons among the general population. It may be said to vary in different regions, and more especially in different occupations, from one to ten per cent. But the average when the individuals belonging to a large number of groups are combined is generally found to be rather over two per cent, so that there are about a million and a half inverted persons in Germany. This would be a minimum which can scarcely fail to be below the actual proportion, as no one can be certain that he is acquainted with the real proclivities of all the persons comprising a larger group of acquaintances. It is not found in the estimates which have reached Hirschfeld that the French groups show a smaller proportion of homosexual persons than the German groups, and a Japanese group comes out near to the general average for the whole. Various authorities, especially Germans, believe that homosexuality is just as common in France as in Germany. St. Paul, Dr. Lorps, on the other hand, is unable to accept this view. As an army surgeon who has long served in Africa, he can, as also Rebière in his Joyeux et Demifaux, bear witness to the frequency of homosexuality among the African battalions of the French army, especially in the cavalry, less so in the infantry. In the French army generally he finds it rare, as also in the general population. 
Neck is also inclined to believe that homosexuality is rarer in Celtic lands and in the Latin countries generally than in Teutonic and Slavonic lands, and believes that it may be a question of race. The question is still undecided. It is possible that the undoubted fact that homosexuality is less conspicuous in France and the other Latin countries than in Teutonic lands may be due not to the occurrence of a smaller proportion of congenital inverts in the former lands, but mainly to general difference in temperament and in the social reaction. The French idealize and emphasize the place of women to a much greater degree than the Germans, while at the same time inverts in France have much less occasion than in Germany to proclaim their legal grievances. Apart from such considerations as these, it seems very doubtful whether inborn inversion is in any considerable degree rarer in France than in Germany. As to the frequency of homosexuality in England and the United States, there is much evidence. In England, its manifestations are well marked for those whose eyes have once been opened. The manifestations are of the same character as those in Germany, modified by social and national differences, and especially by the greater reserve puritanism and prudery of england in the united states these same influences exert a still greater effect in restraining the outward manifestations of homosexuality hirschfeld though so acute and experienced in the investigation of homosexuality states that when visiting philadelphia and boston he could scarcely detect any evidence of homosexuality though he was afterwards ensured by those acquainted with local conditions that its extension in both cities is colossal there have been numerous criminal cases and scandals in the United States in which homosexuality has come to the surface, and the very frequently occurring cases of transvestism or cross-dressing in the States seem to be in a large proportion associated with homosexuality. In the opinion of some, English homosexuality has become much more conspicuous during recent years, and this is sometimes attributed to the Oscar Wilde case. No doubt the celebrity of Oscar Wilde and the universal publicity given to the facts of the case by the newspapers may have brought conviction of their perversion to many inverts who were before only vaguely conscious of their abnormality, and, paradoxical though it may seem, have imparted greater courage to others, but it can scarcely have sufficed to increase the number of inverts. Rather, one may say, the development of urban life renders easier the exhibition and satisfaction of this as all other forms of perversion. Regarding the proportion of inverts among the general population, it is very difficult to speak positively. The invert himself is a misleading guide because he has formed round himself a special coterie of homosexual persons, and, moreover, he is sometimes apt to overestimate the number of inverts through the misinterpretation of small indications that are not always conclusive. The estimate of the ordinary normal person feeling the ordinary disgust towards abnormal phenomena is also misleading because his homosexual acquaintances are careful not to inform him concerning their proclivities. A writer who has studied the phenomena of homosexuality is apt to be misguided in the same way as the invert himself, and to overestimate the prevalence of the perversion. Striving to put aside this source of fallacy, and only considering those individuals with whom I have been brought in contact by the ordinary circumstances of life, and with whose modes of feeling I am acquainted, I am still led to the conclusion that the proportion is considerable among the professional and most cultured element of the middle class in england there must be a distinct percentage of inverts which may sometimes be as much as five per cent though such estimates must always be hazardous among women of the same class the percentage seems to be at least double though here the phenomena are less definite and deep-seated this seems to be a moderate estimate for this class which includes however it must be remembered a considerable proportion of individuals who are somewhat abnormal in other respects as we descend the scale the phenomena are doubtless less common though when we reach the working class we come to that comparative indifference to which allusion has already been made taken altogether we may probably conclude that the proportion of inverts is the same as in other related and neighbouring lands that is to say slightly over two per cent that would give the homosexual population of great Britain as somewhere about a million end of chapter one recording by john fricker
Chapter two of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter two The Study of Sexual Inversion. Westphal, an eminent professor of psychiatry at Berlin, may be said to be the first to put the study of sexual inversion on an assured scientific basis. In 1870, he published in the Archive for Psychiatry, of which he was for many years editor, the detailed history of a young woman who, from her earliest years, differed from other girls. She liked to dress as a boy, only cared for boys' games, and as she grew up was sexually attracted only to women, with whom she formed a series of tender relationships, in which the friends obtained sexual gratification by mutual caresses while she blushed and was shy in the presence of women more especially the girl with whom she chanced to be in love she was always absolutely indifferent in the presence of men westphal a pupil it may be noted of greisinger who had already called attention to the higher character sometimes shown by subjects of this perversion combined keen scientific insight with a rare degree of personal sympathy for those who came under his care and it was this combination of qualities which enabled him to grasp the true nature of a case such as this which by most medical men at the time would have been hastily dismissed as a vulgar instance of vice or insanity westphal perceived that this abnormality was congenital not acquired so that it could not be termed vice and while he insisted on the presence of neurotic elements his observations showed the absence of anything that could legitimately be termed insanity he gave to this condition the name of contrary sexual feeling contraire sexual empfindung by which it was long usually known in germany the way was thus made clear for the rapid progress of our knowledge of this abnormality new cases were published in quick succession at first exclusively in germany and more especially in westphal's archive but soon in other countries also chiefly italy and france while westphal was the first to place the study of sexual inversion on a progressive footing many persons have previously obtained glimpses into the subject thus in seventeen ninety one two cases were published of men who showed a typical emotional attraction to their own sex though it was not quite clearly made out that the inversion was congenital in eighteen thirty six again a swiss writer heinrich hersley published a rather diffuse but remarkable work entitled eros which contained much material of a literary character bearing on this matter he seemed to have been moved to write this book by a trial which had excited considerable attention at that time a man of good position had suddenly murdered a youth and was executed for the crime which according to hersley was due to homosexual love and jealousy hersley was not a trained scholar he was in business at glarus as a skilful milliner the most successful in the town his own temperament is supposed to have been bisexual his book was prohibited by the local authorities and at a later period the entire remaining stock was destroyed in a fire so that its circulation was very small it is now however regarded by some as the first serious attempt to deal with the problem of homosexuality since plato's banquet some years later in eighteen fifty two casper the chief medico-legal authority of his time in germany for it is in germany that the foundations of the study of sexual inversion have been laid pointed out in casper's Vitaliarschrift that pederasty in a broad sense of the word was sometimes a kind of moral hermaphroditism due to a congenital psychic condition and also that it by no means necessarily involved sodomy missio penis in anum casper brought forward a considerable amount of valuable evidence concerning these cardinal points which he was the first to note but he failed to realize the full significance of his observations and they had no immediate influence though tardieu in eighteen fifty eight admitted a congenital element in some pederasts the man however who more than any one else brought to light the phenomena of sexual inversion had not been concerned either with the medical or the criminal aspects of the matter karl heinrich ulrichs born in eighteen twenty five near aurich who for many years expounded and defended homosexual love and whose views are said to have had some influence in drawing westphal's attention to the matter was a hanoverian legal official and successor 
himself sexually inverted from eighteen sixty four onward at first under the name of numa numantius and subsequently under his own name ulrichs published in various parts of germany a long series of works dealing with this question and made various attempts to obtain a revision of the legal position of the sexual invert in germany although not a writer whose psychological views can carry much scientific weight ulrichs appears to have been a man of most brilliant ability and his knowledge is said to have been of almost universal extent he was not only well versed in his own special subjects of jurisprudence and theology but in many branches of natural science as well as in archaeology he was also regarded by many as the best latinist of his time in eighteen eighty he left germany and settled in naples and afterwards at aquila in the abruzzi whence he issued a latin periodical he died in eighteen ninety five john addington simmons who went to aquila in eighteen ninety one wrote ulrichs is chrysostomus to the last degree sweet noble a true gentleman and man of genius he must have been at one time a man of singular personal distinction so finely cut are his features and so grand the lines of his skull for many years ulrichs was alone in his efforts to gain scientific recognition for congenital homosexuality he devised with allusion to uranos in plato's symposium the word uranian or urning ever since frequently used for the homosexual lover while he called the normal heterosexual lover a dioning from dion he regarded uranism or homosexual love as a congenital abnormality by which a female soul had become united with a male body anima mulibris in corpore virili inclusa and his theoretical speculations have formed the starting point for many similar speculations his writings are remarkable in various respects although on account of the polemical warmth with which as one pleading pro domo he argued his cause they had no marked influence on scientific thought this privilege was reserved for westphal after he had shown the way and thrown open his journal for their publication new cases appeared in rapid succession in italy also ritti tamasia lombroso and others began to study these phenomena in eighteen eighty two charcot and magnan published in the archive de neurologie the first important study which appeared in france concerning sexual inversion and allied sexual perversions they regarded sexual inversion as an episode syndrome in a more fundamental process of hereditary degeneration and compared it with such morbid obsessions as dipsomania and kleptomania from a somewhat more medico-legal standpoint the study of sexual inversion in france was furthered by brouardel and still more by la cassagne whose stimulating influence at lyons has produced fruitful results in the work of many pupils of much more importance in the history of the theory of sexual inversion was the work of richard von kraft ebbing born at mannheim in eighteen forty and died at graz in nineteen o two for many years professor of psychiatry at vienna university and one of the most distinguished alienists of his time while active in all departments of psychiatry and author of a famous textbook from eighteen seventy seven onward he took special interest in the pathology of the sexual impulse his psychopathia sexualis contained over two hundred histories not only of sexual inversion but of all other forms of sexual perversion for many years it was the only book on the subject and it long remained the chief storehouse of facts it passed through many editions and was translated into many languages there are two translations in english enjoying an immense and not altogether enviable vogue craft ebbing's methods were open to some objection his mind was not of a severely critical order he poured out the new and ever enlarged editions of his book with extraordinary rapidity sometimes remodelling them he introduced new subdivisions from time to time into his classification of sexual perversions and although this rather fine-spun classification has doubtless contributed to give precision to the subject and to advance its scientific study it was at no time generally accepted Kraft Ebbing's great service lay in the clinical enthusiasm with which he approached the study of sexual perversions. 
with the firm conviction that he was conquering a great neglected field of morbid psychology which rightly belongs to the physician he accumulated without any false shame a vast mass of detailed histories and his reputation induced sexually abnormal individuals in all directions to send him their autobiographies in the desire to benefit their fellow sufferers it is as a clinician rather than as a psychologist that we must regard kraft ebbing at the outset he considered inversion to be a functional sign of degeneration a partial manifestation of a neuropathic and psychopathic state which is in most cases hereditary this perverse sexuality appears spontaneously with the developing sexual life without external causes as the individual manifestation of an abnormal modification of the vita sexualis and must then be regarded as congenital or it develops as a result of special injurious influences working on a sexuality which had at first been normal and must then be regarded as acquired careful investigation of these so-called acquired cases however kraft ebbing in the end finally believed would indicate that the predisposition consists in a latent homosexuality or at least bisexuality which requires for its manifestation the operation of accidental causes in the last edition of his work kraft ebbing was inclined to regard inversion as being not so much a degeneration as a variation a simple anomaly and acknowledged that his opinion thus approximated to that which had long been held by inverts themselves at the time of his death kraft ebbing who had begun by accepting the view at that time prevalent among alienists that homosexuality is a sign of degeneration thus fully adopted and set the seal of his authority on the view already expressed alike by some scientific investigators as well as by inverts themselves that sexual inversion is to be regarded simply as an anomaly whatever difference of opinion there might be as to the value of the anomaly the way was even opened for such a view as that of freud and most of the psychoanalysts today who regard a strain of homosexuality as normal and almost constant with a profound significance for the psychonervous life in eighteen ninety one dr albert moll of berlin published his work die contraire sexual empfindung which subsequently appeared in much enlarged and revised editions it speedily superseded all previous books as a complete statement and judicious discussion of sexual inversion moll was not content merely to present fresh clinical material he attacked the problem which had now become of primary importance the nature and causes of sexual inversion he discussed the phenomena as a psychologist even more than as a physician and bearing in mind the broader aspects of the problem keenly critical of accepted opinions but judiciously cautious in the statement of conclusions he cleared away various ancient prejudices and superstitions which even kraft ebbing sometimes incautiously repeated he accepted the generally received doctrine that the sexually inverted usually belong to families in which the various nervous and mental disorders prevail but he pointed out at the same time that it is not in all cases possible to prove that we are concerned with individuals possessing a hereditary neurotic taint he also rejected any minute classification of sexual inverts and recognizing psychosexual hermaphroditism and homosexuality at the same time he cast doubt on the existence of acquired homosexuality in a strict sense except in occasional cases and he pointed out that even when a normal heterosexual impulse appears at puberty and a homosexual impulse later it may still be the former that was acquired and the latter that was inborn in america attention had been given to the phenomena at a fairly early period mention may be specially made of j g kiernan and g frank lidston both of whom put forward convenient classifications of homosexual manifestations some thirty years ago more recently nineteen eleven an american writer under the pseudonym of xavier main privately printed an extensive work entitled the intersexes a history of simile sexualism as a problem in social life popularly written and compiled from many sources this book from a subjective and scarcely scientific standpoint claims that homosexual relationships are natural necessary and legitimate in england the first attempts to deal seriously from the modern point of view with the problem of homosexuality came late and were either published privately or abroad 
In 1883, John Addington Simmons privately printed his discussion of Pederastia in ancient Greece under the title of A Problem in Greek Ethics, and in 1889 to 1890 he further wrote and in 1891 privately printed A Problem of Modern Ethics, being an inquiry into the phenomena of sexual inversion. In 1886, Sir Richard Burton added to his translation of the Arabian Nights a terminal essay on the same subject. In 1894, Edward Carpenter privately printed in Manchester a pamphlet entitled Homogenic Love, in which he criticized various psychiatric views of inversion at that time current, and claimed that the laws of homosexual love are the same as those of heterosexual love, urging, however, that the former possesses a special aptitude to be exalted to a higher and more spiritual level of comradeship, so fulfilling a beneficent social function. More recently, 1907, Edward Carpenter published a volume of papers on homosexuality and its problems under the title of The Intermediate Sex, and later, 1914, a more special study of the invert in early religion and in warfare, intermediate types among primitive folk. In 1896, the most comprehensive book so far written on the subject in England was published in French by Mr. André Rafalovich in La Cassin's Bibliothèque de Criminologie, Uranisme et Unisexualité. This book dealt chiefly with congenital inversion, publishing no new cases, but revealing a wide knowledge of the matter. Rafalovich put forward many just and sagacious reflections on the nature and treatment of inversion and the attitude of society towards perverted sexuality. The historical portions of the book, which are of special interest, deal largely with the remarkable prevalence of inversion in England, neglected by previous investigators. Rafalovich, whose attitude is on the whole philosophical rather than scientific, regards congenital inversion as a large and inevitable factor in human life, but taking the Catholic standpoint he condemns all sexuality, either homosexual or heterosexual, and urges the invert to restrain the physical manifestations of his instinct and to aim at an ideal of chastity. On the whole, it may be said that the book is the work of a thinker who has reached his own results in his own way, and those results bear an imprint of originality and freedom from tradition. In recent years, no one has so largely contributed to place our knowledge of sexual inversion on a broad and accurate basis as Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld of Berlin, who possesses an unequalled acquaintance with the phenomena of homosexuality in all their aspects. He has studied the matter exhaustively in Germany, and to some extent in other countries also. He has received the histories of a thousand inverts. He is said to have met over ten thousand homosexual persons. As editor of the Jahrbuch für Sexuelle Zwischenstufen, which he established in 1899, and author of various important monographs, more especially on transitional, psychic and physical stages between masculinity and femininity, Hirschfeld had already contributed greatly to the progress of investigation in this field before the appearance in 1914 of his great work Die Homosexualität des Mann und des Wiebe. This is not only the largest, but the most precise, detailed, and the comprehensive, even the most condensed, work which has yet appeared on the subject. It is indeed an encyclopedia of homosexuality. For such a task, Hirschfeld has been prepared by many years of strenuous activity as a physician, an investigator, a medico-legal expert before the courts, and his position as president of the Wissenschaftliche Humanitären Committee, which is concerned with the defense of the interests of homosexuality in Germany. In Hirschfeld's book, the pathological conception of inversion has entirely disappeared. Homosexuality is regarded as primarily a biological phenomena of universal extension, and secondarily as a social phenomena of serious importance. There is no attempt to invent new theories. The main value of Hirschfeld's work lies, indeed, in the constant endeavor to keep close to definite facts. It is this quality which renders the book an indispensable source for all those who seek enlightened and precise information on this question. Even the existence of such a treatise as this of Hirschfeld's is enough to show how rapidly the study of this subject has grown. A few years ago, for instance, when Dr. Paul Moreau wrote his Aberration du sens génétique, sexual inversion was scarcely even a name. It was a loathsome and nameless vice, only to be touched with a pair of tongs, rapidly and with precautions. 
as it now presents itself it is a psychological and medico-legal problem so full of interest that we need not fear to face it and so full of grave social actuality that we are bound to face it end of chapter two recording by john fricker part one of chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three sexual inversion in men when the sexual instinct first appears in early youth it is much less specialized than normally it becomes later not only is it at the outset less definitely directed to a specific sexual end but even the sex of its object is sometimes uncertain this has always been so well recognized that those in authority over young men have sometimes forced women upon them to avoid the risk of possible unnatural offences the institution which presents these phenomena to us in the most marked and the most important manner is naturally the school in england especially the public school in france where the same phenomena are noted tarde called attention to these relationships most usually platonic in the primitive meaning of the word which indicate a simple indecision of frontier between friendship and love still undifferentiated in the dawn of the awakening heart and he regretted that no one had studied them in england we are very familiar with vague allusions to the vices of public schools from time to time we read letters in the newspapers denouncing public schools as hotbeds of vice and one anonymous writer remarks that some of our public schools almost provoke the punishment of the cities of the plain but these allegations are rarely or never submitted to accurate investigation the physicians and masters of public schools who are in a position to study the matter usually possess no psychological training and appear to view homosexuality with too much disgust to care to pay any careful attention to it what knowledge they possess they keep to themselves for it is considered to be in the interests of public schools that these things should be hushed up when anything very scandalous occurs one or two lads are expelled to their own grave and perhaps lifelong injury and without benefit to those who remain whose awakening sexual life rarely receives intelligent sympathy in several of the histories which follow in this chapter as well as in histories contained in other volumes of these studies details will be found concerning homosexuality as it occurs in english schools public or private see also the study autoeroticism in volume one the prevalence of homosexual and erotic phenomena in schools varies greatly at different schools and at different times in the same school while in small private schools such phenomena may be entirely unknown as an english schoolboy i never myself saw or heard anything of such practices and in germany professor gerlitt de new generation january nineteen o nine among others testifies to similar absence of experience during his whole school life although there was much talk and joking among the boys over sexual things i have added some observations by a correspondent whose experiences of english public school life are still recent in the years i was a member of a public school i saw and heard a good deal of homosexuality though till my last two years i did not understand its meaning as a prefect i discussed with other prefects the methods of checking it and of punishing it when detected my own observations supported by those of others led me to think that the fault of the usual method of dealing with homosexuality in schools is that it regards all school homosexualists as being in one class together and has only one way of dealing with them the birch for a first offence expulsion for a second now i think we may distinguish three classes of homosexualists a a very small number who are probably radically inverted and who do not scruple to sacrifice young and innocent boys to their passions these and these only are a real moral danger to others and i believe them to be rare b boys of various ages who having been initiated into the passive part in their young days continue practices of an active or passive kind but only with boys already known to be homosexualists they draw the line at corrupting fresh victims this class realize more or less what they are about but cannot be called a danger to the morals of pure boys 
see young boys who whether in the development of their own physical nature or by the instruction of older boys of the class a find out the pleasures of masturbation or intercrural connection i never heard of a case of pedicatio at my school and only once of fellatio which was attempted on a quite young boy who complained to his housemaster and the offender was expelled boys in this class have probably little or no idea of what sexual morality means and can hardly be accused of a moral offence at all i submit that these three classes should receive quite different treatment expulsion may occasionally be necessary for class a but the few who belong to this class are usually too cunning to get caught it used to be notorious at school that it was almost always the wrong people who got dropped on i do not think a boy in the other two classes should ever be expelled and even when expulsion is unavoidable it should if possible be deferred till the end of the term so as to make it indistinguishable from an ordinary departure after all there is no reason to ruin a boy's prospects because he is a little beast at sixteen there are very few hopeless incorrigibles at that age as regards the other two classes i should begin by giving boys very much fuller enlightenment on sexual subjects than is usually done before they go to a public school at all either a boy is pitchforked into the place in utter innocence and ignorance and yields to temptations to do things which he vaguely if at all realizes are wrong and that only because a puzzling sort of instinct tells him so or else he is given just enough information to whet his curiosity usually in the shape of warnings against certain apparently harmless bodily acts which he not unnaturally tries out of curiosity and finds them very pleasant it may be undesirable that a boy should have full knowledge at the time he goes to school but it is more undesirable that he should go with a burning curiosity or a total ignorance on the subject i am convinced that much might be done in the way of prevention if boys were told more and allowed to be open much of the pleasure of sexual talk among boys i believe to be due to the spurious interest aroused by the fact that it is forbidden fruit and involves risk if caught it seems to me that frankness is far more moral than suggestion i would not expurgate school editions of great authors the frank obscenity of parts of shakespeare is far less immoral than the prurient prudishness which declines to print it but numbers the lines in such a way that the boy can go home and look up the omitted passage in a complete edition with a distinct sense of guilt which is where the harm comes in it is probable that only a small proportion of homosexual boys in schools can properly be described as vicious a hoch describing homosexuality in german schools and putting together communications received from various medical men regarding their own youthful experiences at school finds relationships of the kind very common usually between boys of different ages and school classes according to one observer the feminine or passive part was always played by a boy of girlish form and complexion and the relationships were somewhat like those of normal lovers with kissing poems love letters scenes of jealousy sometimes visits to each other in bed but without masturbation pederasty or other grossly physical manifestations from his own youthful experience hoche records precisely similar observations and remarks that the lovers were by no means recruited from the vicious elements in the school the elder scholars of twenty-one or twenty-two years of age formed regular sexual relationships with the servant girls in the house it is probable that the homosexual relationships in english schools are as a rule not more vicious than those described by hoche but that the concealment in which they are wrapped leads to exaggeration in the course of a discussion on this matter over thirty years ago olim etoniensis wrote journal of education eighteen eighty two that on making a list of the vicious boys he had known at eton he found that these very boys had become cabinet ministers statesmen officers clergymen country gentlemen etc and that they are nearly all of them fathers of thriving families respected and prosperous but as marrow has remarked the question is not thus settled public distinction by no means necessarily implies any fine degree of private morality sometimes the manifestations thus appearing in schools or wherever youths are congregated together are not truly homosexual but exhibit a more or less brutal or even sadistic perversion of the immature sexual instinct this may be illustrated by the following narrative concerning a large london city warehouse a youth left my class at the age of sixteen and a half 
writes a correspondent to take up an apprenticeship in a large wholesale firm in g street fortunately he went on probation of three weeks before articling he came to me at the end of the first week asking me to intercede with his mother he had no father not to let him return he told me that almost nightly and especially when new fellows came the youths in his dormitory eleven in number would waylay him hold him down and rub his parts to the tune of some comic song or dance music the boy who could choose the fastest time had the privilege of performing the operation and most had to be the victim in turn unless new boys entered when they would sometimes be subjected to this for a week this boy having been brought up strictly was shocked dazed and alarmed but they stopped him from calling out and he dared not report it most boys entered direct on their apprenticeship without probation and had no chance to get out i procured the boy's release from the place and gave the manager to understand what went on in such a case as this it has usually happened that a strong boy of brutal and perverse instincts and some force of character initiates proceedings which the others either fall into with complacency or are too weak to resist max dessoir came to the conclusion that an undifferentiated sexual feeling is normal on the average during the first years of puberty i e from thirteen to fifteen in boys and from twelve to fourteen in girls while in later years it must be regarded as pathological he added very truly that in this early period the sexual emotion has not become centred in the sexual organs this fact is certainly far too often forgotten by grown-up persons who suspect the idealised passion of boys and girls of a physical side which children have often no suspicion of and would view with repulsion and horror how far the sexual instinct may be said to be undifferentiated in early puberty as regards sex is a little doubtful it is comparatively undifferentiated but except in rare cases it is not absolutely undifferentiated we have to admit however that in the opinion of the latest physiologists of sex such as castle heap and marshall each sex contains the latent characteristics of the other or recessive sex each sex is latent in the other and each as it contains the characters of both sexes and can transmit those of the recessive sex is latently hermaphrodite a homosexual tendency may thus be regarded as simply the physical manifestation of special characters of the recessive sex susceptible of being evolved under changed circumstances such as may occur near puberty and associated with changed metabolism william james principles of psychology considered inversion a kind of sexual appetite of which very likely most men possess the germinal possibility Connolly Norman, article Sexual Perversions, Tuke's Dictionary of Psychological Medicine, also stated that the sexual passion at its first appearance is always indefinite and is very easily turned in a wrong direction, and he apparently accounted for inversion by this fact and by the precocity of neurotics. Orbici and Marchesini refer to the indeterminate character of the sexual feelings when they first begin to develop a correspondent believes that sexual feelings are undifferentiated in the early years about puberty but at the same time considers that school life is to some extent responsible the holidays he adds are sufficiently long to counteract it however provided the boy has sisters and they have friends the change from school fare and work to home naturally results in a greater surplus of nerve force and i think most boys fool about with servants or their sisters friends moll contraire sexual eighteen eighty nine does not think it proved that a stage of undifferentiated sexual feeling always occurs although we have to recognize that it is of frequent occurrence in his later work moll remains of the same opinion that a homosexual tendency is very frequent in normal children whose later development is quite normal it begins between the ages of seven and ten or even at five and may last to twenty in recent years freud has accepted and developed the conception of the homosexual strain as normal in early life thus in nineteen o five in his bruchstuck einer hysterie analyse freud regards it as a well-known fact that boys and girls at puberty normally show plain signs of the existence of a homosexual tendency 
under favourable circumstances this tendency is overcome but when a happy heterosexual love is not established it remains liable to reappear under the influence of an appropriate stimulus in the neurotic these homosexual germs are more highly developed i have never carried through any psychoanalysis of a man or a woman freud states without discovering a very significant homosexual tendency Ferenczi, again, without reference to any physical basis of the impulse, accepts the psychic capacity of the child to direct his originally objectless eroticism to one or both sexes, and terms this disposition ambisexuality. The normality of a homosexual element in early life may be said to be accepted by most psychoanalysts, even of the schools that are separated from Freud sterkel would go farther and regards various psychic sexual anomalies as signs of a concealed bisexual tendency psychic impotence the admiration of men for masculine women and of women for feminine men various forms of fetishism they are all masks of homosexuality these schoolboy affections and passions arise to a large extent spontaneously with the evolution of the sexual emotions though the method of manifestation may be a matter of example or suggestion as the sexual emotions become stronger and as the lad leaves school or college to mix with men and women in the world the instinct usually turns into the normal channel in which channel the instincts of the majority of boys have been directed from the earliest appearance of puberty if not earlier but a certain proportion remain insensitive to the influence of women and these may be regarded as true sexual inverts some of them are probably individuals of somewhat undeveloped sexual instincts the members of this group are of some interest psychologically although from the comparative quiescence of their sexual emotions they have received little attention the following communication which i have received from a well accredited source is noteworthy from this point of view the following facts may possibly be of interest to you though my statement of them is necessarily general and vague i happen to know intimately three cases of men whose affections have chiefly been directed exclusively to persons of their own sex the first having practised masturbation as a boy and then for some ten years ceased to practise it to such an extent that he even inhibited his erotic dreams has since recurred to it deliberately at about fortnightly intervals as a substitute for copulation for which he has never felt the least desire but occasionally when sleeping with a male friend he has emissions in the act of embracing the second is constantly and to an abnormal extent i should say troubled with erotic dreams and emissions and takes drugs by doctor's advice to reduce this activity he has recently developed a sexual interest in women but for ethical and other reasons does not copulate with them of the third i can say little as he has not talked to me on the subject but i know that he has never had intercourse with women and has always had a natural and instinctive repulsion to the idea in all these i imagine the physical impulse of sex is less imperative than in the average man the emotional impulse on the other hand is very strong it has given birth to friendships of which i find no adequate description anywhere but in the dialogues of plato and beyond a certain feeling of strangeness at the gradual discovery of a temperament apparently different to that of most men it has provoked no kind of self-reproach or shame on the contrary the feeling has been rather one of elation in the consciousness of a capacity of affection which appears to be a finer and more spiritual than that which commonly subsists between persons of different sexes these men are all of intellectual capacity above the average and one is actively engaged in the world where he is both respected for his capacity and admired for his character i mention this particularly because it appears to be the habit in books upon the subject to regard the relation in question as pathological and to set cases where those who are concerned in it are tormented with shame and remorse in the cases to which i am referring nothing of the kind subsists in all these cases a physical sexual attraction is recognized as the basis of the relation but as a matter of feeling and partly also of theory the ascetic ideal is adopted these are the only cases with which i am personally and intimately acquainted but no one can have passed through a public school and college life without constantly observing indications of the phenomenon in question 
it is clear to me that in a large number of instances there is no fixed line between what is called distinctively friendship and love and it is probably the influence of custom and public opinion that in most cases finally specializes the physical passion in the direction of the opposite sex the classification of the varieties of homosexuality is a matter of difficulty and no classification is very fundamental the early attempts of Krauss ebbing and others at elaborate classification are no longer acceptable even the most elementary groupings become doubtful when we have definitely to fit our cases into them the old distinction between congenital and acquired homosexuality has ceased to possess significance when we have recognized that there is a tendency for homosexuality to arise in persons of usually normal tendency who are placed under conditions as on board ship or in prison where the exercise of normal sexuality is impossible there is little further classification to be achieved along this line we have gone as far as is necessary by admitting a general undefined homosexuality a relationship of unspecified nature to persons of the same sex in addition to the more specific sexual inversion it may now be said to be recognized by all authorities even by freud who emphasizes a special psychological mechanism by which homosexuality may become established that a congenital predisposition as well as an acquired tendency is necessary to constitute true inversion apparent exceptions being too few to carry much weight kraft ebbing neck ivan bloch who at one time believed in the possibility of acquired inversion all finally abandoned that view and even schrenk notzing a vigorous champion of the doctrine of acquired inversion twenty years ago admits the necessity of a favouring predisposition an admission which renders the distinction between innate and acquired an unimportant if not a merely verbal distinction supposing indeed that we are prepared to admit that true inversion may be purely acquired the decision in any particular case must be extremely difficult and i have found very few cases which even with imperfect knowledge could fairly be so termed even the cases to which schopenhauer long since referred in which inversion is only established late in life are no longer regarded as constituting a difficulty in accepting the doctrine of the congenital nature of inversion in such cases the inversion is merely retarded the conception of retarded inversion that is to say a latent congenital inversion becoming manifest at a late period in life was first brought forward by thoinot in eighteen ninety eight in his attentat au mur in order to supersede the unsatisfactory conception as he considered it to be of acquired inversion thoinot regarded retarded inversion as relatively rare and of no great importance but more accessible to therapeutic measures three years later kraft ebbing towards the close of his life adopted the same conception the cases to which he applied it were all he considered of bisexual disposition and usually also marked by sexual hyperesthesia this way of looking at the matter was speedily championed by neck and may now said to be widely accepted moll earlier than thoinot had pointed out that it is difficult to believe that homosexuality in late life can ever be produced without at least some inborn weakness of the heterosexual impulse and that we must not deny the possibility of heredity even when homosexuality appears at the age of fifty or sixty moll believes it is very doubtful whether heterosexual satiety alone can ever suffice to produce homosexuality neck was careful to set aside the cases to which much significance was once attached in which old men with failing sexual powers or younger men exhausted by heterosexual debauchery are attracted to boys in such cases which include the majority of those appearing late neck regarded the inversion as merely spurious the faute de mieux of persons no longer apt for normal sexual activity such cases no doubt need more careful psychological study than they usually receive Ferre once investigated a case of this kind in which a healthy young man though with slightly neurotic heredity on one side practised sexual intercourse excessively between the ages of twenty and twenty-three often impelled by more amour propre or what adler would term the masculine protest of the organically inferior than sexual desire and then suddenly became impotent at the same time losing all desire but without any other loss of health six months later potency slowly returned though never to the same extent and he married 
at the age of thirty-five symptoms of locomotor ataxia began to appear and some years later he again became impotent but without losing sexual desire suddenly one day on sitting in close contact with a young man at a table d'hote he experienced a violent erection he afterward found that the same thing occurred with other young men and though he had no psychic desire for men he was constrained to seek such contact and a repugnance for women and their sexuality arose five months later a complete paraplegic impotence set in and then both the homosexual tendency and the aversion to women disappeared in such a case under the influence of disease excessive stimulation seems to result in more or less complete sexual anaesthesia just as temporarily we may be more or less blinded by excessive light and functional power reasserts itself under the influence of a different and normally much weaker stimulus lepman who has studied the homosexual manifestations of previously normal old men towards boys considers the chief factor to be a flaring up of the sexual impulse in a perverted direction in an early stage of morbid cerebral disturbance not amounting to insanity and not involving complete irresponsibility in such cases lepman believes the subject may through his lack of power be brought back to the beginning of his sexual life and to the perhaps unconsciously homosexual attractions of that age end of part one of chapter three recording by john fricker part two of chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With the recognition that homosexuality in youth may be due to an as yet undifferentiated sexual impulse, homosexuality in mature age to a retarded development on a congenital basis, and homosexuality in old age to a return to the attitude of youth, the area of spurious or pseudo-homosexuality seems to me to be very much restricted most perhaps all authorities still accept the reality of this spurious homosexuality in heterosexual persons but they enter into no details concerning it and they bring forward no minutely observed cases in which it occurred hirschfeld in discussing the diagnosis of homosexuality and seeking to distinguish genuine from spurious inverts enumerates three classes of the latter one those who practice homosexuality for purposes of gain more especially male prostitutes and blackmailers two persons who from motives of pity good nature friendship etc allow themselves to be the objects of homosexual desire three normal persons who when excluded from the society of the opposite sex as in schools barracks on board ship or in prison have sexual relations with persons of their own sex now hirschfeld clearly realizes that the mere sexual act is no proof of the direction of the sexual impulse it may be rendered possible by mechanical irritation as by the stimulation of a full bladder and in women without any stimulation at all such cases can have little psychological significance moreover he seems to admit that some subdivisions of his first class are true inverts he further mentions that some seventy-five per cent of the individuals included in these classes are between fifteen and twenty-five years of age that is to say that they have scarcely emerged from the period when we have reason to believe that in a large number of individuals at all events the sexual impulse is not yet definitely differentiated so that neither its homosexual nor its heterosexual tendencies can properly be regarded as spurious if indeed we really accept the very reasonable view that the basis of the sexual life is bisexual although its direction may be definitely fixed in a heterosexual or homosexual direction at a very early period in life it becomes difficult to see how we can any longer speak with certainty of a definitely spurious class of homosexual persons every one of hirschfeld's three classes may well contain a majority of genuinely homosexual or bisexual persons the prostitutes and even the blackmailers are certainly genuine inverts in very many cases those persons again who allow themselves to be the recipients of homosexual attentions may well possess traces of homosexual feeling and are undoubtedly in very many cases lacking in vigorous heterosexual impulse finally the persons who turn to their own sex when forcibly excluded from the society of the opposite sex can by no means be assumed without question to be normal heterosexual persons it is only a small proportion of heterosexual persons who experience these impulses under such conditions 
there are always others who under the same conditions remain emotionally attracted to the opposite sex and sexually indifferent to their own sex there is evidently a difference and that difference may most reasonably be supposed to be in the existence of a trace of homosexual feeling which is called into activity under the abnormal conditions and subsides when the stronger heterosexual impulse can again be gratified the real distinction would seem therefore to be between a homosexual impulse so strong that it subsists even in the presence of the heterosexual object and a homosexual impulse so weak that it is eclipsed by the presence of the heterosexual object we could not however properly speak of the latter as any more spurious or pseudo than the former a heterosexual person who experiences a homosexual impulse in the absence of any homosexual disposition is not today easy to accept we can certainly accept the possibility of a mechanical or other non-sexual stimulus leading to a sexual act contrary to the individual's disposition but usually it is somewhat difficult to prove and when proved it has little psychological significance or importance we may expect therefore to find pseudo homosexuality or spurious homosexuality playing a dwindling part in classification the simplest of all possible classifications and that which i adopted in the early editions of the present study merely seeks to distinguish between those who not being exclusively attracted to the opposite sex are exclusively attracted to the same sex and those who are attracted to both sexes the first are the homosexual whether or not the attraction springs from genuine inversion the second are the bisexual or as they were formerly more often termed following kraft ebbing psychosexual hermaphrodites there would thus seem to be a broad and simple grouping of all sexually functioning persons into three comprehensive divisions the heterosexual the bisexual and the homosexual even this elementary classification seems however of no great practical use the bisexual group is found to introduce uncertainty and doubt not only a large proportion of persons who may fairly be considered normally heterosexual have at some time in their lives experienced a feeling which may be termed sexual towards individuals of their own sex but a very large proportion of persons who are definitely and markedly homosexual are found to have experienced sexual attraction toward and have had relationships with persons of the opposite sex the social pressure urging all persons into the normal sexual channel suffices to develop such slight germs of heterosexuality as homosexual persons may possess and so to render them bisexual in the majority of adult bisexual persons it would seem that the homosexual tendency is stronger and more organic than the heterosexual tendency bisexuality would thus in a large number of cases be comparable to ambidexterity which beervliet has found to occur most usually in people who are organically left-handed while therefore the division into heterosexual bisexual and homosexual is a useful superficial division it is scarcely a scientific classification in the face of these various considerations and in view of the fact that while i feel justified in regarding the histories of my case as reliable so far as they go i have not been always able to explore them extensively it has seemed best to me to attempt no classification at all the order in which the following histories appear is not therefore to be regarded as possessing any significance it may be proper at this point to say a few words as to the reliability of the statements furnished by homosexual persons this has sometimes been called in question many years ago we used to be told that inverts are such lying and deceitful degenerates that it was impossible to place reliance on anything they said it was also usual to say that when they wrote autobiographical accounts of themselves they merely sought to mould them in the fashion of those published by kraft ebbing more recently the psychoanalysts have made a more radical attack on all histories not obtained by their own methods as being quite unreliable even when put forth in good faith in part because the subject withholds much that he either regards as too trivial or too unpleasant to bring forward and in part because he cannot draw on that unconscious field within himself wherein it is held the most significant facts of his own sexual history are concealed thus sadger vigorously puts forward this view and asserts that the autobiographies of inverts are worthless although his assertions are somewhat discounted by the fact that they accompany an autobiography written in the usual manner to which he attributes much value the objection to homosexual autobiographic statements dates from a period when the homosexual were very little known and it was supposed that their moral character generally was fairly represented by a small section among them which attracted more attention than the rest by reason of discreditable conduct 
but in reality as we now know there are all sorts of people with all varieties of moral character to be found among inverts just as among normal people sadger complains of the great insincerity of inverts in not acknowledging their inversion but as sadger himself admits we cannot be surprised at this so long as inversion is counted as a crime the most normal persons under similar conditions would be similarly insincere if the homosexual differ in any respect under this aspect from the heterosexual it is by exhibiting a more frequent tendency to be slightly neuropathic nervously sensitive and femininely emotional these tendencies while on the one hand are liable to induce a very easily detectable vanity may also lead to an unusual self-subordination to veracity on the whole it may be said in my own experience that the best histories written by the homosexual compare favourably for frankness intelligence and power of self-analysis with those written by the heterosexual the ancient allegation that inverts have written their own histories on the model or under the suggestion of those publishing craft ebbing's psychopathia sexualis can scarcely have much force now that the published histories are so extremely varied and numerous that they cannot possibly produce any uniform impression on the most sensitively receptive mind as a matter of fact there is no doubt that inverts have frequently been stimulated to set down the narrative of their own experiences through reading those written by others but the stimulation has as often as not lain in the fact that their own experiences have seemed different not that they have seemed identical the histories that they read only serve as models in the sense that they indicate the points on which information is desired i have often been able to verify this influence which would in any case seem to be fairly obvious psychoanalysis is in theory an ideal method of exploring many psychic conditions such as hysteria and obsessions which are obscure and largely concealed beneath the psychic surface in most homosexual cases the main facts are with the patient's good will and the investigator's tact not difficult to ascertain any difficulties which psychoanalysis may help to elucidate mainly concern the early history of the case in childhood and regarding these psychoanalysis may sometimes raise questions which it cannot definitely settle psychoanalysis reveals an immense mass of small details any of which may or may not possess significance and in determining which are significant to the individuality of the psychoanalyst cannot fail to come into play he will necessarily tend to arrange them according to a system if for instance he regards infantile incestuous emotions or early narcissism as an essential feature of the mechanism of homosexuality a conscientious investigator will not rest until he has discovered traces of them as he very probably will but the exact weight and significance of these traces may still be doubtful and even if considerable in one case may be inconsiderable in another freud who sets forth one type of homosexual mechanism admits that there may be others moreover it must be added that the psychoanalytic method by no means excludes unconscious deception by the subject as freud found and so was compelled to admit the patient's tendency to fantasy as adler has to fictions as a fundamental psychic tendency of the unconscious the force of these considerations is now beginning to be generally recognized thus moll rightly says that while the invert may occasionally embroider his story the expert can usually distinguish between the truth and the poetry though it is unnecessary to add that complete confidence on the patient's part is necessary neck again after quoting with approval the remark of one of the chief german authorities dr numa pretorius that a great number of inverts histories are at least as trustworthy as the attempts of psychoanalysts especially when they come from persons skilful in self-analysis adds that even freudian analysis gives no absolute guarantee for truth a healthy scepticism is justifiable but not an unhealthy scepticism hirschfeld also whose knowledge of such histories is unrivalled remarks that while we may now and then meet with a case of pseudologica fantastica in connection with psychic debility on the basis of a psychopathic constitution taken all in all any generalized assertion of the falsehood of inverts is an empty fiction and is merely a sign that the physicians who make it have not been able to win the trust of the men and women who consult them my own experience has fully convinced me of the truth of this statement 
i am assured that many of the inverts i have met not only possess a rare power of intellectual self-analysis stimulated by the constant and inevitable contrast between their own feelings and those of the world around them but an unsparing sincerity in that self-analysis not so very often attained by normal people the histories which follow have been obtained in various ways and are of varying degrees of value some are of persons whom i have known very well for very long periods and concerning whom i can speak very positively a few are from complete strangers whose good faith however i judge from internal evidence that i am able to accept two or three were written by persons who though educated in one case a journalist had never heard of inversion and imagined that their own homosexual feelings were absolutely unique in the world a fair number were written by persons whom i do not know myself but who are well known to others in whose judgment i feel confidence perhaps the largest number are concerned with individuals who wrote to me spontaneously in the first place and whom i have at intervals seen or heard from since in some cases during a very long period so that i have slowly been able to fill in their histories although the narratives as finally completed may have the air of being written down at a single sitting i have not admitted any narrative which i do not feel that i am entitled to regard as a substantially accurate statement of the facts although allowance must occasionally be made for the emotional colouring of these facts the invert sometimes cherishing too high an opinion and sometimes too low an opinion of his own personality history one both parents healthy father of unusually fine physique he is himself a manual worker and also of exceptionally fine physique he is however of nervous temperament he is mentally bright though not highly educated a keen sportsman and in general a good example of an all-round healthy englishman while very affectionate his sexual desires are not strongly developed on the physical side and seem never to have been so he sometimes masturbated about the age of puberty but never afterward he does not appear to have well-marked erotic dreams there used to be some attraction toward women though it was never strong at the age of twenty-six he was seduced by a woman and had connection with her once afterward he had reason to think she had played him false in various ways this induced the strongest antipathy not only to this woman but to all marriageable women a year after this episode homosexual feeling first became clear and defined he is now thirty-three and feels the same antipathy to women he hates even to speak of marriage there has only been one really strong attraction toward a man of the, about the same age but of different social class and somewhat a contrast to him both physically and mentally so far as the physical act is concerned this relationship is not definitely sexual but it is of the most intimate possible kind and the absence of the physical act is probably largely due to circumstances at the same time there is no conscious desire for the act for its own sake and the existing harmony and satisfaction are described as very complete there is no repulsion to the physical side and he regards the whole relationship as quite natural history two b o english aged thirty five missionary abroad a brother is more definitely inverted b o has never had any definitely homosexual relationships although he has always been devoted to boys nor has he had any relationships with women as regards women he says i feel i have not the patience to try and understand them they are petulant and changeable etc he objects to being called abnormal and thinks that people like himself are extremely common i have never wanted to kiss boys he writes nor to handle them in any way except to put my arm around them at their studies and at other similar times of course with really little boys it is different but boys and girls under fourteen seem to me much alike and i can love either equally well as to any sort of sexual connection between myself and one of my own sex i cannot think of it otherwise than with disgust i can imagine great pleasure in having connection with a woman but their natures do not attract me indeed my liking for my own sex seems to consist almost entirely in a preference for the masculine character and the feeling that as an object to look at the male body is really more beautiful than the female when any strong temptations to sexual passion come over me in my waking moments it is of women i think on the other hand i have to confess that after being with some lad i love for an hour or two i have sometimes felt my sexual organs roused 
but only once in my life have i experienced a strong desire to sleep in the same bed with a particular lad and even then no idea of doing anything entered my mind needless to say i did not sleep with him i never feel tempted by any girls here although i see so many with their bodies freely exposed and plenty of them have really pretty faces neither do i feel tempted to do anything improper with any of the boys although i frequently sit talking with one who has very little on but i find the constant sight of well-shaped bare limbs has a curious effect on the mind and comes before one's imagination as a picture at unlooked-for times but the most curious thing of all is this there are several lads here of whom i am very fond now when they are near me i think of them with only the purest and most tender feelings but sometimes at night when i am half asleep or when i am taking my midday siesta my imagination pictures one of these lads approaching a girl or actually lying with her and the strange thing is that i do not feel any desire myself to approach the girl but i feel i wish i were in her place and the lad was coming to me in my calm waking moments it disgusts and rather horrifies me to find myself apparently so unsexed yet such is the fact and the experience with only slight changes repeats itself over and over again it is not that i as a man wish even in imagination to act improperly with a boy but i feel i would like to be in the girl's place and the strange thing is that in all these dreams and imaginings i can always apparently enter into the feelings of the woman better than into those of the man sometimes i fancy for a moment that perhaps reincarnation is true and i was a woman in my last life sometimes i fancy that when i was in the womb i was formed as a girl and the sexual organs changed just at the last moment it is a curious problem don't think i worry about it only at long intervals do i think of it the thing has its bright side boys and men seem to have tender feelings toward me such as one expects them to have for members of the opposite sex and i get into all the closer contact with them in consequence history three f r english aged fifty belongs on both sides to healthy normal families of more than average ability father was thirty-five at birth and mother twenty-seven he is the second of four children there was a considerable interval between the births of the children which were spread over twenty-one years all are normal except f r two of them married and with families owing to the difference of age between the children f r who was three years younger than his elder brother and more than four years older than his sister the third child had no male companionship and was constantly alone with his mother being naturally imitative he remarks i think i acquired her tastes and interests and habits of thought however that may be i feel sure that my interests and amusements were more girlish than boyish by way of illustration i may mention that i have often been told by a friend of my mother's that on one occasion i was wanting a new hat and none being found of a size to fit me i congratulated myself that i should therefore be obliged to have a bonnet as regards my feminine tastes and instincts i have always been conscious of taking interests in questions of family relationships etiquette dress women's as much as or more than men's and other things of that kind which as a rule were treated with indifference or contempt in the house i take more notice than my sister does of the servants deficiencies and neglects and am much more orderly in my arrangements than she is there is nothing markedly feminine in the general appearance pubertal development took place at an early age long before fourteen with nocturnal emissions but without erotic dreams the testicles are well developed the penis perhaps rather below the average in size and the prepuce long and narrow erection occurs with much facility especially at night when young he knew nothing of masturbation but he began the habit about ten years ago and has practised it occasionally ever since although he likes the society of women to a certain extent he soon grows tired of it and has never had any desire to marry his sexual dreams never have any relation to women i am generally doing or saying something he remarks to some man whom i know when awake something which i admit i might wish to do or say if it were not quite out of the question on grounds of propriety and self-respect he has however never had any intimate relationships with men and much that he has heard of such relationship fills him with horror what i feel about myself is he writes 
that i have to a certain extent or in some respects a feminine mind in a male body or i might put it that i am a combination of an immoral in tendency rather than in act woman and a religious man from time to time i have felt strong affection for young men but i cannot flatter myself that my affection has been reciprocated at the present time there is a young fellow twenty-three years old who acts as my clerk and sits in my room he is extremely good-looking and of a type which is generally considered aristocratic but so far as i or he know he is quite of the lower middle class he has little to recommend him but a fine face and figure and there is nothing approaching to mental or social equality between us but i constantly feel the strongest desire to treat him as a man might a young girl he warmly loved various obvious considerations keep me from more than quasi-paternal caresses and i feel sure he would resent very strongly anything more this constant repression is trying beyond measure to the nerves and i often feel quite ill from that cause having no experiences of my own i am always anxious to learn anything i can of the sexual relations of other men and their organs but i have no curiosity whatever concerning the other sex my chief pleasure and source of gratification is found in the opportunities afforded by turkish and other baths wherever in fact there is the nude male to be found but i seldom find in these places any one who seems to have the same tendency as myself and certainly i have not met with more than two cases among the attendants who responded to my hinted desire to see everything under a shampooer particularly an unfamiliar one i occasionally experience an orgasm but less often now than when i was younger f r is very short-sighted his favourite colour is blue he is able to whistle his tastes are chiefly of a literary character and he has never had any liking for sports i have been generally considered ineffective in the use of my hands he writes and i am certainly not skilful all i have ever been able to do in that way is to net and do the simpler forms of needlework but it seems more natural to me to do or to try to do everything of that sort and play on the piano rather than to shoot or play games i may add that i am fonder of babies than many women and am generally considered to be surprisingly capable of holding them certainly i enjoy doing so as a youth i used to act in charades but i was too shy to do so unless i was dressed as a woman and veiled when i took a woman's part i felt less like acting than i have done in proporia persona a remark made by an uncle once rather annoyed me that it seemed more like nature than art but he was quite right end of part two of chapter three recording by john fricker Part three of Chapter three of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History four of Lowland Scotch parentage. Both sides of house healthy and without cerebral or nervous disease. Homosexual desires began at puberty. He practised onanism to a limited extent at school and up to the age of about twenty two his erotic dreams are exclusively about males while very friendly and intimate with women of all ages he is instantly repelled by any display of sexual affection on their side this has happened in varying degree in three or four cases with regard to marriage he remarks as there seems no immediate danger of the race dying out i leave marriage to those who like it his male ideal has varied to some extent it has for some years tended toward a healthy well-developed athletic or out-of-door working type intelligent and sympathetic but not specially intellectual at school his sexual relations were of the simplest type since then there have been none this he says is not due either to absence of desire or presence of morals to put it shortly there were never the time and the place and the loved one together in another view physical desire and the general affection have not always coexisted toward the same person and the former without the latter is comparatively transient 
while the latter stops the gratification of the former if it is felt that the gratification could in any way make the object of affection unhappy mentally or emotionally he is healthy and fairly well developed of sensitive emotional nature but self-controlled mentally he is receptive and aggressive by turns sometimes uncritical sometimes analytical his temper is equable and he is strongly affectionate very fond of music and other arts but not highly imaginative of sexual inversion in the abstract he says he has no views but he thus sums up his moral attitude i presume that if it is there it is there for use or abuse as men please i condemn gratification of bodily desire at the expense of others in whatever form it may take i condemn it no more in its inverted form than in the ordinary i believe that affection between persons of the same sex even when it includes the sexual passion and its indulgences may lead to results as splendid as human nature can ever attain to in short i place it on an absolute equality with love as ordinarily understood history five s w aged sixty four english musical journalist the communication which follows somewhat abbreviated was written before s w had heard or read anything about sexual inversion and when he still believed that his own case was absolutely unique i am the son of a clergyman and lived for the first thirteen years of my life in the country town where i was born then my father became the vicar of a country village where i lived until i went out into the world at the age of eighteen as during the whole of this time my father had a few pupils i was educated with them and never went to school i was born i fancy with sexual passions about as strong as can well be imagined and at the same time was very precocious in my entry into the stage of puberty semen began to form a little before my twelfth birthday hair soon followed and in a year i was in that respect the equal of an average boy of fifteen or sixteen i conversed freely with my companions on the relations of the sexes but unlike them had no personal feeling towards girls in time i became conscious that i was different as i then believed and believe now from all other men my sexual organs were quite perfect but in the frame of a man i had the sexual mind of a female i distinctly disclaim the faintest inclination to perform unnatural acts the idea of committing sodomy would be most disgusting to come to my actual condition of mind while totally indifferent to the person of woman i always enjoyed their friendship and companionship and many of my best friends have been ladies i had a burning desire to have carnal intercourse with a male and had the capacity for falling in love as it is called to the utmost extent in imagination i possessed the female organ and felt toward men exactly as an amorous female would at the time when i became fully conscious of my condition i attached little importance to it i had not a notion of its terrible import nor of the future misery it would entail all that i had to learn by bitter experience i did once think of forcing myself to have a connection with a prostitute in order to see whether the actual sensual enjoyment might bring a change and so have the power to marry but when it came to thinking over ways and means my repugnance to the act became so strong that it was quite out of the question in the case of any male to whom i became attached i wanted to feel ourselves together skin to skin and to be privileged to take such liberties as an amorous female would take if that were all permitted i sought no purely sensual gratification of any kind my love was far too genuine for that during the rather more than half a century which has elapsed since my twelfth birthday i have been genuinely in love about thirteen times i despair attempting to give an idea of the depth and reality of my feelings i have alluded to my precocity i was in love when twelve years old the object being a man of twenty-four a well-known analytical chemist he came to my father's house very frequently and my heart beat almost at the mention of his name the next serious time i was about fifteen it was a farmer's son about two years older i don't think that i was ever alone with him and really only knew him as a member of his family yet for a time he was my chief interest in life when twenty-one i had a chum a youth of seventeen who entertained for me at any rate a brotherly affection 
we were under the same roof and early one summer morning he got out of bed and came direct to my room to talk about some matter or other in order to talk more comfortably he got into bed with me and we lay there just as two schoolgirls might have done this proximity was more than i could stand and my heart began to beat so that it was impossible that he should not notice it as of course he could not have the slightest notion of the reason he said in all innocence why how your heart beats i can hear it quite plainly so far my details are purely innocent up to eighteen familiarities passed at intervals between me and the son of the village doctor youth about two years older than myself and precociously immoral i did not really care for him much but he was my chief companion then i became a school assistant and for about six years managed to control myself only alas to fall again another resolution i kept for eight years one long fight with my nature again i sinned in three instances extending over three or four years i now come to a very painful and eventful episode in my unhappy life which i would gladly pass over were it possible it was a case in middle life of sin discovery and great folly in addition before going into detail so far as may be necessary i cannot help asking you to consider calmly and dispassionately my exact condition compared with that of my fellow creatures as a whole in my struggles to resist in the past i have at times felt as if wrestling in the folds of a python i again sinned then with a youth and his friend oddly enough discovery followed through a man who was actuated by a feeling of revenge for a strictly right act on my part the lads refused to state more than the truth and this did not satisfy the man and a third lad was introduced who was prepared to say anything this was not all some twelve or fifteen more boys made similar accusations the general belief in consequence was that i had committed nameless crimes in all directions ad lib if you were to ask me for an explanation of the action of all these boys beyond the third who of course had some special inducements i can offer none they may have thought that the original trio were regarded rather in the light of heroes why should they not be heroes too i might well feel crushed under such a load of accusations but that does not excuse the incredible folly of my conduct i denied alike the modicum of truth and the mass of lying and went off to america however as time passed on and my mind got into a proper state i felt that the truth must be told some time or other i accordingly wrote from america to the proper quarter a full confession of my sin with regard to the two youths who had told merely the truth at the same time pointing out the falsehood of all the rest of the accusations i remained in america six years and actually made money so that i could return to england with a small capital i was also under a promise to my three sisters all older than myself that i would return in their lifetime my programme was to purchase a small light business in london and quietly earn my living at the same time making my presence known to no one i did buy a such a business got swindled in the most clever way and lost every farthing i possessed in the world i had to make my plight known to old friends who all either gave or lent me money still my position was a very precarious one i tried an insurance agency one of the last resorts of the educated destitute but soon found out that i was unfitted for work in which impudence is a prime factor then an extraordinary stroke of good fortune took place almost simultaneously i began to get a few music pupils and literary work in connection with a good musical journal making my presence known to all friends involved the same information to those who were not friends my identity as a journalist became known and as time passed by it seemed to me as if half the world had heard of my alleged iniquities people who have never set eyes on me seem to regard me in the light of a monster of iniquity who ought not to be suffered to exist all these outsiders believe that i have committed nameless offences times innumerable and lift up their hands in speechless horror at the audacity of a man who so situated dares to appear openly in public under his own name and look people in the face they have not even the brains to see that this very fearlessness proves the fictitious character of their beliefs next they believe that if only they could get my dismissal from my journalistic post i should be brought to starvation point this up to a year ago was true then 
an old relative died and left me some property which i sold to invest in an annuity and thus have just enough to live on quietly apart from what i may earn under such strange conditions it might be asked whether life was not unendurable and frankly speaking i cannot say that i find it so i have in london a few bachelor friends who go with me to theatres etc in the suburbs i have about half a dozen family friends here i meet with pleasant society and a hearty welcome i am passionately fond of music have an excellent piano and can hear the best concerts in europe i go to all good plays i am a good chess player lastly i am an omnivorous reader you will allow that my resources for passing the time are not limited of course i am sorry that i sinned and wish that i had not done so but i disclaim any feeling of shame s w was the youngest of four children and the only boy his father was forty at his birth his mother thirty-three the father was an intellectual man of weak character the mother a woman of violent and eccentric temper with he believes strong sexual passions s w knows of nothing in the family to account for his own abnormal condition he is short five feet five inches but well built with strong chest and a powerful voice his arms are weak and flabby feminine he thinks but the legs muscular as a boy of fourteen he could walk forty miles with ease and he played football till near the age of forty-five he is considered manly in character and tastes but is easily moved to tears under strong excitement there is no information as to the type of man to whom he is attracted i may observe however that the analytical chemist who first evoked s w s admiration was well known to me some thirty years later as he was my own teacher in chemistry at that time he was an elderly man of attractive appearance and character sympathetic and winning in manner to an almost feminine extent s w has never felt the slightest sexual attraction toward the opposite sex the first indications of inverted feeling were at the age of six or seven watching his father's pupils boys of thirteen or fourteen from the windows he speculated on what their organs of generation were like in connection with a girl he writes i should no more have thought of such a thing than in the case of a block of marble about this time indeed he at times slept with a sister of ten who induced him to go through the form of sexual connection saying that it felt so funny but he merely did this to please her and without the slightest interest or feeling on his own part this attitude became more marked with increased knowledge until he fell ardently in love at the age of twelve throughout life he has practised masturbation to a certain extent and is prepared to defend the practice in his own case his erotic dreams have been of only the vaguest and most shadowy character he is able to whistle he takes a warm interest in politics and in philanthropic work but his chief love is for music and he has published many musical compositions on the whole and notwithstanding the persecution he has endured he does not regard his life as unhappy at the same time he is keenly conscious of the atmosphere of pariahdom which surrounds inverts and in his own case this has never been alleviated by any sense of companionship in misery the facility with which some inverts are said to recognize others of their own kind is quite incomprehensible to him he has never to his knowledge met one history six e s physician aged fifty i have some reason he writes for believing that some of my relatives on the paternal side were not normal in their sexual life but i am sure that no such suspicion was entertained by their friends or associates they were very reticent people a great proportion of my near relatives have remained unmarried or deferred marriage until later in life none of them have been good businessmen all seem to have been more deeply concerned in other things than in making or in keeping money they have mostly taken little or no share in public life and not cared much for society yet they have been folk of more than average ability with intellectual and aesthetic interests we are prone to enthusiasms but lack perseverance we are discursive and superficial perhaps but none would call us stupid we are perhaps abnormally self-centred and self-conscious never cruel or vicious our powers of self-control are considerable we are conventional people only because we are lazy and intensely dislike any open self-assertion yet we are nervous rather than phlegmatic 
all that is on the father's side my maternal ancestors have been concerned with farming and the sea and have also had a similar lack of business capacity but with less mental adaptiveness and alertness with more steadiness of purpose however always doers rather than dreamers among them i remember one cousin who was probably abnormal although he died when i was too young to notice much again they were all rather reserved people but more genial with strangers more socially inclined and with less self-control i was an only child and a spoilt one i was always quick at school fond of learning and finding my lessons no trouble serious study i disliked but for school purposes i did not find it necessary and had no difficulty in carrying all before me i was never fond of games although very fond of being out of doors and of walking few of my relatives have been at all keen on sport i made no close friendships at school and was never very popular with my schoolfellows who however tolerated my odd ways better than might have been expected i was easily brought to appreciate good literature but i never had much power of expression or of strenuous thought i was extremely susceptible and impressible moved by beauty of any kind but never at all ambitious or in any way creative i was easily stimulated to work and then loved to work but unless the stimulus were maintained the natural indolence of my disposition asserted itself and i wasted my powers in dreams and trifles my memory was very quick and retentive in the main but curiously capricious i always lacked initiative and decision at college my successes were continued i gained medals and prizes passed my examinations easily and graduated with first-class honours in my professional life work i have been successful rather beyond the average i love it with all my heart i cannot speak with any confidence about the first stirrings of my sexual instincts but i think i can assert that they have at no time led me to any desire for the opposite sex it is true that my earliest recollection of the kind is concerned with intimacies with a girl playfellow but as we had at the time reached only the mature age of seven at the most i fancy that our mutual exhibitions for there was nothing more simply satisfied our natural curiosity certainly these memories are in my mind in no way set apart from the recollections of other kinds of play next to that i remember the usual schoolboy talk about things hidden and forbidden but up till i was twelve or so this was simply dirty talk concerned more with renal and intestinal functions than with any sexual feelings or understanding one boy was known to us all and of my not inconsiderable circle of early friends all grew up to be normal people who married and had children in due course for the unusual size of his parts and for the freedom with which he invited and satisfied the curiosity of his friends he must have been precocious for he could not have been more than twelve and i remember to have heard that he had a thick growth of pubic hair even then although i know that my curiosity to put it at that only was active i never allowed myself to have any dealings with him and i think i should have discouraged them had they been suggested to me that is the odd thing about my life the things i longed intensely to do i would not let myself do not from any religious or moral scruple but from some inexplicable fastidiousness or scrupulosity which is yet as active as ever although i am sure that it would not be able to hold its own could these favourable conditions be repeated but would be overcome by the imperious and fully grown desires which by long repression or by unsatisfactory diversion have grown to be so strong indeed given the opportunity and the assurance that no first seduction or corruption of any one was in question they would prove quite irrepressible certainly long before puberty which was early with me i remember being greatly attracted to certain boys and wishing to have an opportunity of sleeping with them had i been able to do so i am sure i should have been impelled to get into as close contact with their naked body as possible and i do not think i should then have craved for anything more i knew some boys perhaps a little older who even then had relations which were certainly not innocent with a girl who was a year or two older than any of us she once kissed me to my intense shame but i felt that these relations would have been unspeakably disgusting and i took no particular interest in hearing about them i remember being fondled and caressed by a very good-looking boy of sixteen when i was three or four years younger and had sustained some hurt at play and i am still able to recall the thrill of delight that i experienced at his touch 
Nothing took place that all the world might not have seen, but I remember being taken between his knees as he sat, and his arms being put around my neck, and the warm, soft pressure of his thighs had an unspeakable effect on me. About this time, too, an older boy, perhaps about eighteen, used to get hold of smaller boys when on country walks to throw them down and then look at and toy with their genitals. He was himself a handsome boy, and I was greatly excited when told about this by boys who had experienced it and wished greatly to have it done to me. It never was, and if it had been attempted, I know I should have resisted with all my strength, although my desires would have set me aflame. This boy died before he was twenty, with a psoas abscess, and I remember crying myself to sleep the night I learned of his death. Another boy, about three years older than myself, who had very silky hair I used to be attracted by, and I was always trying to stroke his hair, but he always objected. I must have been about twelve when I was first taught to masturbate, by a cousin who was slightly older. At first I thought it silly, but I used to watch him at it and practised it myself from time to time, until I became old enough to experience the proper sensation. Then I have reason to think I gave myself up to it rather freely, but it was generally done in solitude, although it was long before I realised that there was anything wrong about it, or that it might prove hurtful. Looking back now, I feel perfectly certain that my instincts were wholly homosexual from the very first. This cousin, who possessed notable intellectual and artistic gifts, married, but I feel sure his liking for his own sex was not normal. With another cousin, almost years my junior, I was always on terms of the most affectionate intimacy. My holidays at his parents' house were my greatest delight. We were always together by night or day. We slept in the same bed, literally in each other's arms. To me it afforded the keenest sexual pleasure to press close to his naked body. We used mutually to handle and caress our parts, but without any attempt at mutual masturbation, although at that period I regularly practised it on myself. I asked him once about it, but he had not been taught but by others, and to my great pride and satisfaction I can say that I never either did it to him or asked him to do it to me. This I mention as an instance of my restraint in acts, although my thoughts and desires knew no such curb. I remember also an elder brother of his, perhaps three or four years my senior, once showing me, then about twelve I suppose, his semi-erect penis. He would not allow me to touch it, but showed me how to draw back the foreskin so as to uncover the glands. His penis was large, and the incident was not forgotten. We had no other relation, and I know that both he and my own friend grew up to be quite normal men. I think I must have been about seventeen when I got frightened about the occurrence of nocturnal emissions, which I believed were the evil result of masturbation, and for two or three years I continued in considerable mental distress until, when in my second or third year at college, I summoned up courage enough to consult our good old family doctor, who reassured me, but made, I now think, too light of my confidences, so that I relapsed the more readily, although much later on, into old habits. From our windows at home we looked over a bit of common or down to the beach, and I used to keep watch on warm summer afternoons over boys who might be bathing to observe them through our telescope. All this I kept strictly secret, and I was never surprised. I might just as well, and without arousing the slightest suspicion of my motive, have walked down to the beach and seen them and chatted with them, but this I could not have brought myself to do. It gave me considerable sexual satisfaction when I was able to see them bathing without pants. I also used to watch them at play on the common, and felt rewarded when I saw, as I not infrequently did, sexual familiarities taking place. These violently excited me, and sometimes brought on orgasm, always erection with pleasure. Indeed, it was an experience of this kind that made me return to masturbation after I had given it up for a while. I remember one day seeing two lads of about sixteen lying on the grass in the sunshine. All at once the bigger lad put out his hand and tried to open his companion's trousers. He resisted with all his might, and a long struggle ensued, ending in the smaller lad having his penis exposed and manipulated by the other. Even at this day the recollection of this excites me. Both lads grew up to be normal men. Twice only have I been approached by grown-up people. When I was about thirteen I used to meet often, when going to school by train, an old gentleman who courted me, as it were, used often to talk to me and ask me to come to see his well-known scientific collections, but I always had a vague distrust of him and never went. One day in the summer during a spare hour I met him in an empty room in the museum, where there were usually very few visitors at that time of day, and where large showcases gave concealment. 
he came up to me and told me he had been away in the country and that when making his way home through hedges and thorny bushes some of the thorns got stuck amongst his clothes and were still giving him uneasiness i would be grateful he said if you would put your hand down and try if you can feel any thorns sticking in my under flannels and pull them out he then unbuttoned his braces on one side undid his trousers and made me thrust my hand over his groin and lower abdomen i avoided touching his genitals but he pushed my hand down in that direction until burning with shame i made my escape and ran off not stopping until i was safe in school i scarcely understood it but never spoke of it and avoided him ever afterward i learned later on that he was a well-off bachelor who took a great interest in working lads and young men and did much to help them on in life and keep them so it was said from falling into bad company he died at great age and left most of his fortune to an institution for lads as well as large legacies to youths in whom he had been interested the other time was on top of a tram-car when a grown-up man who was near pressed as close to me as he could began to talk praised my dark eyes then put his hand on my thigh under my loose cloak and felt upward toward my parts at the same time he took hold of my hand caressed it and put it over his parts it was in the dusk this excited me and if we had not been at our destination i think i would gladly have permitted further familiarities he tried to ask me where i lived but there was no time to answer and the female relative who was with me on another seat would no doubt have prevented this from having any further sequel on more than one occasion i have experienced the sexual orgasm as the result of mental anxiety the first time this occurred was when i was hurrying to avoid being late for school another time when i was about twenty-four and was extremely anxious to fill an appointment for which i was late so copious was the omission that i had to go home and change as a medical student the first reference bearing definitely on the subject of sexual inversion was made in the class of medical jurisprudence where certain sexual crimes were alluded to very summarily and inadequately but nothing was said of the existence of sexual inversion as the normal condition of certain unhappy people nor was any distinction drawn between the various non-normal acts which were all classed together as manifestations of the criminal depravity of ordinary or insane people to a student beginning to be acutely conscious that his sexual nature differed profoundly from that of his fellows nothing could be more perplexing and disturbing and it shut me up more completely in my reserve than ever i felt that this teaching must be based on some radical error or prejudice or misapprehension for i knew from my own very clear remembrance of my own development that my peculiarity was not acquired but inborn my great misfortune undoubtedly but not my fault it was still more unfortunate that in the course of the lectures on clinical medicine there was not the slightest allusion to the subject all sorts of rare diseases some of which i have not yet met with in the course of twenty-one years of a busy practice were fully discussed but we were left entirely ignorant of a subject so vitally important to me personally and as it seems to me to the profession to which i aspired there might have been an incidental reference to masturbation although i do not remember it but its real significance received no attention and what we students knew of it was the result of our reading or of our personal experiences in the class of mental disease there was naturally more detailed and systematic reference to facts in the sexual life and to sexual inversion as a rare pathological condition but still there was not a comforting word to reassure me growing ever more hopelessly ashamed of what it seemed was a criminal or a gravely morbid nature among all my fellow students i knew of no one constituted like myself but my natural reserve increased of course by my consciousness of what i saw would be thought to be a criminal tendency did not urge me to exchange of confidences or to the formation of close friendships after graduation i became a resident medical officer in the hospital and private assistant to one of the professors a physician and teacher of worldwide reputation with him i associated on the most cordial and affectionate terms and often in the course of conversation i tried to bring him to discuss the subject but without success it was obviously unpleasant and uninteresting to him enough was said however to enable me to realize that he held the current ideas on the subject and i would not for worlds have allowed him to guess that i myself came under the despised and tainted category i have seldom heard sexual inversion discussed among my professional friends they speak of it with disgust or amusement i have never met a professional man who would consider it dispassionately or scientifically for them it was a subject entirely belonging to psychological medicine 
i have had no admitted cases of it among my patients but i have often instinctively felt that some who consulted me about other matters would have taken me into their confidence about that but for their fear of being cruelly misunderstood as to my moral attitude i fear to speak grossness disgusts me but i am not sure that i should be able to resist temptation placed in my way but i am absolutely sure that i should never under any circumstances tempt others to any disgraceful act if i ever committed any sexual act with one of my own sex whom i loved i could not look at it or approach it in any other than a sacramental way this sounds blasphemous and shocking but i cannot otherwise express my meaning as regards the marriage of inverts my own feeling is that for a congenital invert no matter how fully the situation be explained beforehand it is a step fraught with too great possibilities of tragedy and of the deepest unhappiness to be advised at all my view is that for the invert far more than for the ordinary person there is no escape from the supreme necessity of self-control in any relationship he may form if that be attained then the ideal is a relationship with another man of similar temperament not a platonic one necessarily by means of which the highest happiness of both may be reached but this can occur very seldom to poetry and the fine arts i am very susceptible and i have given a great deal of time to this study i am devoted heart and soul to music which is more and more to me every year i live trivial or light music i cannot endure but of beethoven bach handel schumann schubert brahms tchaikovsky and wagner i should never hear enough here too my sympathies are very catholic and i delight in mcdowell debussy richard strauss and hugo wolf end of part three of chapter three recording by john fricker Part four of chapter three of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two, by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History seven. My parentage is very sound and healthy. Both my parents, who belong to the professional middle class, have good general health, nor can I trace any marked abnormal or diseased tendency of mind or body in any records of the family though of a strongly nervous temperament myself and sensitive my health is good i am not aware of any tendency to physical disease in early manhood however owing i believe to the great emotional tension under which i lived my nervous system was a good deal shattered and exhausted mentally and morally my nature is pretty well balanced and i have never had any serious perturbations in these departments at the age of eight or nine and long before distinct sexual feelings declared themselves i felt a friendly attraction toward my own sex and this developed after the age of puberty into a passionate sense of love which however never found any expression for itself till i was fully twenty years of age i was a day boarder at school and heard little of school talk on sex subjects was very reserved and modest besides no elder person or parent ever spoke to me on such matters and the passion for my own sex developed gradually utterly uninfluenced from the outside i never even during all this period and till a good deal later learned the practice of masturbation my own sexual nature was a mystery to me i found myself cut off from the understanding of others felt myself an outcast and with a highly loving and clinging temperament was intensely miserable i thought about my male friends sometimes boys of my own age sometimes elder boys and once even a master during the day and dreamed about them at night but was too convinced that i was a hopeless monstrosity ever to make any effectual advances later on it was much the same but gradually though slowly i came to find that there were others like myself i made a few special friends and at last it came to me occasionally to sleep with them and to satisfy my imperious need by mutual embraces and emissions before this happened however i was once or twice on the brink of despair and madness with repressed passion and torment meanwhile from the first my feeling physically toward the female sex was one of indifference and later on with the more special development of sex desires one of positive repulsion 
though having several female friends whose society i like and to whom i am sincerely attached the thought of marriage or cohabitation with any such has always been odious to me as a boy i was attracted in general by boys rather older than myself after leaving school i still fell in love in a romantic vein with comrades of my own standing now at the age of thirty-seven my ideal of love is a powerful strongly built man of my own age or rather younger preferably of the working class though having solid sense and character he need not be specially intellectual if endowed in the latter way he must not be too glib or refined anything effeminate in a man or anything of the cheap intellectual style repels me very decisively i have never had to do with actual pederasty so called my chief desire in love is bodily nearness or contact as to sleep naked with a naked friend the specially sexual though urgent enough seems a secondary matter pederasty either active or passive might seem in place to me with one i loved very devotedly and who also loved me to that degree but i think not otherwise i am an artist by temperament and choice fond of all beautiful things especially the male human form of active slight muscular build and sympathetic but somewhat indecisive character though possessing self-control i cannot regard my sexual feelings as unnatural or abnormal since they have disclosed themselves so perfectly naturally and spontaneously within me all that i have read in books or heard spoken about the ordinary sexual love its intensity and passion lifelong devotion love at first sight etc seems to me to be easily matched by my own experiences in the homosexual form and with regard to the morality of this complex subject my feeling is that it is the same as should prevail in love between man and woman namely that no bodily satisfaction should be sought at the cost of another person's distress or degradation i am sure that this kind of love is notwithstanding the physical difficulties that attend it as deeply stirring and ennobling as the other kind if not more so and i think that for a perfect relationship the actual sex gratifications whatever they may be probably hold a less important place in this love than in the other history eight m n aged thirty my grandfather might be said to be of abnormal temperament for though of very humble origin he organized and carried out an extremely arduous mission work and became an accomplished linguist translating the bible into an eastern tongue and compiling the first dictionary of that language he died practically of overwork at the age of forty-five he was twice married my father being his third son by the second wife i believe that two if not more of the family numbering seven in all were inverted and the only one of them to marry was my father my grandmother was the last representative of an old and very wild irish family she died at an advanced age of paralysis my father was thirty-six and my mother twenty-one at the time of their marriage i was born three years after and was their only child the marriage proved a most unhappy one they being utterly unsuited to each other in every way my father's health during the first years of his marriage was very delicate and i have reason to believe that it had been undermined in certain ways by his life abroad i understand i was born with slight gonorrheal affection and as a child my health was very indifferent this latter may have been brought about by the peculiarly unhappy and unnatural life i led i had no companions of my own age and did not even attend any school until after my mother's death my father superintended my education up to that time and i had free access to a large and very varied library and a great deal of solitary leisure to enjoy it in there were a number of medical and scientific books in it which were my principal favourites and i remember deciding at a very early age to be a doctor when about five years old i recollect having a sexual dream connected with a railway porter it afforded me great pleasure to recall this dream and about that time i discovered a method of self-gratification there is not much teaching required in these matters i cannot say that the dream i have mentioned constituted absolutely the first intimation of inverted feeling but rather that it crystallized vague ideas which i might have already had on the subject 
I can recollect that when about between three and four years of age, a young fellow of about twenty came to our house several times as a visitor. He was fond of children, I suppose, and I generally sat on his knee and was kissed by him. This was a source of great pleasure to me, but I cannot remember if it was accompanied by erection. I can only recall that his attention and caresses made a greater impression upon me than those of women. When about that age, too, I was often aroused when sleeping with my mother, and told not to lie on my face. I remember that erection was always present on these occasions. The dream was the first of many of its kind, and in my case they have never been accompanied by a mission. They have always been of an inverted character, though I have occasionally had dreams about women. These latter, however, have usually partaken somewhat of the nature of a nightmare. Up to the age of fourteen I felt much perplexed and depressed by my views on sexual desire, and was convinced that they were peculiar to myself. This, combined with the solitary condition of my life, and about four years' continued ill-treatment prior to my mother's death, she had given way to drink for that period, had a very injurious effect on my health, mental and bodily. Looking back from my present point of view, I can understand and forgive many things which have appeared monstrous and unjust to me as a child. My mother's life must have been a very unhappy one, and she was bitterly disappointed in many ways, very likely in me as well. My unfortunate misunderstood temperament led me to be shy and secretive, and I was often ailing, and my training was not calculated to improve matters. At last, however, change and freedom came, and I was sent to a boarding school. Here, of course, I soon met with attachments and gratifications with other boys. I arrived at puberty, and my health improved under happier surroundings. I was not long in discovering that my companions viewed the pleasures that meant so much to me from an entirely different standpoint. Their gratifications were usually accompanied by conversation about and a general direction of thought toward females. When I had turned fifteen, owing to monetary difficulties, I was obliged to leave school, and was soon not only thrown on my own resources, but accountable to no one but myself for my conduct. Of course, my next discovery was that my case, so far from being peculiar, was a most common one, and I was quickly initiated into all the mysteries of inversion with its Freemasonry and argot. Altogether, my experience of inverts has been a pretty wide and varied one, and I have always endeavoured to classify and compare cases which have come under my notice with a view to arriving at some sort of conclusion or explanation. I suppose it is due to female versatility or impressibility that it is possible for me to experience mentally the emotions attributable to either sex, according to the age and temperament of my companion. For instance, with one older than myself possessing well-marked male characteristics, I am able to feel all that surrender and dependence which is so essentially feminine. On the other hand, if with a youth of feminine type and behaviour I can realise, with an equal amount of pleasure, the tender yet dominant attitude of the male. I experience no particular horror of women sexually. I should imagine that my feeling toward them resembles very much what normal people feel with regard to others of their own sex. M. N. remarks that he cannot whistle and that his favourite colour is green. In this case, the subject easily found a moral modus vivendi with his inverted instinct, and he takes its gratification for granted. In the following case, which I believe is typical of a large group, the subject has never yielded to his inverted impulses, and, except so far as masturbation is concerned, has preserved strict chastity. History 9. R. S., aged 31. American of French descent. Upon the question of heredity, I may say that I belong to a reasonably healthy, prolific, and long-lived family. On my father's side, however, there is a tendency toward pulmonary troubles. He himself died of pneumonia, and two of his brothers and a nephew of consumption. Neither of my parents were morbid or eccentric. Except for a certain shyness with strangers, my father was a very masculine man. My mother is somewhat nervous, but is not imaginative, nor at all demonstrative in her affections. I think that my own imaginative and artistic temperament must come from my father's side. Perhaps my French ancestry has something to do with it. 
with the exception of my maternal grandfather all my progenitors have been of french descent my mother's father was english i possess a mercurial temperament and a strong sense of the ludicrous though my physique is slight my health has always been excellent of late years especially i have been greatly given to introspection and self-scrutiny but have never had any hallucinations mental delusions nor hysterics and am not at all superstitious spiritualistic manifestations hypnotic dabblings and the other psychical fads of the day have little or no attraction for me in fact i have always been sceptical of them and they rather bore me at school i was an indolent dreamy boy shirking study but otherwise fairly docile to my teachers from earliest childhood i have indulged in omnivorous taste for reading my particular likings being for travels aesthetics metaphysical and theological subjects and more recently for poetry and certain forms of mysticism i never cared much for history or for scientific subjects from the beginning too i showed a strong artistic bent and possessed an overpowering love for all things beautiful as a child i was passionately fond of flowers loved to be in the woods and alone and wanted to become an artist my parents opposed the latter wish and i gave way before their opposition in me the homosexual nature is singularly complete and is undoubtedly congenital the most intense delight of my childhood even when a tiny boy in a nurse's charge was to watch acrobats and riders at the circus this was not so much for the skilful feats as on account of the beauty of their persons even then i cared chiefly for the more lithe and graceful fellows people told me that circus actors were wicked and would steal little boys and so i came to look upon my favorites as half devil and half angel when i was older and could go about alone i would often hang around the tents of travelling shows in hope of catching a glimpse of the actors i longed to see them naked without their tights and used to lie awake at night thinking of them and longing to be loved and embraced by them a certain bareback rider a sort of jockey used especially to please me on account of his handsome legs which were clothed in fleshlings up to his waist leaving his beautiful loins uncovered by a breech cloud there was nothing consciously sensual about these reveries because at the time i had no sensual feelings or knowledge curiously enough the women actors repelled me then as they do to this day quite as strongly as i was attracted by the men i used also to take great pleasure in watching men and boys in swimming but my opportunities for seeing them thus were extremely rare i never dared let my comrades know how i felt about these matters but the sight of a well-formed naked youth or a man would fill me and does now with mingled feelings of bashfulness anguish and delight i used to tell myself endless stories of a visionary castle inhabited by beautiful boys one of whom was especially my dear chum it was always the prince in fairy tales who held my interest or affection i was constantly falling in love with handsome boys whom i never knew nor did i ever try to mix in their company for i was abashed before them and had no liking nor aptitude for boyish games sometimes i played with girls because they were more quiet and gentler but i cared for them little or not at all as is usually the case my parents neglected to impart to me any sexual knowledge and such as i possessed was gathered furtively from tainted sources bad boys talk at school and elsewhere my elders let me know in a vague way that talk of the kind was wicked and natural timidity and a wish to be good kept me from learning much about sexual matters as i never went to boarding school i was spared perhaps many of the degrading initiations administered by knowing boys at such institutions in spite of what has been said above i do not believe that i was sexually very precocious and even now i feel that more pleasure would ensue from merely contemplating than from personal contact with the object of my amorous attentions as i grew older there came of course an undefined physical longing but it was the beauty of those i admired which mainly appealed to me at the time of puberty i spontaneously acquired the habit of masturbation once while bathing i found that a pleasant feeling came while touching the sexual organs it was not long before i was confirmed in the habit at first i practised it but seldom but afterward much more frequently say once a week 
though at times months have elapsed without any indulgences on my part i have only had erotic dreams three or four times in my life the masturbation habit i regard as morally reprehensible and have made many resolutions to break it but without avail it affords me only the most momentary satisfaction and is always followed by remorseful scruples i have never in my life had any sexual feeling for a woman nor any sexual connection with any woman whatsoever the very thought of such a thing is excessively repugnant and disgusting to me this is true apart from any moral considerations and i do not think i could bring myself to it i am not attracted by young women in any way even their physical beauty has little or no charm for me and i often wonder how men can be so affected by it on the other hand i am not a woman hater and have several strong friends of the opposite sex they are however women older than myself and our friendship is based solely on certain intellectual or aesthetic tastes we have in common i have had practically no physical relations with men at any rate none specifically sexual once when about nineteen or twenty-one i started to embrace a beautifully formed youth with whom i was sleeping but timidity and scruples got the better of my feelings and as my bedfellow was not amorously inclined toward me nothing came of it a few years after this i became strongly attached to a friend whom i had already known for several years circumstances threw us very much together during one summer it was now that i felt for the first time the full shock of love he returned my affection but both of us were shy of showing our feelings or speaking of them often when walking together after nightfall we would put our arms about each other sometimes too when sleeping together we would lie in close contact and my friend once suggested that i put my legs against his he frequently begged me to spend the night with him but i began to fear my feelings and slept with him but seldom we neither of us had any definite ideas about homosexual relations and apart from what i have related above we had no further contact with each other a few months after our amorous feelings had developed my friend died his death caused me great distress and my naturally religious temperament began to manifest itself quite strongly at this time too i first read some writings of mr addington simmons and certain allusions in his work coupled with my recent experience soon stirred me to a full consciousness of my inverted nature about eight months after my friend's death i happened to meet in a strange town a youth of about my own age who exerted upon me a strong and instant attraction he possessed a refined handsome face was gracefully built and though he was rather undemonstrative we soon became fast friends we were together only for a few days when i was obliged to leave from my home and the parting caused me great unhappiness and depression a few months after we spent a vacation together one day during our trip we went swimming and undressed in the same bathhouse when i saw my friend naked for the first time he seemed to me so beautiful that i longed to throw my arms about him and cover him with kisses i kept my feelings hidden however hardly daring to look at him for fear of being unable to restrain my desires several times afterward in his room i saw him stripped with the same effect upon my emotions until i had seen him naked my feelings for him were not of a physical character but afterward i longed for actual contact but only by embraces and kisses though he was fond of me he had absolutely no amorous longings for me and being a simple pure-minded fellow would have loathed me for mine and my inverted nature i was careful never to let him discover it and i was made very unhappy when he confided that he was in love with a young girl whom he wished to marry this episode took place several years ago and though we are still friends my emotional feelings for him have cooled considerably i have always been very shy of showing any affectionate tendencies most of my acquaintances and close friends even think me curiously cold and often wonder why i have never fallen in love or married for obvious reasons i have never been able to tell them three or four years ago a little book by coventry patmore fell into my hands and from its perusal resulted a strange blending of my religious and erotic notions the desire to love and be loved is hard to drown and when i realized that homosexually it was neither lawful nor possible for me to love in this world i began to project my longings into the next by birth i am a roman catholic and in spite of a somewhat sceptical temper managed to remain one by conviction 
from the doctrines of the trinity incarnation and eucharist i have drawn conclusions which would fill the minds of the average pietist with holy horror nevertheless i believe that granting the premises these conclusions are both logically and theologically defensible the divinity of my fancied paradise resembles in no way the vapid conceptions of fra angelico or the quartier saint sulpice his physical aspect at least would be better represented by some praxitelian demigod or flandrin's naked brooding boy while these imaginings have caused me considerable moral disquietude they do not seem wholly reprehensible because i feel that the chief happiness i would derive by their realization would be mainly from the contemplation of the loved one rather than from closer joys i possess only a slight knowledge of the history and particulars of erotic mysticism but it is likely that my notions are neither new nor peculiar and many utterances of the few mystical writers with whose works i am acquainted seem substantially in accord with my own longings and conclusions in endeavouring to find for them some sanction of valid authority i have always sought corroboration from members of my own sex hence am less likely to have fashioned my views after those of hypersensitive or hysterical women you will rightly infer that it is difficult for me to say exactly how i regard morally the homosexual tendency of this much however i am certain that even if it were possible i would not exchange my inverted nature for a normal one i suspect that the sexual emotions and even inverted ones have a more subtle significance than is generally attributed to them but modern moralists either fight shy of transcendental interpretations or see none and i am ignorant and unable to solve the mystery these feelings seem to imply patmore speaks boldly enough in his way and lacroidere has hinted at things but in a very guarded manner i have neither the ability nor opportunity to study what the mystics of the middle ages have to say along these lines and besides the medieval way of looking at things is not congenial to me the chief characteristic of my tendency is an overpowering admiration for male beauty and in this i am more akin to the greeks i have absolutely no words to tell you how powerfully such beauty affects me moral and intellectual worth is i know of greater value but physical beauty i see more clearly and it appears to me the most vivid if not the most perfect manifestation of the divine a little incident may perhaps reveal to you my feelings more completely not long ago i happened to see an unusually well-formed young fellow enter a house of assignation with a common woman of the street the sight filled me with the keenest anguish and the thought that his beauty would soon be at the disposal of the prostitute made me feel as if i were a powerless and an unhappy witness to a sacrilege it may be that my rage for male loveliness is only another outbreaking of the old platonic mania for as time goes on i find that i long less for the actual youth before me and more and more for some ideal perfect being whose bodily splendor and loving heart are the realities whose reflections only we see in this cave of shadows since the birth and development within me of what for lack of a better name i term my homosexualized patmorian ideal life has become in the main a weary business i am not despondent however because many things still hold for me a certain interest when that interest dies down as it is wont from time to time i endeavor to be patient god grant that after the end here i may be drawn from the shadow and seemingly vain imaginings into the possession of their never-ending reality hereafter end of part four of chapter three recording by john fricker part five of chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History 10. A. H., aged 62, belongs to a family which cannot be regarded as healthy, but there is no insanity among near relations. Father, a very virile man of high character and good intelligence, but not sound physical health. 
mother was high-strung and nervous but possessed of indomitable courage and very affectionate she lived very happily with her husband she became a chronic invalid and died of consumption a h was a seven months child the third in the family who were born very rapidly so that there is only three years difference in the ages of the first and third children a h believes that one of his brothers who has never married and prefers men to women is also inverted though not to the same degree as himself and he also suspects that a relation of his mother's may have been an invert sister who resembles the father in character is married but is spoken of as a woman's woman rather than a man's woman the family generally are considered proud and reserved but of superior mental endowment in early life a h was delicate and his studies were often interrupted by illness though living under happy conditions he was shy and nervous often depressed in later life his health has been up to the average and he has usually been able to conceal his mental doubts and diffidence as a child he played with dolls and made girls his companions until an age when he grew conscious that his conduct was unusual and became ashamed while his father seemed troubled about him he regards himself as having been a very childish child his conscious sexual life began between the ages of eight and ten he was playing in the garden when he saw a man-servant who had long been with the family standing at the door of a shed with his penis exposed and erect the boy had never seen anything of the kind before but felt great delight in the exhibition and moved shyly toward the man who retreated into the shed the boy followed and was allowed to caress and play with the penis until ejaculation took place the man replying in reply to the child's innocent inquiries that it felt good this experience was frequently repeated with the same man and the boy confided in a boy friend with whom he tried to ascertain by personal experience what the good feeling was like but they were too young to derive any pleasure from the attempt beyond the joy of what was instinctively felt to be eating forbidden fruit from this period his sexual tendencies began to become fixed and self-conscious he has never at any period of life had a moment's conscious sexual attraction toward a person of the opposite sex his warmest friendships have indeed been with women and much perhaps most of the happiness he has enjoyed has been furnished by those friendships but passion has only been aroused by persons of his own sex generally by men much younger than himself he feels shy and uncomfortable in the presence of men of his own age but even at his present age a touch of a man or boy may cause the liveliest gratification shortly after the incident in boyhood already narrated a h induced a little boy companion to go to a quiet spot where at a h s suggestion each placed the other's penis in his mouth by turns a h had never heard of such a proceeding it was a natural instinct he began to masturbate at an early age but he soon found a companion to share his passion an older man especially married and with a family became his accomplice on every possible opportunity and they would manipulate each other at the age of twenty-one fellatio began to be practised with this man it became a life-long practice and the preferred method of sexual gratification he likes best to have it performed on himself but he has never asked any one to do for him what he would not himself do for the other if desired there has never been pedicaccio the penis it may be added is of good size and the testicles rather large no one has ever suspected a h s sexual perversion not even his physician with whom he has long had a close friendship until at a time of great mental distress a h voluntarily revealed his state he is accustomed to refined society has always read much abhorred athletic pursuits and loved poetry children and flowers his love of nature amounts indeed to a passion wherever he has been he has made friends among the best people he confesses to occasional periods of addiction to intoxicants induced by sociable companionship and only controlled by force of will for business he has not the slightest aptitude and cannot look after his own affairs he is always dreading poverty and destitution he believes however that he passes among his friends as fairly capable he considers that inversion is natural in his case and that he has a perfect right to gratify his own natural instincts though he also admits they may be vices he has never sought to influence an innocent person towards his own tendencies history eleven t d knows of nothing abnormal in his ancestry his brother has homosexual tendencies but is also attracted to women 
a sister who is very religious states that she has little or no sexual inclinations they were all of a dreamy disposition when young to the disgust of their teachers he sent the following account of himself from the university at the age of twenty when i was a child before i went to school at nine he writes i was already of an affectionate disposition an affection turned readily to either sex no boy was the cause of my inclinations which were quite spontaneous no doubt part of the cause may be found in our social system by which ladies are rather drawing-room creatures to be treated with distant respect when i was ten at a preparatory school i first began to form attachments with other boys of my own age in which i always had regard to physical beauty it is this stage in which the sexual element is latent that shelley speaks of as preceding love in ardent natures at twelve i learned masturbation apparently by instinct and i regret to say practised it to excess for the next seven years always secretly and with shame and often with the accompaniment of prurient imaginings which did not prevent my relations with those i loved being of a very spiritual nature masturbation was often practised daily with bursts of repentance and abstinence latterly more rarely but until i was fifteen i really knew nothing of sexual matters and it was not till i was at least seventeen that i was conscious of sexual desire which i repressed with shame owing to excessive self-abuse i am unable to admit except manually but desire is strong i think naked contact would suffice and in any case intercrural connection pedicatio and fellatio i abhor i love boys between the ages of twelve and fifteen they must be of my own class refined and lovable i only desire the active masculine part i now regard my inclinations as natural and normal to me the difficulty is that of leading the other party to regard it as such besides the young age required and clandestine nature of proceedings necessary the moral difficulties of circumstances are so strong that i have little hope of ever gratifying my passion fully i have found myself deceived in the character of the boy twice the last friendship lasted three years during which time i only saw him naked two or three times this caused erection never touched him pruriently and only kissed him once i have never found a satisfactory object of my affections and my happiness perhaps my health have been seriously injured at my public school a master helped me to a truer understanding of these things the merely animal sodomy which exists in many public schools was unknown what i learned of sex i learned for myself i am recommended to turn my aspirations to the abstract universal maid but so far at least i cannot do it male greek statutory and the fedoras of plato have had a great though only confirmatory influence on my feelings my ideal is that of theocritus the thirteenth wherein hercules was bringing hylas to the perfect measure of a man my first thought is the good of my friend but except for the good subjective influence of passion i have failed utterly i am very tall dark rather strong fond of games though i do not excel owing to short sight i am english though i have french blood which may account for an unreservedly passionate disposition though unlike other people i am not in the least feminine nor has any one thought so to my knowledge i can whistle easily and well i am so masculine that i cannot even conceive of passive sexual pleasure in women much less in men that is one of the difficulties in boy love my affections are inextricably bound up in the ideals of protection of one weaker than myself in the earlier days when sexuality was less conscious this was a great source of romantic feeling the glamour of which is rather departing i cannot understand love of adult males much less if they are of lower class and the idea of prostitution is nauseous to me i think i may say that i have the aesthetic and moral sense very strongly ingrained indeed they are largely synonymous with me i have no dramatic aptitude and though i flatter myself that my taste is good in music i have no knowledge of music if i have a favourite colour it, it is a dark crimson or blue of the nature of old stained glass i derive great pleasure from all literary and pictorial art and architecture indeed art of all kinds i have facility in writing personal lyrical verse it affords me relief 
I think my inversion must be congenital, as the desire of contact with these boys I loved began before masturbation and has lasted through private and public resorts and into university life. The other sex does not attract me, but I am very fond of children, girls, as well as boys. If there is sexuality in this, which I trust there is not, it is latent. This statement is of interest, because it may well lead us to suppose that the writer, who is of balanced mind and sound judgment, possesses a confirmed homosexual outlook on life. While, however, it is the rule for the permanent direction of the sexual impulse to be decided by the age of twenty, that age is too early to permit us to speak positively, especially in a youth whose adolescent, undifferentiated or homosexual impulses are fostered by university life. This proved to be the case with T.D., who, though doubtless possessing a physically anomalous strain, is yet predominantly masculine. On leaving the university, his heterosexuality asserted itself normally. About six years after the earlier statement, he wrote that he had fallen in love. I am on the eve of marrying a girl of nearly my own age. She has sympathy as well as knowledge in my fields of study. It was thus easier for me to explain my past, and I found that she could not understand the moral objections to homosexual practices. My own opinion always was that the moral objections were very considerable, but might in some cases be overcome. In any case, I have entirely lost my sexual attraction towards boys, though I am glad to say that the appreciation of their charm and grace remains. My instincts, therefore, have undergone a considerable change, but the change is not entirely in the direction of normality. The instinct for sodomy in the proper sense of the word used to be unintelligible to me since the object of attraction has become a woman. This instinct is mixed with the normal in my desire further an element which much troubled me as being most foreign to my ideal feelings has not quite left me the indecent and often scatological curiosity about immature girls i can only hope that the realization of the normal in marriage may finally kill these painful aberrations i should add that the practice of masturbation has been abandoned history twelve aged twenty four father and mother both living the latter is of a better social standing than the father he is much attached to his mother and she gives him some sympathy he has a brother who is normally attracted to women he himself has never been attracted to women and takes no interest in them nor in their society at the age of four he first became conscious of an attraction for older males from the ages of eleven and nineteen at a large grammar school he had relationships with about one hundred boys needless to add he considers homosexuality extremely common in schools it was however the oscar wilde case which first opened his eyes to the wide prevalence of homosexuality and he considers that the publicity of that case has done much if not to increase homosexuality at all events to make it more conspicuous and outspoken he is now attracted to youths about five or six years younger than himself they must be good-looking he has never perverted a boy not already inclined to homosexuality in his relationship he does not feel exclusively like a male or a female sometimes one sometimes the other he is often liked he says because of his masculine character he is fully developed and healthy with over middle height inclined to be plump with full face and small moustache he smokes many cigarettes and cannot get on without them though his manners are very slightly if at all feminine he acknowledges many feminine ways he is fond of jewellery until lately always wore a bangle and likes women's rings he is very particular about fine ties and uses very delicate women's handkerchiefs he has always had a taste for music and sings he has a special predilection for green it is the predominant colour in the decoration of his room and everything green appeals to him he finds that the love of green and also of violet and purple is very widespread among his inverted friends history thirteen artist aged thirty four the earliest sex impression that i am conscious of he writes is at the age of nine or ten falling in love with a handsome boy who must have been about two years my senior i do not recollect ever having spoken to him but my desire so far as i can recall was that he should seize hold of and handle me I have a distinct impression yet of how pleasurable even physical pain or cruelty would have been at his hands. 
i have noticed that in young children it is often difficult to differentiate the sexual emotion from what in the grown-up would be definite cruelty it must have been about this time that i discovered entirely by myself the act of masturbation the process grew up quite naturally though i cannot but think that the cooped-up life in a london street in a london school with want of physical exercise as well as want of landscape colour and beautiful form had much to do with it the tone of the school i was at was singularly clean but i question whether the vaunted cleanliness of tone of day schools can compensate for the open life and large discipline of an english public school how far the rather frequent masturbation between the ages of ten and thirteen may have had to do with weekly health i do not know but when i was twelve i was taken by my mother to a famous doctor he made no inquiries of a sexual nature but he advised that i should be sent away from london he had a sentimental horror of violent games etc for boys and put aside various suggested public schools finally i was sent to a private school at the seaside the private school was clean and wholesome the plunge into the sexual cockatus of the great public school that followed was effectually sudden in my day was a perfect stew of uncleanliness there was plenty of incontinence not much cruelty no end of dirty conversation and a great deal of genuine affection even to heroism shown among the boys in their relations to one another all these things were treated by masters and boys alike as more or less unholy with the result that they were either sought after or flung aside according to the sexual or emotional instinct of each no attempt was made at discrimination a kiss was as unclean as the act of fellatio and no one had any gauge or principle whatever on which to guide the cravings of boyhood my first initiation into the mysteries of sex was at the hands of the dormitory servant who showed me his penis when he woke me in the mornings and masturbated me when he gave me my hot bath on a saturday night this old reprobate of forty-five committed the act of fellatio with most of the boys in turn as he went the dormitory rounds for the older lads i cannot speak but over us younger ones of fourteen and fifteen he exercised a sort of unholy terror and fascination he was very popular we came to him like doves to a snake when i revisited my old school many years later he was occupying a very responsible position in the college chapel and i noticed that he wore the expression of sly reverence which i think i can now instantly detect when i see it in a man for the rest the dormitory was boisterous and lewd and there was a good deal of bullying which probably did little harm my principal recollection now is of the filthy mystery of foul talk that i neither cared for nor understood what i really needed like all the other boys was a little timely help over the sexual problems but this we none of us got and each had to work out his own principle of conduct for himself it was a long difficult and wasteful process and i cannot but believe that many of us failed in the endeavour we had come unprepared with any advice the principle upon which we were apparently trained was the repression of every instinct my mother was ignorant from innocence my father from indifference and so between them i was sent out helpless a mother incurs great responsibility in sending her child away unprepared a parent should not seek to shift his responsibility upon the schoolmaster love alone should be the fount from which revelations should flow the master from the very nature of his position cannot reveal an eminent breakdown in health due it would now appear to quite obvious causes relieved me from the purgatory of the college dormitory and i was removed to one of the private houses these establishments were considered more select and less rough the social atmosphere was however perhaps more unwholesome because more effeminate and was full of noble young sucklings the nominal head of the house under normal conditions might have been a real leader as it was the real head of the house was a gilded young pariah fairly low down in the school and full of hypocrisy and unnatural lusts the boy who occupied the cubicle next to mine was also a bad case of sexual misdirection though he had not the social distinction to make him quite so refined a terror i had every opportunity of watching him until two years later he was fortunately asked to leave 
he talked bored from morning till night got drunk on one or two occasions masturbated constantly without concealment had several of the younger boys into femora though without evincing any care or affection for them and gave one the impression of having been born for a brothel his one redeeming quality was an element of good nature a characteristic one often finds among such as are selfish and irresponsible i have since been told that he has gone completely to the dogs whether this young cub's sexual instincts could have been turned or guided i do not know but in a rougher and simpler life than that of a public school in a more open and less hypocritical atmosphere he might perhaps have been licked into better shape the hypocrisy is a vice however that schoolboys themselves are fortunately free from it comes later the tone among the boys was frankly and violently unclean though unclean not from instinct but from want of direction and from repression i have not a single happy recollection of this period of my school life yet out of this morass of misbegotten virtues i plucked my first blossom of genuine affection i call it a blossom because it never ripened even to flower i had been given the extreme of filth to feed upon at the outset and now i found for myself the extreme of chastity it will be a matter of lifelong regret to me that the love which was the lodestar of my school years was never fulfilled or set upon a sound basis of comradeship when i was about sixteen and a half years old there came into the house a boy about two years younger than myself and who became the absorbing thought of my school days i do not remember a moment from the time i first saw him to the time i left school that i was not in love with him and the affection was reciprocated if somewhat reservedly he was always a little ahead of me in books and scholarship but as our affection ripened we spent most of our spare time together and he received my advances much as a girl who is being wooed a little mockingly perhaps but with real pleasure he allowed me to fondle and caress him but our intimacy never went further than a kiss and about that even was the slur of shame there was always a barrier between us and we never so much as whispered to one another concerning those things of which all the school obscenely talked any connection between our own emotions and the sexual morals of the school never occurred to us in fact we lived in a dream life of chastity that could not relate itself to any human conditions this was suddenly broken in upon my friend was very beautiful and an object of attraction to others that some of the elder boys had made offers of sexual intercourse to him i knew but to him as to me that was unspeakable wickedness one day i heard that four or five of these suitors of his had mishandled him they had i believe taken off his trousers and attempted to masturbate him the offence was probably horse-play of an animal nature to me it seemed an unpardonable offence the matter had been reported to the master by a servant but confirmatory evidence was needed before punishment could follow i was torn asunder by passions i could not then analyse and in the end committed the greatest of schoolboy crimes i sneaked the action under the circumstances was courageous but i was indifferent so long as the boy i loved judged me rightly the result was that at the close of the term four or five of the senior boys were asked to leave the remaining brief period of my school life which had previously been a living hell became really happy that this should have been brought about to the harm of four or five boys whose sin after all was but a misdirected impulse for which the system was responsible seems to me now all very wrong of the boys sent away however certainly three have made honourable careers for my friend and i we became more afraid of each other than before as our affections increased so our fear of them increased also the friendship was too ethereal to live but even yet we still have a deep respect for one another when at the age of nineteen i left school i was allowed to knock about for a year before entering college during this time i picked up a sexual experience that may or may not have been a valuable one i certainly look back upon it now with regret if not with horror my father had discovered some months before this day that i was in the habit of masturbating and he gave me what he conceived to be the right counsel under the circumstances if you do this he said you will never be able to use your penis with a woman 
therefore your best plan will be to go with a prostitute should you do this however you will probably pick up a beastly disease therefore the safest way would be to do it abroad if you get the chance for there the houses are licensed having delivered himself of this advice he troubled himself no further in the matter but left me to work out my own destiny the great physician to whom i was taken about this time also gave me his advice on this point masturbation he said is death a number of young men come to me with the same story i tell them they are killing themselves and you will kill yourself too the doctor's hope was apparently to frighten his young patients into what he conceived to be natural conditions of life and one went away from him with the impression that every sexual manifestation in one's self was a physical infirmity due to one's own moral weakness it took me some time before i could make up my mind to follow my father's advice but after a period of real moral agony i deliberately and entirely in cold blood acted upon it i sought out a scarlet woman in the streets of and went home with her from something she said to me i know that i gave her pleasure and she asked me to come to her again this i did twice but without any real pleasure the whole thing was too sordid and soulless and the man who decides to take an evil medicine regularly has first to make up his mind that he really needs it at about the same time i chanced to be for a few months in a german university town and i determined as i had the opportunity to carry the parental advice to the logical conclusion i tried a licensed house the place was clean and decent and the conditions i take it such as one would normally find in any properly regulated continental city but to me the whole thing appeared unspeakably horrible it was a purely commercial transaction and it had not even the redeeming element of risk to oneself or of offence against a social or disciplinary code i came away feeling that i had touched bottom in my sexual experiences and i understood what it was that faust saw when the red mouse sprang from the mouth of the witch in the walpurgis dance these were the only occasions upon which i have had sexual intercourse with women looking back to them now they appear to me to have been almost inevitable but if i had my life over again i would shun them as i would a lethal draught i believe i came out of the fire unscathed probably indeed it did me good in the sense that it made it possible for me to look deeper into life though to what extent seeing the torments of the damned makes us do this perhaps only a dante could tell to gain knowledge of the expense of the shame and misery of others i hold to be fundamentally wrong and immoral what is to me however the chief and bitterest thought is that i flung away the first spring of manhood where i got no love in return his virginity is or should be as glorious and sacred a position to a youth as to a maiden to be guarded jealously to be given only at the call of love to one who loves him be it comrade mistress or wife and whom he can love in return the full university life into which i now entered at the age of twenty brought with it a flood of new ideas feelings and sensations the friendships i made there will always remain the central ones in my life up to my last term at college at the age of twenty-four i still wore my chain-mail of artificial chastity but then a change gradually set in and i began to understand the relationship of the physical phenomenon of sex to its intellectual and imaginative manifestations i was not destined to fully realize this for some years and to then exclusively through and out of my own personal experience it was the study of walt whitman's leaves of grass that first brought me light upon this question hitherto i had kept the two things locked up as it were in two separate airtight compartments my friendships in one my sex instincts in another to be kept under and repressed by the public school code as i conceived it it is needless to say that i was continually troubled by the customary sex phenomena erotic dreams loss of semen troublesome erections at night etc these i repressed as best i could by habitual masturbation and by the regular diet and exercise which academic life made possible at one time for the period of a year i should say i tried to overcome the desire for masturbation by gradual stages on the principle of the drunkard's cure by which he took every day less tipple by the insertion of one pebble more in his bottle i marked on my calendar the erotic dreams and the nights on which i masturbated and sought gradually to extend the intervening periods six weeks however was the longest time for which i was able to abstain 
a few years later the writer of this communication formed an intimate relationship in which he did not make the first advances with a youth some years younger than himself and of lower social class whose development he was able to assist but for my part he remarks i owe him as much as i gave him for his love lighted up the gold of affection that was in me and consumed the dross it was from him that i first learned that there was no such thing as a hard and fast line between the physical and the spiritual in friendship this relationship lasted for some years when the young man married its effects are described as very beneficial to both parties all the sexual troubles vanished together with the desire to masturbate everything in life began to sing with joy and what little of real creative work i may have done i attribute largely to the power of work that was born in me during those years end of part five of chapter three recording by john fricker Part six of Chapter three of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History fourteen. Scotchman, aged thirty eight. His paternal ancestors were normal so far as he knows. His mother belonged to a very eccentric old Celtic family soon after five. He became so enamoured of a young shepherd that the boy had to be sent away he practised masturbation many years before the age of puberty and attaches importance to this as a factor in the evolution of his homosexual life he has had erotic dreams rarely about men about women more frequently while indifferent to women he has no repulsion toward them he has had connection with women two or three times but without experiencing the same passionate emotions as with men he would like a son but he has never been able to get up the necessary amount of passion to lead to marriage he has always had a sentimental and platonic affection for men of late years he has formed two friendships with adults of an affectionate and also erotic character he cares little for anything beyond mutual masturbation and kissing what he desires is the love of the male in appearance there is nothing abnormal about him except an air of youth he is vigorous both in body and mind and has enormous power of resisting fatigue he is an excellent man of business is a patient student he sees no harm in his homosexual passions he is averse to promiscuity his ideal is a permanent union which includes sexual relations history fifteen t s artist aged thirty two i was born in england my father was a jew the first to marry out of his family and to marry a christian my great-grandparents were cousins he was a german and she was a dane my grandparents were also cousins he was a swede and she was a dane my maternal grandfather was an english protestant and my maternal grandmother was irish fanatically roman catholic and a very eccentric woman in my father's family there have been many members of note in my mother's family there were many renowned lawyers my father had an elder brother who was homosexual he was already at thirty-one years of age a prominent author when he died of consumption i have also a second cousin on my father's side who is a very good tenor he is also homosexual in my mother's family i know of nothing abnormal in neither family is there or has there been any insanity but rather an overwealth of brain my parents were an ideally happy couple they were engaged after knowing each other six days and after being separated three months they married they were married thirty-five years without a quarrel i have a brother three years older born a year after their marriage and a sister seven years younger my brother takes after his father in appearance he is a great lover of women and much spoiled by them he is quite normal and abstemious my sister is a very womanly woman as a girl she disapproved very much of girl friendships and always confided in her mother 
at thirteen years of age she met the man she is now married to they waited ten years before marrying and are now an ideally happy couple my sister is perfectly normal and very abstemious i lived my first ten years in england eighteen years in sweden two years in denmark two years in bavaria austria and italy and am now living in berlin i consider myself english i am mentally a man but all my physical feelings and desires are those of a woman i am middle height and very slight weigh hundred and six english pounds without clothes my hands and feet are small and well shaped head of normal size features small eyes green i have worn glasses since i was seven years old complexion fair appearance not jewish the skin of my body is very white without blemish very little hair on my face hair on head and abdomen luxuriant no hair whatever on stomach and chest colour of hair auburn everywhere except below the navel that black my father's mother's and brother's hair was brown my sister has auburn hair and so had the aforementioned uncle my breasts are slightly round my hips are normal i do not gesticulate much from my material self it would be difficult to draw the conclusion that i was homosexual my sexual organs are normal my disposition is apparently bright but in reality melancholy I have very little love for human nature but have a partiality for the british and jewish races hate business politics sports and society love music art literature and nature deep interest in mysticism am clairvoyant have been used many times as a medium lead two separate lives an outer and inner psychic life am a fatalist and a theosophist profound belief in reincarnation always have had because when i was a little child i could remember so much have an excellent memory dating back to my third year have always been too self-analytical have from my earliest childhood felt myself an alien am very sensitive physically and psychically have no wish to wear women's clothing or do women's work as to clothes for myself i prefer black and not much jewellery i could only love a perfectly manly man from twenty-one to forty years of age he must be physically beautiful and well made size of sexual organs plays no part the muscles must be developed and the hands must be especially well shaped hands are my fetish i could never love any one with ugly hands he must have no odour issuing from his body though i do not dislike faint perfume when clothed and above all never have a bad breath he must be intelligent love music art literature and nature he must be refined and cultured and have been about the world he must have simplicity in behaviour dress and manner and above all be clean-bodied as clean-minded cynicism i cannot stand here i may state i once owned a st bernard dog which reminded me much of my ideal he was always sedate always loving and faithful generally quiet he only got excited when out in the elements i have not been able to get on with people who have no sense of humour from my birth i was physically weak first i suffered from eczema being born with a double squint i was operated on at two and a half and again at three and a half years of age with excellent result from four to twelve years of age i had convulsions often and all the illnesses of childhood at the age of twelve and a half years i took scarlet fever followed by a weak heart which grew stronger after a year and bright's disease which lasted fifteen years with hardly a break this illness had its vaunted effect on producing melancholia and upsetting the whole nervous system bright's disease stopped suddenly but was followed by a succession of illnesses then i had neuritis very badly 
i then removed to bavaria and to regain nervous strength i was treated by freud's psychoanalytical method with great success i had a very bad relapse as my brother who had just heard i was homosexual came to visit me and threatened to have me put under guardians if my father should die it took me weeks to recover from the shock we broke off all intercourse and though my brother has been several times in the same town where i have been we remain strangers at this time my father died suddenly last spring four suicides of friends in so many weeks had a very bad effect on my nerves i am now in berlin in better spirits but the crump continues badly at times to this i must add that since my fourteenth year independent of any illness i have suffered mentally and physically from menstrual pains recurring every twenty-eight days and lasting from six to eight days that these were the equivalent pains to a woman's menstruation periods i could get no doctor to admit till i was treated for a length of time by a german nerve specialist the physical pains begin abruptly sudden congestions of blood in the brain and in the abdomen sudden perspirations heat and cold great nervous pains in the small of the back also in the nerve centres of abdomen and stomach sharp shooting pains in the breasts and especially in the nipples sudden toothache which stops as suddenly the skin becomes darker sometimes mottled i have the whole time a taste of blood in my mouth and often everything i eat tastes of blood i have great difficulty at that time in eating meat physical longings for erotic adventure counterbalanced by mental nausea at the bare idea the mental symptoms are sudden feeling of deep depression suicidal tendencies alternating with sudden inexplicable light-heartedness capriciousness and great dissatisfaction with myself and life generally horror at mine own incompleteness of sex and sudden fits of hatred toward women and a great longing to be loved by men this condition changes slowly back to the normal one it takes several days for me to lose my physical weakness owing to it physically i was developed at sixteen years of age mentally i was developed at a very early age but i kept my inner life quite dark always playing the innocent nobody at home believed me to know anything about life they were at times very surprised when i fell out of the role i had planned for myself up till i was seventeen years of age nothing to do with other people's morals was ever discussed before me i looked so pure and do now that people are always careful in front of me my father never discussed such things with me from my earliest childhood i loved men dearly though i was always at daggers drawn with my father and brother i worshipped my mother then as i do now my sister and i did not at all get on as children though we are the best of friends now she and her husband as well as my mother have been kindness itself ever since they knew of my condition not till i was over thirty years did i meet a man i loved as well as my mother and he is heterosexual i must have loved my father and brother at first but continual conflicts incompatible temperaments and mutual misunderstandings and want of sympathy made life at home horrible i must admit from my earliest childhood i had a certain contempt for my father and brother because i found them so materialistic i had all my childhood rows with my brother my father took his part my mother mine after i had recovered from my father's sudden death my first words were after reading the letter thank god it isn't mother i felt a great relief but it took a long time for me to grasp that i was really free i have always liked women's society and as a youth i was very fond of gossip which i by no means am now i have many women friends more than men friends these women friends are all heterosexual except one i very often like elderly women i suppose i see mother in such women a woman never could make me blush but a man i admired could easily i was twenty-three years of age when a married woman of good family asked me to come and spend the night with her 
i went and though she was beautifully built cleanly and though her garments and apartments were of the utmost good taste i did not have any erection on the other hand i felt myself to be most unclean and bathed three times each of the following three days since then i have never tried to have sexual intercourse with women in copenhagen i tried to excite my feelings with every class of woman in vain i suppose it is that my nature is so like a woman's that there can be no reaction with men i am often very shy and nervous tongue-tied and my hands perspire never so with women as a child i loved men and used to fall desperately in love with some who came to the house i would when no one was there kiss their hats or gloves or even their sticks i can remember when i was about six years how i fell in love with a very good-looking twenty-six-year-old german he had very curly hair and his hands were very beautiful he was very fond of me and i used to call him my boy when visiting us he often used to tuck me in after the nurse had gone down he always had sweets or something for me i can remember how i used to fling my arms round his neck and cover his face with kisses i would then draw his head down on my pillow and he would tell me fairy tales and i would go off to sleep quite happy at seven years of age while staying in the country a very good-looking groom about twenty-five years of age misbehaved himself with me i often used to visit him in the stables as this man had a strange attraction for me one day he tickled me while doing so he produced my penis and also his own which was in full erection he tried in every way to excite my feelings in vain for him the occasion terminated in an ejaculation he forbade me to tell any one and i did not do so but tried to find out all i could on the subject with little or no result from that day i hated the groom and i felt a sort of guilt as if i had lost something not till i was twelve years did i understand from my earliest childhood i had one ideal of a man from that ideal i have never swerved at the age of thirty i found a friend who though quite heterosexual has without giving me any sexual intercourse given me the love i have always needed he has been for the last couple of years a second mother father sister brother and lover through him i have regained my health my love of nature and he has helped to deaden my hatred towards human nature and my bitterness a better friend i never wish to find it has made up for all the years of mental and physical suffering one strange thing is that the feeling is mutual he has had a tragic life for his wife whom he loved beyond everything died under very sad circumstances he says i am the best male friend he has ever had while with him much of the lower nature in me was stamped out i shall always look upon him as the turning point in my life i think he wrought some of his finest influence through his music he played beethoven and wagner for me for a couple of hours every day for months and thus opened up a new world to me he is six years older than i am at ten years of age we moved to sweden a country i hated from first to last about this time i began to notice that there was something strange about myself i felt myself an alien and have done so ever since an event of importance in my life was i feel sure when my father's sister tried to take away my mother's character it was done in jealousy and spite and my aunt had to beg my parents pardon outwardly the affair was patched up but i feel sure my father never really forgave his sister jews never forgive this event awoke in me a great hatred towards women and it was many years before i could at all control it at the age of fourteen i was much with a good-looking musical american a year older than myself one day while romping very much the same thing occurred as with the groom i still had no sexual feelings we remained good friends i often wished to kiss him 
after the first time he would not allow it he was very much liked among the officers and so-called high society men and had always much money about ten years later i heard he used to accept money after intimate intercourse with those society men during my fifteenth year i had a great longing for sexual intercourse with men at this time the first signs of hair were to be seen on my abdomen at the age of sixteen a gardener a married man with family initiated me into mutual self-abuse he lived in the back house of the apartment house we then inhabited he was about forty years of age an ugly but muscularly developed man these practices took place in the cellar to which there were three entrances i never allowed him to kiss me and the sight of his children always awoke in me a great feeling of nausea that was the natural reaction of a bad conscience for the man himself i had the utmost contempt this man told me of several parks and pissoirs where men met and i went to these places now and again for erotic adventure i must here relate that at the age of sixteen my mother warned me against self-abuse it had the opposite effect made me curious so i began at once i have continued ever since at least once a day i have never had an involuntary emission in my whole life between seventeen and twenty-two it became necessary for me to do so several times a day working at art painting and above all music and beauty have a strong influence over me and set my erotic longings in violent motion i have never found this do me any harm abstinence on the other hand has a very harmful effect on me upsetting the whole nervous and physical system i often find that there is a something very much wanting in self-abuse the commingling of two human bodies who are mentally as well as physically in sympathy gives an electrical satisfaction which quiets the whole nervous system that at least has been my experience the gardener left and moved to the country i then sometimes visited pissoirs or as they are often called panoramas because they are round and one sees much there uh, what i saw in the parks during the long summer nights was quite a revelation during the summer when the husbands had sent their families in the country many of them led a very indiscreet life what i saw the first summer killed all the respect i had for elderly people i had always connected marriage and grey hairs with virtue and morals then i learnt otherwise i must say i became about this time a sensual pig i knew how dangerous these places were on account of the police and blackmailers but that gave the hunt a double zest at this time i led a double life and was always watching and analysing myself i had to do with heaps of men of all classes i was often offered money but that i would on no condition accept to pay or to be paid kills every sort of erotic feeling in me and always has done so i once wished to experiment with myself i was offered a small sum of money by a former schoolmaster i accepted this just to see how it would affect me the next moment i threw the money as far away as possible then i saw i had none of the prostitute nature in me i was simply overwhelmed with sensuality i considered i was a criminal and wished to see in how many ways my nature had the criminal instinct i wanted to see if i could become a thief i stole a silver button in a shop where antiquities were sold but i went to the shop the same day again and returned the button without the people knowing i found i could not become a thief then the question came why had i felt a criminal since my seventh year was it my fault if not whose fault was it not till i studied freud's psychoanalytical system did i get a clear insight into my own character 
when i was twenty years of age i met a gentleman one night in a heavy snowstorm we walked and talked and understood each other he belonged to one of sweden's first aristocratic families he was extremely refined he asked me to his rooms we undressed and lay down he had a very beautiful head and a still more beautiful body i think that all my erotic feelings were numbered by looking at his beautiful body to me anything sensual would have been sacrilege i thought and i can remember the feeling of awe which came over me he was then twenty years of age but his hair was quite white first he did not understand and then he was very gentle to me i kept perfectly chaste for three whole months after the sight of his body we saw each other often eight years later we met for the last time he suffered much from melancholia at that time i prevented him from committing suicide this winter however he shot himself at the age of twenty-two my sister introduced me to a charming intelligent and refined half english half swedish painter we recognized each other at once though we had never seen each other before and even knew each other's characters to the smallest traits my parents liked him better than any friend i had ever had my sister and he were from the first like sister and brother the first evening in my home he and i kissed each other the women were mad about him later i found many men were too i was three weeks his senior he had his own rooms i have never felt any such wonderful harmony as when our naked bodies mingled it was like floating in ether with him it was the only time i had been active in fellatio we were much together though not much physically for he had many love affairs with women what i loved was the way he would cut off all advances of men i was his little brother and so he calls me to this day he is now married in america and the father of a pretty little daughter we are the best of friends to this day the two years in copenhagen were some of the happiest i have spent though nearly the whole time i was in physical pain in austria i found among the tyrolese peasants that the englishmen who came there in winter for sports and in the summer for mountain climbing have demoralized the young male peasants with money homosexual intercourse is easy to get if you are willing to pay the price larger in season less out of season in italy it is merely a question of money or passion but everything in love there is quite transient in bavaria i found the love and peace which passeth all understanding this love and friendship without anything of a physically intimate nature brought me back from the deep black gulf to which i was swiftly floating when i met my friend i was nearly at the end of my tether what his love and friendship has done for me together with freud's psychoanalytical system nobody will ever know since being in berlin a town i like very much a new life has opened for me a life where one lives as one likes if one does not have to do with young boys here are homosexual baths pensions restaurants and hotels where you can go with one of your own sex at a certain fee per hour berlin is a revelation but since being here i find the physical erotic side of my nature is little excited i suppose it is the old story of forbidden fruit my parents kept a very hospitable home the last two years in sweden i was never at home i hated society and knew much too much about the private histories of those who came to my home they all belonged to the highest society the highest society and the lowest are very much alike of course my parents knew nothing about these people 
when i told mother a great deal of private history of people who came to our house she was thunderstruck and could at last understand my contempt for so-called good society i have visited in later years only in artistic and theatrical circles i consider that class of people more natural than the other class and much more kind-hearted my life has quite another side the mystic side but that would be a much longer story than this suffice it to say i am of a highly sensitive nature gifted with second sight a detailed record of the subject's visions premonitions of death of acquaintances etc has been furnished by him i tried on four occasions to commit suicide but i now see there is nothing to be gained by doing so two years ago i told my parents about my sexual condition it was a frightful blow to them my father had the circumstances explained to him he never understood the matter and never discussed it with me had i told him earlier i feel quite certain that with his despotic nature he would have put me in a madhouse my mother and sister have treated me very kindly always my brother has disowned me end of part six of chapter three recording by john fricker Part seven of chapter three of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, volume two by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. History sixteen. Irish. Aged thirty six. Knows of nothing unusual in his ancestry. His tastes are masculine in every respect. He is strong, healthy, and fond of exercises and sports. The sexual instincts are abnormally developed he confesses to an enormous appetite for almost everything food drink smoking and all the good things of life at about the age of fourteen he practised masturbation with other boys of the same age and also had much pleasure in being in bed with an uncle with whom the same thing was practised later on he practised masturbation with every boy or man with whom he was on terms of intimacy to have been in bed with any one without anything of the sort taking place would have made sleep impossible and rendered him utterly wretched his erotic dreams at first were concerned with women but more recently they are usually of young men and very rarely of women he is mostly indifferent to women as also they have always been to him although good-looking strong and masculine he has never known a woman to be in love with him when about the age of eighteen he imagined he was in love with a girl and he had often between the ages of twenty to thirty cohabited with prostitutes he remembers on one occasion many years ago having connection with a woman seven or eight times in one night and then having to masturbate at noon the next day he is unmarried and thinks it unlikely that he ever will marry but he adds that if a healthy handsome and intelligent woman fell in love with him he might change his mind as it would be lonely to be old and alone and he would like to have children he is never attracted to men older than himself and prefers youths between the ages of eighteen and twenty-five they may be of any class but he does not like common people and is not attached to uniforms or liveries the requisite attractions are an intelligent eye a voluptuous mouth and intelligent teeth if alcibiades himself tried to woo me he says and had bad teeth his labour would be in vain he has sometimes been the active participant in pedicaccio and has tried the passive role out of curiosity but prefers fellatio he does not consider that he is doing anything wrong and regards his acts as quite natural his only regret is the absorbing nature of his passions which obtrude themselves in season and out of season seldom or never leaving him quiet and sometimes making his life a hell yet he doubts whether he would change himself even if he had the power history seventeen age twenty five is employed in an ordinary workshop and lives in the back alley of a large town in which he was born and bred fair slight and refined in appearance the sexual organs are normal and well developed and the sexual passions strong his mother is a big masculine woman and he is much attached to her father is slight and weakly 
he has seven brothers and one sister homosexual desires began at an early age though he does not seem to have come under any perverse influences he is not inclined to masturbation erotic dreams are always of males he declares he never cared for any woman except his mother and that he could not endure to sleep with a woman he says he generally falls in love with a man at first sight as a rule some one older than himself and of higher class and longs to sleep and be with him in one case he fell in love with a man twice his own age and would not rest until he had won his affection he does not much care what form the sexual relation takes he is sensitive and feminine by nature gentle and affectionate he is neat and orderly in his habits and fond of housework helps his mother in washing etc he appears to think that male attachments are perfectly natural history eighteen englishman born in paris aged twenty six an actor he belongs to an old english family his father so far as he is aware had no homosexual inclinations nor had any of his ancestors on the paternal side but he believes that his mother's family and especially a maternal uncle who had a strong feeling for beauty of form were more akin to him in this respect his earliest recollections show an attraction for males at children's parties he incurred his father's anger by kissing other small boys and his feelings grew in intensity with years he has never practised self-abuse and seldom had erotic dreams when they do occur they are about males his physical feeling for women is one of absolute indifference he admires beautiful women in the same way as one admires beautiful scenery at the same time he likes to talk with clever women and has formed many friendships with frank pure and cultivated english girls for whom he has the utmost admiration and respect marriage is impossible because physical pleasure with women is impossible he has tried but cannot obtain the slightest sexual feeling or excitement he especially admires youths though they must not be immature from sixteen or seventeen to about twenty-five the type which physically appeals to him most and to which he appeals is fair smooth-skinned gentle rather girlish and effeminate with the effeminacy of the ingenue not the cocotte his favourite to attract him must be submissive and womanly he likes to be the man and the master on this point he adds the great passion of my life is an exception and stands on an utterly different level it realises an ideal of marriage in which neither is master but both share a joint empire and in which tyranny would be equally painful to both but this friendship and love is for an equal a year younger than myself and does not preclude other and less credible liaisons physicales but this friendship and love is for an equal a year younger than myself and does not preclude other and less creditable liaisons physicales constancy being impossible to men of our calibre pedicaccio is the satisfaction he prefers provided he takes the active never the passive role he is handsome with broad shoulders good figure and somewhat classic type of face with fine blue eyes he likes boating and skating though not cricket or football and is usually ready for fun but has at the same time a taste for reading he has no moral feelings on these matters he regards them as outside ethics mere matters of temperament and social feeling if england were underpopulated he thinks he might possibly feel some slight pangs of remorse but as things are he feels that in prostituting males rather than females he is doing a meretricious action history nineteen t n his history is given in his own words from the time of my earliest imaginings i have always been attached by strength in men and often thought about being carried off by big warriors and living with them in caves and elsewhere when about seven a young man used to show me his penis and handle mine occasionally at private boarding school masturbation was fairly frequent and i suppose i was initiated about twelve or thirteen after leaving i occasionally indulged but nothing happened until i was about twenty except that i was often attracted by strong well-built young men of a good character a man who was not honest and good-hearted had no attraction at twenty i was much attached to a young man of my own age he was engaged this did not prevent him on one occasion endeavouring playfully and with his brother to obtain access to my person i successfully resisted although if he only had been present i should not have done so 
but welcomed the attempt, and I have often and I have often regretted I did not let him know this. But I had a dim idea that my penis was somewhat undeveloped, and this made me shy. Circumstances separated us. About two years later I was crossing the channel when I engaged in conversation with a man about eight years older, who was one of our travelling party. I think the attraction was a case of love at first sight, certainly on my side. A few nights later he had so arranged that we shared a bedroom, and he very soon came over to me and tenderly handled my person. I reciprocated, and I look back all these years to that night with pleasure and no feeling of shame. On one occasion about this time I happened to be sleeping with another young fellow, an office mate, on a holiday, when I awoke and found him handling my penis caressingly. I gently removed his hand and turned over. I thought none the less of him, but my body seemed to belong only to myself and the friend I loved. He was not an earning, I am sure, but we were often together, and I much entered into his interests and felt infinite satisfaction with life, made good progress and many friends. Our physical intimacy was repeated, he taking the active part in our intercrural contact. Then he married very happily. Our friendship remains, but circumstances prevent our often meeting, and there is no longer desire on either part. For some years I was rather lonely in spite of friends. I was somewhat attracted to another man, but his superior social position was a defect to me. Then, when about twenty-eight, I came in contact with a young man of twenty-four, of the artisan class, but superior in ideals and intelligence to most men. I loved him at first glance, and to this day. At first it was just friendship, but soon his form, voice, and thoughts entered into my very soul by day and night. I longed always to be near him, to see him progress, and help him if I could. I would joyfully have given up home, friends, and income, and followed him to the end of the world, preferably an island where we two might at least be the only white men. He seemed to embody all I longed for in the way of knowledge of nature, of strength, of practical ability, and the desire to imitate him in these things widened and strengthened my character. The first time I slept with him I could only summon courage to put my arm over his chest, but I could not sleep for unsatisfied desire, and the unrelieved erection caused a dull pain on the morrow. I had always disliked conversation that might be regarded as bordering on the obscene, and consequently was very ignorant on most matters. It pained me even to hear him laugh at such remarks. I think if he had been intimate with me I should have not conversed much on such topics, but now I felt pleasure in such things with him as they expressed intimacy. I dreamed about him, and was never really happy in his absence. The greatest joy would have been to have slept in his arms. The hairiness of his legs and arms were also most fascinating. Perhaps a year later we were again at night together, and this time I, by degrees, felt his private organs, but he was cold and I felt a little unsatisfied. I wanted to be hugged. This happened once more, and then on a later occasion, not that it afforded me much gratification, but because I wanted to stimulate him to ardour, I attempted masturbation. This aroused his disgust, and I was consequently dismayed. He told me I ought to marry, and although I knew his love was all I wanted, I did not feel but what I could make a woman happy. The constant unrelieved erections which took place when I saw my friend adopt a graceful attitude caused pain at the bottom of my back, and I consulted two specialists, who also advised marriage. I did not tell them I was an invert, for I hardly knew it was a recognised thing, but I did tell them something of what had taken place, and they made next to no comment, but implied it was frequent. My friend now felt repulsion toward me but did not express himself, and as other circumstances then caused a barrier between us to a certain extent, I did not realise the true reason of his coldness. But I felt utterly miserable. When I met a noble woman whom I had long known, I asked her to be my wife, and she consented. Although I told her very soon and long before our marriage of my limitations as a husband, and of my continued longing for my friend, I feel now I did a great wrong 
and I cannot understand why I was not more conscious of this at the time. That I was, to a certain extent, deceiving her relations was inevitable. I had expected to devote my life in making her happy, but I soon found that the true reason of my friend's apparent unfaithfulness was my own action, combined with a feeling on his part that it was as well that our affection should cease even at the cost of a misunderstanding. Since then, three years ago, I have not had a happy day or night, and am therefore quite unable to promote happiness in others. Without my friend, I can find no satisfaction with wife, child, or home. Life has become almost unbearable. Often I have seriously thought of committing suicide, only to postpone it to a time which would be less cruelly inopportune to others. I see my friend, now married, almost daily, and suffer tortures at seeing others nearer to him than myself. No explanation seems possible, as the whole idea of inversion is so repugnant to him, and being an honourable man, he would feel marital ties preclude any warmth of affection. But all the longing of my life seems to be culminating in a driving force which will carry me to the male prostitute or to death. I can concentrate my mind on nothing else, and consequently have become inefficient in work and have no heart for play. I know if my longings could be occasionally satisfied I should immediately recover, but my fear is that if I killed myself those who knew me in happier days would only be confirmed in the impression of my degeneracy, and would feel my instincts had caused it, whereas it is the denial and starvation of them which would have brought about the result i know now by experience of self and others that my disposition is congenital and that i have been rendered unhappy myself and a cause of unhappiness to others by the too late knowledge of myself the example of my former friend who married misled me to think i too could marry and make a happy home so that when the man i loved advised me i resolved to do so as i would have done almost anything else he suggested if I could have withdrawn from the engagement without embarrassment to the devoted woman who became my wife, I would have done so, if she gave me the opportunity. Nothing in my married state has brought me pleasure, and I often wish my wife would cease to love me so that we might separate. But she would be heartbroken at the suggestion, and I feel driven to attempt to relieve my feelings even in a way that has previously seemed repulsive to me. I mean, by use of money. About my feelings toward my child, there is not much to say, as they are not very strong. I believe I carry him, and help bathe and attend to him as much as most fathers, and when he is a few years older I hope I may find him very companionable. But he has brought me no real joy, though I see other men look at him almost with affection. But he has brought added happiness to his mother. End of Part 7 of Chapter 3 Recording by John Fricker Part 8 of Chapter 3 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next case is interesting as showing the mental and emotional development in a very radical case of sexual inversion. History 20 Englishman of independent means, aged forty-nine. His father and his father's family were robust, healthy, and prolific. On his mother's side, phthisis, insanity, and eccentricity are traceable. He belongs to a large family, some of whom died in early childhood and at birth, while others are normal. He himself was a weakly and highly nervous child, subject to night terrors and somnambulism, excessive shyness and religious disquietude. Sexual consciousness awoke before the age of eight, when his attention was directed to his own penis. His nurse, while out walking with him one day, told him that when little boys grow up their penises fall off. The nursery maid sniggered, and he felt that there must be something peculiar about the penis. He suffered from irritability of the prepuce, and the nurse powdered it before he went to sleep. There was no transition from this to self-abuse. About the same time he became subject to curious half-waking dreams. In these he imagined himself the servant of several adult naked sailors. He crouched between their thighs and called himself their dirty pig, 
and by their orders he performed services for their genitals and buttocks which he contemplated and handled with relish at about the same period when these visions began to come to him he casually heard that a man used to come and expose his person before the window of a room where the maids sat this troubled him vaguely between the age of eight and eleven he twice took the penis of a cousin into his mouth after they had slept together the feeling of the penis pleased him when sleeping with another cousin they used to lie with hands outstretched to cover each other's penis or nates he preferred the nates but his cousin the penis neither of these cousins was homosexual and there was no attempt at mutual masturbation he was in the habit of playing with five male cousins one of these boys was unpopular with the others and they invented a method of punishing him for supposed offences they sat around the room on chairs each with his penis exposed and the boy to be punished went around to the room on his knees and took each penis into his mouth in turn this was supposed to humiliate him it did not lead to masturbation on one occasion the child accidentally observed a boy who sat next to him in school playing with his penis and caressing it this gave him a powerful uneasy sensation with regard to all these points the subject observes that none of the boys with whom he was connected at this period and who were exposed to precisely the same influences became homosexual he was himself from the first indifferent to the opposite sex in early childhood and up to the age of thirteen he had frequent opportunities of closely inspecting the sexual organs of girls his playfellows these roused no sexual excitement on the contrary the smell of the female parts affected him disagreeably when he once saw a schoolfellow copulating with a little girl it gave him a sense of mystical horror nor did the sight of the male organs arouse any particular sensations he is however of opinion that living with his sisters in childhood he felt more curious about his own sex as being more remote from him he showed no effeminacy in his preferences for games or work he went to a public school here he was provoked by boy friends to masturbate but though he often saw the act in process it only inspired him with a sense of indecency in his fifteenth year puberty commenced with nocturnal emissions and at the same time he began to masturbate and continued to do so about once a week or once a fortnight during a period of eight months always with a feeling that that was a poor satisfaction and repulsive his thoughts were not directed either to males or females while masturbating he spoke to his father about these signs of puberty and by his father's advice he entirely abandoned onanism he only resumed the practice to some extent after the age of thirty when he was without male comradeship the nocturnal emissions after he had abandoned self-abuse became very frequent and exhausting they were medically treated by tonics such as quinine and strychnine he thinks this treatment exaggerated his neurosis all this time no kind of sexual feeling for girls made itself felt he could not understand what his schoolfellows found in women or the stories they told about wantonness and delight of coitus his old dreams about the sailors had disappeared but now he enjoyed visions of beautiful young men and exquisite statues he often shed tears when he thought of them these dreams persisted for years but another kind gradually usurped their place to some extent these second visions took the form of the large erect organs of naked young grooms or peasants these gross visions offended his taste and hurt him though at the same time they evoked a strong active desire for possession he took a strange poetic pleasure in the ideal form but the seminal losses which accompanied both kinds of dreams were a perpetual source of misery to him there is no doubt that at this time that is between the fifteenth and seventeenth years a homosexual diathesis had become established he never frequented loose women though he sometimes thought that would be the best way of combating his growing inclinations for males and he thinks that he might have brought himself to indulge freely in purely sexual pleasure with women if he made their first acquaintance in a male costume as deba juice cherubino court pages young halberdiers as it is only when so clothed that women on the stage or in the ballroom have excited him his ideal of morality and fear of venereal infection more than physical incapacity kept him what is called chaste he never dreamed of women never sought their society never felt the slightest sexual excitement in their presence never idealized them aesthetically he thought them far less beautiful than men statues and pictures of naked women had no attraction for him while all objects of art which represented handsome males deeply stirred him 
it was in his eighteenth year that an event occurred which he regards as decisive in his development he read plato a new world opened and he felt that his own nature had been revealed next year he formed a passionate but pure friendship with a boy of fifteen personal contact with the boy caused erection extreme agitation and aching pleasure but not ejaculation through four years he never saw the boy naked or touched him pruriently only twice he kissed him he says that these two kisses were the most perfect joys he ever felt his father now became seriously anxious both about his health and his reputation he warned him of the social and legal dangers attending his temperament but he did not encourage him to try coitus with women he himself thinks that his own sense of danger might have made this method successful or that at all events the habit of intercourse with women might have lessened neurosis and diverted his mind to some extent from homosexual thoughts a period of great pain and anxiety now opened for him but his neurasthenia increased he suffered from insomnia obscure cerebral discomfort stammering chronic conjunctivitis inability to concentrate his attention and dejection meanwhile his homosexual emotions strengthened and assumed a more sensual character he abstained from indulging them as also from omenism but he was often forced with shame and reluctance to frequent places baths urinaries and so forth where there were opportunities of seeing naked men having no passion for women it was easy to avoid them yet they inspired him with no exact horror he used to dream of finding an exit from his painful situation by cohabitation with some coarse boyish girl of the people but his dread of syphilis stood in the way he felt however that he must conquer himself by efforts of will and by a persistent direction of his thoughts to heterosexual images he sought the society of distinguished women once he coaxed up a romantic affection for a young girl of fifteen which came to nothing probably because the girl felt the want of absolute passion in his wooing she excited his imagination and he really loved her but she did not even in the closest contact stimulate his sexual appetite once when he kissed her just after she had risen from bed in the morning a curious physical repugnance came over him attended with a sad feeling of disappointment he was strongly advised to marry by physicians at last he did so he found that he was potent and begot several children but he also found to his disappointment that the tyranny of the male genital organs on his fancy increased owing to this cause his physical mental and moral discomfort became acute his health gave way at about the age of thirty unable to endure his position any longer he at last yielded to his sexual inclinations as he began to do this he also began to regain calm and comparative health he formed a close alliance with a youth of nineteen this liaison was largely sentimental and marked by a kind of etherealized sensuality it involved no sexual acts beyond kissing naked contact and rare involuntary omissions about the age of thirty-six he began freely to follow homosexual inclinations after this he rapidly recovered his health the neurotic disturbances subsided he has always loved men younger than himself at about the age of twenty-seven he had begun to admire young soldiers since he yielded freely to his inclinations the men he has sought are invariably persons of a lower social rank than his own he carried on one liaison continuously for twelve years it began without passion on the friend's side but gradually grew to nearly equal strength on both sides he is not attracted by uniforms but seeks some uncontaminated child of nature the methods of satisfaction have varied with the phases of his passion at first they were romantic and platonic when a hand touch a rare kiss or a mere presence sufficed in the second period sleeping side by side inspection of the naked body of the loved man embracements and occasional emissions after prolonged contact in the third period the gratification became more frankly sensual it took every shape mutual masturbation intercrural coitus fellatio arumatio and occasionally active pedicatio always according to the inclination or concession of the beloved male he himself always plays the active masculine part he never yields himself to the other and he asserts that he never has the joy of finding himself desired with ardour equal to his own he does not shrink from passive pedicatio but it is never demanded of him coitus with males as above described always seems to him healthy and natural it leads a deep sense of well-being and has cemented durable friendships 
he has always sought to form permanent ties with the men whom he has adored so excessively he is of medium height not robust but with great nervous energy with strong power of will and self-control able to resist fatigue and changes of external circumstances in boyhood he had no liking for female occupations or for the society of girls preferring study and solitude he avoided games and the noisy occupations of boys but was only non-masculine in his indifference to sport was never feminine in dress or habit he never succeeded in his attempts to whistle he is a great smoker and has at times drunk much he likes riding skating and climbing but is a poor horseman and is clumsy with his hands he has no capacity for the fine arts and music though much interested in them and is a prolific author he has suffered extremely throughout life owing to his sense of the difference between himself and normal human beings no pleasure he has enjoyed he declares can equal a thousandth part of the pain caused by the internal consciousness of pariahdom the utmost he can plead in his own defence he admits is irresponsibility for he acknowledges that his impulse may be morbid but he feels absolutely certain that in early life his health was ruined and his moral repose destroyed owing to the perpetual conflict with his own inborn nature and that relief and strength came with indulgence although he always has before him the terror of discovery he is convinced that his sexual dealings with men have been thoroughly wholesome to himself largely increasing his physical moral and intellectual energy and not injurious to others he has no sense whatever of moral wrong in his actions and he regards the attitude of society toward those in his position as utterly unjust and founded on false principles the next case is like the foregoing that of a successful man of letters who also passed through a long period of mental conflict before he became reconciled to his homosexual instincts he belongs to a family who are all healthy and have shown marked ability in different intellectual departments he feels certain that one of his brothers is as absolute an invert as himself and that another is attracted to both sexes i am indebted to him for the following detailed narrative describing his emotions and experiences in childhood which i regard as of very great interest not only as a contribution to the psychology of inversion but to the embryology of the sexual emotions generally we here see described in an unduly precocious and hypesthetic form ideas and feelings which in a slightly and more fragmentary shape may be paralleled in the early experiences of many normal men and women but it must be rare to find so many points in sexual psychology so definitely illustrated in a single child it may be added that the narrative is also not without interest as a study in the evolution of a man of letters a child whose imagination was thus early exercised and developed was predestined for a literary career end of part eight of chapter three recording by john fricker chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 3 Sexual Inversion in Men, Part 9. History 21. Almost the earliest recollection I have is of a dream from which my vivid collection of its details must have repeated itself i think more than once unless my waking thoughts unconsciously added definition from this dream dated my consciousness of the attraction to me of my own sex which has ever since dominated my life the dream suggested in part i think by a picture in an illustrated newspaper of a mob murdering a church dignitary took this form I dreamed that I saw my own father murdered by a gang of ruffians, but I do not remember that I felt any grief, though I was actually an exceedingly affectionate child. The body was then stripped of its clothing and eviscerated. I had at the time no notion of anatomical details, but the particulars remained distinct to my mind's eye, of entrails uniformly brown, the color of dung, and there was no accompaniment of blood. When the abdomen had been emptied, the incident in which I became an active participant occurred. I was seized, and the fact that I was overpowered contributed to the agony of delight it afforded me, 
and was laid between the thighs of my murdered parent, and from there I had presently crawled my way into the evacuated abdomen. The act, so far as I can decide of a dream at an age when emission was out of the question, caused in me extreme organic excitement. At all events, I used afterward definitely to recur to it in the waking moments before sleep for the purpose of gaining a state of erection. The dream had no outcome. It seemed to reach its goal in the excitement it caused. I was at that time between three and four years old. I have been told that erections occurred when I was only two years old. It was between three and four that I used to induce, at all events, the sensation of an erection. But I was nearer five when, sitting on my bed and waiting to be dressed, I got an involuntary erection and called my nurse's attention to it, asking what it meant. The appearance must, therefore, have been usual to me at that date, but certainly the sensation was not. At that time I was totally ignorant of the conditions of puberty, which afterward, when I discovered them, so powerfully affected me. I could not even visualize the private organs of a man. I made no deductions from myself. The only naked bodies I had seen then, I judged from circumstances, not from any actual memory of the facts, were those of my sisters. In the waking dreams which I began to construct, though I recurred often to the one already narrated, the goal of my desire was generally to nestle between the thighs or to have my face pressed against the hinder parts of the object of my worship. But for a time my first dream so engrossed me that I did not indulge in any promiscuity. Gradually, however, my horizon enlarged, and took in, besides the first mentioned, three others, a cousin very much my elder, an uncle, and the curate of the parish. At this stage I began to invent circumstances for the indulgence of my passion. One of the earliest was to imagine myself in a tank with my three lovers floating in the water above me. From this position I visited their limbs in turn. The attraction rested in the thighs and buttocks only. I fancy this limitation of the charm to the lower parts only lasted until actual experience of a more complete embrace made me as much a lover of the arms and breast. Indeed, later, I became more emotionally enamored by these parts than all the rest. At the beginning of things, I simply loved best what my mind could first get hold of. Quite early in my experience, when I was not more than five, I awoke earlier than usual and saw my nurse standing in complete nudity, commencing her toilet. She seemed to me a gross, coarse, and meaningless object. The hair under her armpits displeased me, and still more that on the lower part of her body. In the case of men, directly I came to have cognizance of the same thing on their bodies. The effect was exactly the opposite. It so happened that about this time the gardener had received some injury to his leg, and in showing the bruise to another exhibited before my eyes a skin completely shagged over with dark hair. Though the sight of the bruise repulsed me, my pleasure was intense, and the vision of the gardener's legs was in my bed every night for a week afterward. My point is that the sight of my nurse was liable to rouse interest just as much as the far more prosaic display of the gardener's wounded leg, but my nature made it impossible. It was about this time, if not before, that an enormous sense of shyness with regard to all my private duties began to afflict me. So great was it that I could endure from no hand except my mother's or my nurse's the necessary assistance in buttoning and unbuttoning of my garments, always excepting those who were about my own age, toward whom I felt no privacy whatever. When I was a little more than fifteen, I formed a friendship with a young clerk, a youth of about fifteen, though he seemed to me a grown-up person. One day, as he sat at his desk writing, I sat down and began playing with his feet, investigating the height to which his socks went under his trousers. In this way I obtained six inches of bare leg. Conscious of my courage, I fell to kissing it. My friend laughed, but left me to my devotions in peace. This was the first time in which a feeling of romance mixed itself in my dreams. The physical excitement was less, but the pleasure was greater. I cannot understand why I never repeated the experience. He remained to me an object of very special and tender consideration. In the next episode I have to relate the ideal was totally absent. 
the part i played was passive rather than active i was put to sleep with a boy considerably my senior his initiation led to a physical familiarity between us which was not warm or kind and i was allowed no scope for my own instinctive desires for a warmer kind of contact if i sought it under cover of my companion's slumbers i found myself kicked away only on one occasion did i find a few moments of supreme charm while his sleep remained sound by discovering in these recesses of the sheet an exposed surface of flesh against which i pressed my face in an abandonment of joy for the rest i was a passive participant his pleasure seeming to end in the mere handling of the fleshy portions of my body for this purpose i usually lay face down across his knees so far as i can remember this intimacy led to a decrease in my pursuit of imaginative pleasures for about a year no further development took place at about this date i was circumcised on account of the prepuce being too long between the sixth and seventh years a change of environment brought me into contact with a new set of faces i had then a bed to myself and once more my imagination awoke to life it was at this time that i found myself constructing from men's faces suppositions as to the rest of their bodies a brown face led me to suppose a uniformly brown body a pale face a pale body this idea of variety began to charm me i now made definite choice in my reveries whether i would go to sleep between white thighs or red thighs or brown thighs going to sleep definitely describes the goal of the method to which i had addicted myself as soon as i entered my bed i abandoned myself to the construction of an amour and retained it as long as i had consciousness i may say that i was not conscious of any omissions under these circumstances until some years later when i brought it about by my own act but the pleasure was fairly acute all this time there were secret meetings with my bedfellows of the year before but now they took place by day in various hiding places with little unclothing or exposure and my companion was cold and fastidious and repelled any warmth on my part it became to me a dry sort of ritual i had an idea at the time that the whole thing was so much an original invention of his and mine that there was no likelihood of it being practiced by any one else in the world but this consideration did not restrain me in constructing love scenes with all those whose appearance attracted me at this period nearly every man with whom i came in contact won at least my transient desire only the quite old and deformed lay outside the scope of my wishes many of my amours developed in church the men who sat near me were the objects of my attention and the clergyman whose sermon i did not listen to supplied me with an occasion for reverie on the charms of his person would have for me under other circumstances it must have been at this time that i began to elaborate ideas of serried rank of congregated thighs across which i lay and was dragged i would arrange them in definite order and then imagine myself drawn across from one to the other somewhat forcibly admiration of strength was beginning at this time to have a definite part in my conceptions but anything of the nature of cruelty had not then appealed to me i accept the original dream of my childhood which seems to me still to stand fantastically apart in the inventions to which i now gave myself the sense of being passed across limbs of different texture and color was subtle and pleasurable i think the note of constructive cruelty which now followed arose from an imagined rivalry among my lovers for possession of me the idea that i was desired made me soon take a delight in imagining myself torn and snatched about by the contending parties presently out of this i began constructing definite scenes of violence i was able in imagination to lie in the thick and stress of conglomerated deliciousness of thighs struggling to hold me i was able to imagine at least six bodies encircling me with passionate contact at the same time i had an ingrained feeling of my own physical smallness in relation to the limbs whose contact threw me into such paroxysms of delight a new and sufficiently ludicrous invention took possession of me i imagined myself strapped to the thighs always i think the right one of the man on whom i chose for the time to concentrate my desires and so to be worn by him during his day's work hidden beneath his garments i was not conscious of any difficulty due to my size the charm of bondage and compulsion was here again in the ascendant 
I fancy that it was in this connection that I first anticipated whipping as the delightful climax to my emotions, administered when my possessor, at the end of his day's work, unclothed himself for rest. Up to this stage my attraction to the male organ of generation had been slight and vague. Two things now contributed to bring thought of it into prominence. On two or three occasions when I accompanied farm laborers to their occupations I saw them pause by the way to relieve nature. My extreme shyness as regards to such matters in my own person made this performance in my presence like an outrage on my modesty. It had about it the suggestion of an indecent solicitation to one whose inclination was to headlong and delirious surrender. I stood rooted and flushing with downcast eyes, till the act was over and was conscious for a considerable time of stammering speech and bewildered faculties. When I afterward reviewed the circumstances, they had the same attraction for me that amorous cruelty was just then beginning to exercise on my imagination. My mind secretly embraced the fearful sweetness of the newly discovered sensation, surrounding the performance of the function with all sorts of atrocious and bizarre inventions. For a time my intellect hung back from accepting this as the central and most fiery secret of the male attraction, but shortly afterward, when walking out with my father, I saw him perform the same act. I was overwhelmed with emotion and could barely drag my feet from the spot or my eyes from the damp herbage where he had deposited the waters of secrecy. Even today, when my mind has been long accustomed to the knowledge of generative facts, I cannot disassociate myself from the shuddering charm that moment had for me. The attraction of my father's person had always had for me was now increased tenfold by the performance I had witnessed, though I had not seen the penis in any of these cases. For a considerable time only those lovers were dominant in my imagination whom I had witnessed in the act had so poignantly affected me. My delight now took the form of imagining myself strapped to the thighs of the person while this function was in progress. By this time I must have been eight years old. The cold and secret relationship of which I have given an account had continued, without instructing me in any of the ardent possibilities it might have suggested. No force or cruelty was used upon me. No warmth was lavished. It made little difference that my companion had now discovered the act of masturbation. It had no meaning to me, since it led to no warmth of embrace. His method was to avert himself from me. I had to fawn upon him from the rear, and also to invent indecent stories to stimulate his imagination. I felt myself a despised instrument the mere spectator of an act which if directed toward me with any warmth would have aroused the liveliest appetite at this time as i have since seen my companion was gaining knowledge from the ancient classics for a time some charm was imparted by his instructing me to adopt a superincumbent face-to-face -face embrace the beginning of his puberty was enormously attractive to me had he been less cold-blooded i could have responded passionately to his endearments but he always insisted on rigorous passivity on my part, and he explained nothing. One day, by a small gratuity, he induced me to offer him my mouth, though I still had no comprehension of the result I was helping to attain. Once the orgasm occurred, and the effect was extremely nauseous, after that he was more careful. My companion was approaching manhood, and his demands became more frequent, his exactions more humiliating. At the same time my passion for male love was growing stronger. I was able to construct from the unsatisfactory bondage in which I was held images of bodily embrace which I had not before had sufficient sense of human contact to form, though I seldom imagined any of the acts that in actual experience repulsed me. One day, however, I shirked a particularly repulsive humiliation which my companion had forced upon me. He discovered the deception rose from the prone position in which he lay, and, throwing me across his knees, thrashed me violently. I submitted without a struggle, experiencing a serious sensation of pleasure in the midst of my pain. When he repeated his order I found its accomplishment no longer repulsive. One of the few pleasurable memories this intimacy, extending over years, has left for me is that moment of abject abasement to one who, with no warmth of feeling, had yet once had sufficient energy to be brutal to me. 
it must have been from this incident that the calculated effect of flagellation began to have weight with me when i indulged my imagination a wish to be repulsed trampled violated by the object of my passion took hold of my instincts even then and indeed up to my thirteenth year i had no idea of normal sexual connection i knew vaguely that children were born from women's bodies i did not know and when told i did not believe the true facts of the marital relationship all that i had experienced both in fact and imagination was to me so highly individual that i had no notion any kind kindred to it could exist outside of my own experience i had no notion of sex as the basis of life even when i came gradually to realize that men and women were formed in a way that argued connection with each other i still believed it to be a dissolute sort of conduct not to be indulged in by those who had claims to respectability i had however by this time arrived at a strong attraction toward the organs of generation and all aspects of puberty and my imagination spent itself in a fantastic worship of every sign of masculinity my enjoyment now was to imagine myself forced to undergo physical humiliation and submission to the caprice of my male captors and the central fact became the discharge of urine from my lover over my body and limbs or if i were very fond of him i let it be in my face this was followed usually by a half caressing castigation in which the hand was only instrumental the period of which i am now writing was that of my own entry into school life my imaginary lovers immediately became numerous all the masters and all the boys above a certain age attracted me for too i had in addition a feeling of romantic as well as physical attachment indeed from this time onward i was never without some heroes toward whom i indulged a perfectly separate and tenderly ideal passion the announcement that one was about to leave surprised me into a passionate fit of weeping yet my reserve was so great and my sense of isolation so crushing that i made no effort at intimacy and to one for whom i felt inexhaustible devotion i barely spoke for the first three years though meeting him daily at this time the subjects of my contemplation had distinctly individualized methods of approach thus in one case i imagined we stood face to face in our night gear suddenly mine was stripped from me i was seized and forcibly thrust under his and made to hang with my feet off the ground by my full weight on the erect organ which inserted itself between my thighs so suspended my body enveloped in the folds of his linen and my face pressed upon his heart i underwent a castigation which continued until i was thrown down to receive a charge of urine over my prostate body such images seemed to come independently of my will it was at this time that i found a large pleasure in imagining contact with people whom i disliked the prevailing note of these intimacies was always cruelty to which i submitted with acute relish i discovered however from the ordinary school experiences of corporal punishment that it had no charm to me when administered for school offences even from the hands under which at other times i imagined myself as delighting to receive pain the necessary link was lacking i had perceived on the part of my judge any liking for the operation there would probably have been a response on my side on one occasion i was flogged unjustly conscious as i was of its cruel instead of judiciary character this was the only castigation i received which had in it an element of gratification for my instincts at the same time i never forgave the hand that administered it it is the only instance i remember in myself of a grudge nourished for years meanwhile amid this chaos of confused love and hatred the relish for cruelty and loathing for injustice my first thoroughly romantic and ideal attachment was developing itself i may say of those to whom romance as well as physical attachment bound me that they have remained unchangeable parts of my nature today as it was twenty years ago when i think of them the blood gushes to my brain my hands tingle and moisten with emotion i cannot subdue i am at their feet worshipping them of them my dreams were entirely tender the idea of cruelty never touched the conception i had of them but i returned to that one who was the chief influence of my youth older than myself by only three years he was of fine build and athletic with adolescence showing in his face 
my tremulous beginnings of worship were confirmed by a word of encouragement thrown to me one day as i went to receive my first flogging no doubt my small scared face excited his kind pity i made it my concern afterward to let him know that i had not cried under the ordeal and i believe he passed the word around that i had taken my punishment pluckily so little contact had i with him that beyond constant worship on my part i remember nothing till about three years later i received from him a kind half-joking solicitation spoken in lean and simple language so terrific was my shyness and secrecy that i had even then no idea that familiarity of this sort was common enough in schools i was absolutely unable to connect my own sensation with those of the world at large or to believe that others felt as i did on this occasion i simply felt that some shrewd thrust had been made at me for the detection of my secret he had drawn me upon his knee i sat there silent flushing and dumbfounded he made no attempt to press me he had as he thought said enough if i chose to be reciprocal beyond that he would not tempt me a few years ago i heard of him married and prosperous in following up my emotions in this direction i have far outstripped the period up to which i have given a complete exposition of my development i must have been more than twelve years old before school life persuaded me to face as taught by sniggering novices the actual facts of sexual intercourse at the same time i learned that i had means of extracting enjoyment from my own body in a definite direction which i had not till then suspected a growing resistance on my part to his cold desires had led to a break with my former intimate to the last he had taught me nothing except distaste for himself i now found ready teachers right and left of me one of my schoolfellows invited me to watch him in the process of masturbation the spectacle left me quite unmoved the result appeared to me far less exciting than the discharge of urine which until then i had associated with male virility i was so accustomed to my own lone amorous broodings that the effort and the action required for this process when i attempted to imitate it disconcerted my thoughts and interfered with concentration on my own inventions i had never experienced the pleasure accompanying the spasm of emission and there seemed to be nothing worth trying for along that road i desisted and returned to my reveries i was now in a perfect maze of promiscuity there must have been at least fifty people who attracted me at that time i developed a liking for imagining myself between two lovers generally men who were physical contrasts it was my habit to analyze as minutely as possible those who attracted me to gain intimacy with what was below the surface i studied with attention their hands the wrists where they disappeared showing the hair of the forearm and the neck i estimated the comparative size of the generative organs the formation of the thighs and buttocks and thus constructed a presentment of the whole man the more vividly i could do this the keener was the pleasure i was able to obtain from their contemplated embraces till now i had been absolutely untouched by any moral scruples i had the usual acquiescence in the religious beliefs in which i had been trained it did not enter my head that there was any divine law one way or the other concerning the allurements of the imagination from my thirteenth year slight hints of uneasiness began to creep into my conscience. i began perhaps to understand that the formulas of religion to which i had listened all my life with as little attention as possible had some meaning which now and then touched the circumstances of my own life i had not yet realized that my past foretold my future and that women would be to me a repulsion instead of an attraction where things sexual were concerned i had the full conviction that one day i should be married i had also some fear that as i grew to manhood i might succumb to the temptations of loose women i had an incipient revulsion from such a fate and this seemed to me to indicate that moral stirrings were at work within me one night i was amorously attacked in my bedroom by two of the domestics i experienced an acute horror which i hid under laughter my resistance was so desperate that i escaped with a tickling i had been accustomed to sit on the servants knees a habit i had innocently retained from childhood i can now recall in detail the approaches these women had been used to make me 
at the time i was utterly oblivious that anything was intended i was equally oblivious to things that had a nearer relation to my own feelings in passing along a side street one night i was overtaken by a man who began conversation on the weather he asked me if i were not cold and began passing his hand up and down my back then came a question about caning at school whether certain parts of me were not sore leading to an investigating touch i put his hand aside shyly but did not resent the action presently he was for exploring my trousers pockets and i began to think him a pickpocket repulsed in that direction he returned to rubbing my back the sensation was pleasant i now took him for a pimp who wished to take me to a prostitute and as at that time i had begun to realize that such pleasures were not to my taste i was glad to find myself at my destination and said good-bye sharply leaving him standing full of astonishment at his failure with one who had taken his advances so pleasantly i could not bring myself to believe that others had the same feelings as myself later i realized my escape not without certain amount of regret and constructed for my own pleasure a different termination to the incident i was now so possessed by masculine attraction that i became a lover of all the heroes i read of in books some became so vivid to me as those with whom i was living in daily contact for a time i became an ardent lover of napoleon the incident of his anticipation of the nuptials with his second wife attracting it by its impetuous brutality of edward i and of julius caesar charles the second i remember by a caressing cruelty with which my imagination gifted him jugurtha was a great acquisition bothwell judge jeffreys and many villains of history and fiction appealed to me by their cruelty i had become an adept in the mental construction necessary for the satisfaction of my desires and yet up to that date i had never seen the nude body of a full-grown adult i had no knowledge of the extent to which hair in certain instances develops on the torso indeed my efforts at characterization centered for the most part around the thighs and generative organs at this time one of my schoolfellows saw a common workman known to me by name bathing in a stream with some companions all his body was my informant told me covered with hair from throat to belly in face the man was coarse and repulsive but i now began to regard him as a lovely monstrosity and for many nights embraced the vision of him passionately with face buried in the jungle growth of hair that covered his chest i was for the first time conscious of deliberately and successfully willing not to see his face which was distasteful to me at the same time another schoolfellow told me concerning a master who bathed with the boys that hair showed above his bathing drawers as high as the navel i now began definitely to construct bodies in detail the suggestion of extensive hairiness maddened me with delight but remained in my mind strongly associated with cruelty my hairy lovers never behaved to me with tenderness everything at this period i think tended to draw me toward force and violence as an expression of amativeness a schoolfellow a few years my senior of a cruel bullying disposition took a particular delight in inflicting pain on me he had particularly pointed shoes and it was his custom to make me stand with my back to him while he addressed me in petting and caressing tones just when his words were at their kindness he would inflict a sharp stroke with the toe of his boot so as to reach the most tender part of my fundament the pain was exquisite i was conscious that he experienced sexual pleasure i had seen definite signs of it beneath his clothing and though loathing him i would after had suffered from his kicks throw myself into his imaginary embraces and indulge in a perfect rage of abject submission yet all the time i would gladly have killed him at the age of fourteen i went for a time to a farmhouse where i was allowed to mingle familiarly with the farm labors a fine set of muscular young men i became a great favorite and having childish caressing manners a good deal behind my real age i was allowed to take many liberties with them they all lived under the farmer's roof in the old-fashioned way and in the evening i used to sit on their knees and caress and hug them to my heart's content they took it phlegmatically it apparently gave them no surprise 
one of the men used to return my squeezes and caresses and once allowed me to put my hand under his shirt but there were no further liberties it was not until i was nearly fifteen that the event happened which made me for the first time restless in my forced solitude i was verging on puberty and perhaps in the hope that i should find my own development met by a corresponding warmth i again came into intimate relations with the companion whose frigid performances had caused me weariness and disgust he was now a man having reached majority he put me into his bed while he undressed himself and came toward me in perfect nudity in a moment we were in each other's arms and the deliciousness of that moment intoxicated me suddenly lying on the bed i felt attacked as i thought by an imperative need to make water i leaped up with a hurried excuse but already the paroxysm had subsided no discharge came to my relief yet the need seemed to have passed i returned to my companion but the glamour of the meeting was already over my companion evidently found more pleasure in my person than when i was a mere child i felt moved and flattered by the pleasure he took in pressing his face against certain parts of my body on a second occasion one day i seemed involuntarily about to transgress decency but again as before separated myself and remained ignorant of what it was on which i had verged my excitement at another meeting however i had been allowed to prolong my embrace and to act indeed upon my full instincts once more i felt suddenly the coming of something acutely impending i took my courage in my hands and went boldly forward in another moment i had hold of the mysterious secret of masculine energy to which all my years of delirious imaginings had been but as a waiting at the threshold the knocking on a closed door it was inevitable that from that day our intimacy should dwindle into dissolution though other causes anticipated this natural decay but i no longer found masturbation a dry and wearisome formula in my novitiate i was disheartened to find how long it took me to dissociate myself from the contemplative and attach myself to the active form of self-gratification but i presently found myself committed to the repetition of the act three times a day on almost the last occasion i met my intimate he showed me an exceptional ardor at that meeting he proposed to attempt an act i had not previously considered possible far less had i heard that it was considered the worst criminal connection that could take place i had a slight fear of pain but was willing to gratify him and for the first time found in my submission a union of the two amative instincts which had before disputed sway in me the instinct for tenderness and the instinct for cruelty pedicatio failed to take place but i received an embrace for which the first time gave me full satisfaction my delight was enormous i was filled with emotions i have no words to describe the extraordinary charm of the warm smooth flesh upon mine and the rougher contact of the hairy parts yet i was conscious even at the time that this was but the physical side of pleasure and that he was not and never could be one whom i might truly be said to love i was now in my sixteenth year and under the influence of these and many other emotions then for the first time beginning to seize me a sense of literary power and a desire to express myself through imaginative channels began to take hold of me i feared that my indulgence was having an enfeebling power on my faculties i had begun to experience physical languor and depression and certain religious scruples the result of my early training took hold of me for the first time i became conscious of the ardors i felt toward my own sex were a diversion of the sex instinct itself and to my astonishment and consternation i found by chance the practices i had already indulged in definitely denounced in the bible as an abomination from that moment began a struggle which lasted for years i made a final breach with my former intimate and thereupon a long dispute took place between the conflicting influences that strove for possession of my body for a time i broke off the habit of masturbation but i could not so easily rid myself of the mental indulgence which was now almost an essential sedative for inducing sleep at this time a visit to the seaside where for the first time i was able to see men bathing in complete nudity frankly in the full light of day plunged me again for a time head foremost into imaginative amours 
and my scruples and resolutions were flung to the winds but on the whole i had now entered a stage which for want of a better term i must describe as the emotionally moral to whatever depth of indulgence i descended i carried a sense of obliquity with me i believed that i was a rebel from a law natural and divine of which yet no instinct had been implanted in me i still held unquestioned the truth of the religion i had been brought up in and my whole life every thought of my brain every impulse of my body were in direct antagonism to the will of god at times physical desire broke down these barriers but i practised considerable restraint physically though not mentally and made great efforts to conquer my aversion from women and extreme devotion for men without the slightest success i was thirty however before i found a companion to love me in the way my nature required i am quite a healthy person and capable of working at very high pressure under sexual freedom i have become stronger End of chapter three part nine recording by kirk ziegler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk dot com chapter three studies of the psychology of sex volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 3 Sexual Inversion in Men, Part 10. History 22. T.J., aged 50, man of letters. Height 5 feet 7 inches. Weight 10 stone, but formerly much less belongs to an entirely normal family, all married and with children. Owing to the fact that my mother suffered from some malady the whole period of gestation prior to my birth, I came into the world so puny a child, so ill-nourished, that for some time the doctors despaired of my life. Till the age of puberty, though never ill, I suffered greatly from delicate health. I was abnormally sensitive and all my affections and passions extraordinarily developed. Owing to my brothers being much older than myself, I was thrown into the society of my sister. Till eight years old she was my chief playmate. With her I played with dolls and abandoned myself wholly to the delights of an imaginary land which was much more real to me than the world around me. I never remember learning to read. But at five, The Arabian Nights and Kingsley's Hereward the Wake were my favorite books. Living in the country, the society of other children was difficult to obtain. My whole affection centered in my father, my mother having died when I was a child. This affection for my father was rather a morbid passion which absorbed my life. I dared not leave his side for fear of a final separation from him. I would wake him when asleep to see if he still lived. To this day, though he died twenty-six years ago, his memory haunts me. My first abnormal desires were connected with him. I had seen him occasionally mixturating in the garden alleys or out in the country. These occasions excited me terribly, and I would, if possible, wait till he had gone, and touch the humid leaves, drawing a terrible pleasure from the contact. Afterward, though he never suspected it, desire for him became a consuming passion, and I remember one occasion, when on a holiday, I occupied the same bed with him. The excitement of his propinquity brought on such a formidable attack of heart palpitation that my father called in the family physician on our return home. Needless to say, my heart was found quite sound. The desire still remains after all these years and nothing excites me more even now than the memory of my father in his morning bath. The whole world for me in my early childhood was peopled with imaginary beings. While still a young child I would invent stories and relate them to any listener I could find, one such story lasting three years. I was an omnivorous reader, but my favorite reading was poetry. At seven I could repeat the greater part of Longfellow's poems. Scott followed, then Milton captivated me when I was fourteen. Then came Tennyson, Arnold, Swinburne, and Morris. 
Later came the Greek and Latin poets. From seven years on I wrote verses to my father. Till eight years I was excessively timid of the dark and, indeed, of all loneliness. This passed, however, and developed into an extreme sensitiveness of seeing or meeting people. Even on a country road I would walk miles out of my way to avoid meeting the ordinary yokel. At this period my daydreams were my favorite occupation. Even to the present day my visions take up the greater part of my life. Though timid, I was not wanting in courage. At an early age I would fight boys even older than myself. Later I have risked my life many times in various parts of Europe. As regards sports, I can do a little of everything. Swimming, riding, fencing, shooting, a little of each. Cricket and football I also played passably, but sports never interested me much. Literature became and is the passion of my life, and for some years has remained my sole occupation. At eight years the sexual inversion began to manifest itself, though till I had attained ten years of age I was practically quite innocent. At eight years of age my family removed to another country, and I made the acquaintance of a little boy who attracted me sexually. We masturbated in company, without any reason except the pleasure of seeing each other exposed. Then I had a connection with him, in Annam. This really, at that time, was an exception to my ordinary tastes, which speedily developed into an intense desire of fellatio, and later on of intercrural pleasures. This latter, perhaps, may be accounted for by the visit to our house of a small boy, with whom I slept for about a year. Every night during this period I had intercrural connection with him twice, and sometimes three times. Then came a consuming passion for all young boys, and very old men. Boys after fourteen or fifteen ceased to attract me, more particularly when the hair of the pubes began to develop. From eight to fourteen, when first I had sexual emissions, I masturbated at every opportunity. From fourteen to twenty-seven, always once a day, generally twice and sometimes three times a day. At twenty-seven I took rooms and formed acquaintance with the family occupying the house. The boys, one by one, were allowed to sleep with me, and I conceived an extraordinary passion for one of them, an attachment which lasted till I finally left England. The attachment was much more than that of a man for his wife, and had nothing degrading in it. I was wretched when away from him, and as he was very attached to sport of all kinds, I suffered divers kinds of death each time that I imagined his life to be endangered. I can honestly say that in each of my attachments, and I've had many, the prevailing sentiment was the delight of protecting a weaker being than myself. Each person whom I have loved has been perfectly normal, and all are now fathers of families. Each still regards me with affection and respect, in spite of what has passed between us. All my life I have been possessed with the passion for paternity. I could almost say maternity. Willingly I would have suffered the pains of hell could I have borne a son to the person I loved. That I can honestly say has been the dominant instinct of my life. In my passion I have never been brutal, nor save under the influence of wine have I had connection with men over the age of puberty. In southern Europe my experiences have been the same, a predominant passion for a boy exhibiting itself in every species of protecting care, and though terminating so far as sexual passion was concerned when the boy reached fifteen or sixteen years, yet still lasting and enduring in an honest and unselfish affection. At the age of fifty-one I still masturbate once or twice a week, though I long for someone whom I love to share the pleasure with me. I tried vainly at the age of twenty-seven to bring myself into line with others. Prostitutes caused me horror, whether male or female. I attempted the act of coitus four or five times, twice with women of loose lives and at other times with married women. Save in one case the attempts were either abortive or caused me extreme disgust. Practically from the time of puberty I have attracted sexually not only women but men. Women, oddly enough, though I care nothing for them sexually, either hate me or adore me, and I have had five offers of marriage. 
at the same time up till five years ago i was pursued by men and have the oddest experiences both in england and abroad in the early period of this history i suffered tremendously from the feeling that i was isolated and unique in the world i strove against the habit of masturbation and my perverted tastes with all my mind scourges vigils burnings all were of no avail deeper reading in the classics showed me how common was the taste of sex for the same sex at twenty-seven i began to have a settled philosophy then as now i made endless resolutions to avoid masturbation though i can see nothing wrong in the mutual act of two persons drawn together by love i am and always have been an extremely religious man and if i am not altogether an orthodox catholic do my duties and have a high sense of the supernatural i suffered much from melancholy from my earliest years at eighteen though nothing definitely was wrong a vague but profound malaise induced me to open the veins of my arm i fainted however and was promptly succored at the age of thirty-five after a return from abroad i took an enormous dose of poison this time again a singular coincidence saved me and i once more came back to life after this i purposely went abroad to obtain death and sought it in every possible way quite in vain as you see one thing i have never had a fear of but have always longed for death i am sure that if we only knew what joys lay on the other side of death the whole world would rush madly to suicide i have apart from any perversion of taste an honest and genuine passion for children and animals and i am never happier than when in their society both adore me my life has not dimmed nor deadened my faculties for i am occupied at the present time with very important work and i write steadily but my real life is past in my visions which take me to another world quite as real as this sensuous one and where i always retreat on all occasions possible and yet a strange paradox i am a convinced stoic and almost confine my reading to epictetus marcus aurelius and the imitation i am extremely emotional fond of the society of women though i loathe the sexual side of them and when i love though passion is certainly inextricably mixed the prevailing sediment is spiritual i shall probably end up by being a carthusian or a faker history twenty three englishman aged seventy of german descent on the father's side was first child of his mother who was thirty-six at his birth a younger brother normal has no other relatives he was brought up in england and went to school at the age of thirteen at a very early age between six and eight was deeply impressed by the handsome face of a young man a royal trumpeter on horseback seen in a procession this and the sight of the naked body of young men in a rowing match on the river caused great commotion but not of a definitely sexual character this was increased by the sight of a beautiful male model of a young turk smoking with his dress open in front showing much of the breast and below the waist he became familiar with pictures admired the male figures of italian martyrs and the full rich forms of the antinous and he read with avidity the arabian nights and other oriental tales translations from the classics suetonius petronius etc he drew naked models in life schools and delighted in male ballet dancers as a child he used to perform in private theatricals he excelled in female parts and sang the songs of madame vestris encouraged by his father the sexual organs have never been fully developed and the testicles though large are of a flabby consistence he cannot whistle he thinks he ought to have been a woman at school he was shy and reserved and had no particular intimacy with anyone although he once desired it he learned self-abuse from his younger brother who had learned it from an older boy he has never had erotic dreams he never touched anyone but his brother until later when traveling in italy and then only his fellow traveler when traveling in asia minor he had many opportunities 
but always put them aside from fear, afterward regretting his fearfulness. He yearned for intimacy with particular friends, but never dared to express it. He went much to theaters, and what he saw there incited him to masturbation. When he was about thirty years of age, his reserve and his fear of treachery and extortion were at last overcome by an incident which occurred late at night at the Royal Exchange, and again in a dark recess in the gallery of the Olympic Theater, when Gustavus Brooke was performing. From that time the Adelphi Theater, the Italian Opera, and the open parks at night became his fields of adventure. He remarks that among people crowding to witness a fire he found many opportunities. His especial intimates were a railway clerk and an Italian model. In more recent years he has chiefly found gratification among footmen and policemen. He is exclusively passive, also likes mutual fellatio. He used greatly to admire finely developed forms, conscious of his own shortcomings, shapely limbs and delicate brown hair, and always admired strength and manly vigor. He never took any interest in boys and has always been indifferent to women. History 24 A medical man, English, aged 30. He believes that his father, who was a magistrate, was very sympathetic toward men. On several occasions he has sat with him on the bench when cases of indecent assault were brought up. He discharged three cases, although there could be little doubt as to their guilt, and was very lenient to the others. From age of nine he loved to sleep with his brother, ten years older, who was in the Navy. They slept in different beds, and the child went to bed early, but he always kept awake to see his brother undress, as he adored his naked body and would then get into his bed. He learned the habit of masturbation from his brother at the age of nine. At that time there was no sexual orgasm, but watching it in his brother was a perpetual source of wonder and pleasure. During his brother's absence at sea, the boy longed for his return and would practice self-abuse with the thought of his brother's naked body before him. This brother's death was a source of great grief. At the age of twelve he went to boarding school and was constantly falling in love with good-looking boys. He was always taken into one of the bigger boys' beds. At this age he was thoroughly able to enjoy the sexual orgasm with boys. His erotic dreams have always been of men and especially of boys. He has never dreamed sexually of women. From the age of nine to the age of twenty-one, when he left school, he never gave women a thought sexually, though he always liked their society. For two years after leaving school, he had connection with women, not because he thought there was sin in loving his own sex, but because he regarded it as a thing that no one did after leaving school. During these two years, he still really preferred men and used to admire the figures of soldiers and sailors. He then paid a visit to London which may be described in his own words, I went to see an old schoolfellow who was living there. In his room was a young fellow, extremely good-looking, with a good figure and charming manners. From that moment all my past recollections came back. I could not get him out of my mind. In fact, I was in love with him. I pictured him naked before me as a lovely statue. My dreams were frequent at night, always of him. For a fortnight afterward I practiced masturbation with the picture of his lovely face and form always before me. We became fast friends, and from that day women have never entered my thoughts. Although up to the present he has no wish or intention to marry, he believes that he will eventually do so, because it is thought desirable in his profession. But he is quite sure that his love and affection for men and boys will never lessen. In earlier life he preferred men from twenty to thirty-five. Now he likes boys from sixteen upward. Grooms, for instance, who must be good-looking, well-developed, cleanly, and of a lovable, unchanging nature, but he would prefer gentlemen. He does not care for the mere mutual embracing and reciprocal masturbation. When he really loves a man he desires pedicatio, in which he himself is the passive subject. He has curly hair and a mustache, and well-developed sexual organs. His habits are masculine. He has always enjoyed field sports, and can swim, ride, dive, and skate. 
at the same time he is devoted to music can draw and paint and is an ardent admirer of male statuary while fond of practical occupations of every sort he dislikes anything that is theoretical he adds as a medical man i fail to see morally any unhealthiness or anything that nature should be ashamed of in connection with and sympathy for men history twenty five a s schoolmaster aged forty six my father was i should say below the average in capacity for friendship he liked young girls and was never interested in boys he was a man of strongly puritanical morality capable of condemning with gloomy bitterness he was also a man capable of great sacrifice for principle and mentally very well endowed my mother was a clever practical woman with wide sympathies she was capable of warm friendship especially toward those younger than herself her father whom i never saw was a teacher he was devoted to his wife but also delighted in the company of young men he had always some young man on his arm my mother would tell me my mother's family is of welsh descent i learned to read at five and i can scarcely have been more than six when i used to read again and again david's lament for absalom even now i can dimly recall the serene charm for me of that melancholy refrain o oh, my son absalom o oh, absalom my son my son of late when i have thought of the amount of devotion i have shown to lads and the amount i have sometimes suffered for them i have felt as if there were something almost weirdly prophetic in that early incident i was always an impressionable creature my mother was very musical and her singing got hold of me wonderfully the dramatic and the poetic always strongly appealed to me i felt i should like to act but i never dared in the same way i felt that one day i should like to be a schoolmaster but i dared not say so a shy retiring creature was obviously unfitted for such occupations well the teaching came about and the strange part was that the boys were somehow or other attracted to me and the worst customers were attracted most and there came a chance of acting too owing to some difficulties about the cast in a play at school i took a part after that i knew that within a certain range i could act i spent two holidays with the dramatic company i should undoubtedly have remained on the stage but for one thing i don't wish to be sanctimonious but dirty and ugly jokes are odious to me it was this sort of thing that drove me away i threw myself into the schoolwork instead it was partly the dramatic interest partly a quite genuine interest in human nature that led me to do some preaching too when i had been badly hurt by one or two youngsters whom i loved i thought of going in for pastoral work but this too was given up and very wisely i should never be able to work comfortably with any organization for one thing i have a way of taking on new ideas and organizations do not like that for another all social functions are an anathema to me interest in art as usually understood began to be marked only after i was thirty it started with architecture and passed on to painting and sculpture the tendency to do rather a variety too great a variety of things characterizes many uranians we are rather like the label chemical compounds our molecules readily rearrange themselves as a boy of ten i had the ordinary sweethearting with a girl of the same age the incident is worth perhaps a little further comment for the following reason when i was sixteen years old the girl lived with us for a year she was a nice pleasant bright girl and she thought a great deal of me i was strongly attached by her i remember especially one little incident i had been showing her how to do some algebra and she was kneeling at the table by the side of my chair her hair was flowing over her shoulders and she looked rather charming she expressed warm admiration of the way i had worked the problem out i remember that i deliberately squashed out the feeling of attraction that came over me i scarcely know why i did this but i fancy there was a vague sense that i did not want my work disturbed 
there was no sexual attraction or at least none that was manifest the girl there was no doubt grew to love me i am sorry to say that in two other cases later women loved me and both permanently remained unmarried on my account i sometimes feel that in a wisely free society i should be able to give both of these women children that i believe i could do and i think it would be an immense satisfaction to them a permanent union with a woman would however be impossible to me a permanent union with a man would i believe be possible at least i know that attractions which have been at all homosexual in character have in my case been very lasting i was strongly attracted when not more than thirteen to a lad slightly older it was a love story there was no doubt but i do not recollect any outer sexual signs there were other passing cases but in no case was there any warm response till i was fifteen I then made friends with a lad of entirely different type from myself. I was a reader. I liked long walks and fresh air, but I was too shy to go in for sports. Indeed, I was frightfully shy. He was a great sportsman and always at home in society, but he asked me to help him with some work, and we took to working together. I grew passionately fond of him. His caresses always caused some erection. Personally, I believe it would have been wiser to have obtained complete sexual expression. The absence of knowledge led to two distinctly undesirable results. The first was marked congestion and pain at times. The second was a tendency to a sort of modified masochism. There is always, I suppose, some erotic attraction about the buttocks, and, of course, also, to boys, they afford an irresistibly attractive mark for a good smack. I found that when this lad spanked me it produced some amount of sexual excitement, and the desire for this form of stimulus grew upon me. The result, in my case, was bad. It was sensualism, not love. I can say this with confidence, because in a much later case of deeply passionate love I shrank from any such method, but the mutual naked embrace I found was for me an absolutely natural and pure expression of love. I never felt any touch of grossness in it, and it destroyed the earlier, and for me at least, less wholesome desire. The school friendship disappeared with the marriage of my friend. I was furiously jealous, and the young man's mother was opposed to me, but I still think of that early friendship with tenderness. I know that my boyfriend was the first who made me capable of self-expression, the first who taught me how to make friends at all, and if he still cared for me, I know that his love would be dear to me still. My chief regret, as I look back, is that I did not know about these things early. I cannot but think that all youngsters should be spoken to about the love of comrades and encouraged to seek help in any sort of trouble that this may bring. We homogenic folk may be but a small percentage of mankind, but our numbers are still great, and surely the making or marring of our lives should count for something. At college I fell violently in love with a friend with whom I did work in science. He loved me too, though not with such heat. He also was largely Uranian, but this I only realized a year or two back. He remains unmarried and is still my friend. We did some research together, which is pretty well known. I am quite sure that the love we had for each other gave tremendous zest to our work and greatly increased our powers. While I was working at college, I was interested in a lad who was working as an errand boy for a city firm. I helped him to get better training and spent money on him. My father was making me some allowance at the time and demurred. I said I would in future support myself, and in this way came to take up schoolmastering. I at once became quite absorbed in my work with the boys. Of course I loved them. And here I feel I must touch upon what seems to me a characteristic of most of us Uranians. Our genital organs are with us ordinarily and usually organs of expression. The clean-minded, heterogenic man is apt to look upon such a view of the genital organs as monstrous. We, on the other hand, are compelled, at least for ourselves, to regard it as the natural and pure one. 
for my own part i had many puritan prejudices prejudices that i retained from many a long and weary day but my affection to those of my own sex so often expressed itself by some sexual stirring and more or less erection that i was obliged to look upon this as inevitable and in general i paid no attention to it whatever it was the older boys who sometimes attracted me strongly my love for them was i know a genuinely spiritual thing though inevitably having some physical expression i was capable of great devotion to them and sacrifice for them and i would certainly rather have died than have injured them the boys got on well with me i was never weak with them and i was able to allow all kinds of familiarities without any loss of respect the older boys usually out of class called me by my christian name and i remember one writing to ask me whether he might do so as it made him feel nearer to me a few of the lads i of course loved with special devotion they kissed me and loved to have me embrace them one of these was i now know pure uranian and there was in his case certainly some sexual response but though i often slept with him when he was a lad of seventeen or eighteen there was never any idea in our minds of any sexual act we are still warm friends and always kiss when we meet looking back upon those days i feel that i was a little inclined to pass on from one love to another but each was a genuine devotion and involved real hard work on the lad's behalf and i know that where the lad stuck to me into manhood a real tenderness and love remained still while teaching i made the acquaintance of a nonconformist minister who though happily married had certainly some homogenic tendencies he was most devoted to boys and helped me with regard to some difficult cases it was the difficult cases that always attracted me i had to punish these lads and my friend recommended spanking with the hand on the bare buttocks i remember that i adopted this method because it might have been thought specially dangerous to me it certainly never produced in me the remotest suggestion of any sexual act though it did sometimes produce a slight amount of sexual excitement i disregarded this or put it out of my mind as i found the method most efficacious it was capable of great variation of intensity and the boys were always ready to joke about it i never came across a case where any sexual excitement was produced by it the boys whom i had to be most down on almost always however grew fonder of me there might be a slight and normal masochistic tendency in most boys and perhaps the erogenic character of the buttocks has something to do with the development of affection if so i am inclined to regard it as normal and useful rather than otherwise for in my experience no undesirable result was ever produced but then of course there was no playing with the business that might i am sure in some cases be decidedly injurious one experience of my schoolmastering days is i think important in its bearing upon general sexual psychology i always noticed that during the term i was specially free from wet dreams what is noteworthy is this during term there was never anything more than a very partial sexual expression of any feeling of mine such expression indeed as was wholly inevitable there was therefore no actual loss of semen and it seems clear that the wet dreams were not due to mere physical pressure the psychic satisfaction of love in this case made the complete physical expression less urgent but it was a love of a distinctly tender kind that was needed to keep the physical from obtruding of that further experience has made me sure i am moreover now convinced that a mutual uranian love will reach its best results both spiritual and physical where there is complete sexual expression of the character of the sexual dreams i have had there is not much to be said during the period of masochistic tendency they were masochistic in character otherwise they have been dreams simply of the naked embrace usually there has been a considerable element of ideal love in the dream i have not more than three times at most dreamed of intercourse with one of the opposite sex there was only in one case anything that i could call actual emotion in such a dream 
the other dreams have not often not always been dreams of real yearning and not at all what i should call merely sensual in the course of time i wanted more freedom to do things in my own way than could be obtained in a public school i started a school of my own the work was for a good many years very happy i loved the boys and they loved me i was active ardent and they made a chum of me but people got into the way of sending me awkward customers and i poured out my love on these i used myself up for them unfortunately though i was never orthodox my puritanical morality was still strong within me my views of human psychology were too limited and i imposed them on the boys some were very devoted but as years went by and the proportion of malvaisuhets increased there tended to be a split in the small camp and one or two boys whom i loved deceived me terribly to a man of my temperament this was heart-rending and from then the work was doomed troubles at school went along with troubles at home and these things contributed to center my affection upon a lad who was with me and who had given me much trouble for some reason or other i went on believing that he would get right deceit was his great difficulty he was certainly partly homosexual himself looking back i can see that with a wider and more charitable knowledge i could have dealt more wisely and helpfully with certain homosexual episodes of his i am convinced now that mere sweeping condemnation of the physical is not the wholesale way of help however to cut the story short all seemed at last to go well and the lad was growing into a young man our love deepened and we always slept together but quite ascetically later when quite in his young manhood he had left school there was unfortunately misunderstandings with his parents who forbade him to sleep with me what followed is of some importance up till then though certainly his affection seemed ardent i had observed no sexual signs on his part i had been quite frank with him as to mine he was then nineteen and i thought old enough to have things explained to him sleeping with him i had found peaceful and helpful and more than once he told me that it greatly helped him but after we were forbidden to sleep together i found the passion in me more difficult to control and it suddenly leaped out in him we were still however rather ascetic though we used to kiss each other and we used to embrace naked this produced emission not infrequently with me but only once with him though always powerful erection i would not allow any friction perhaps this was a mistake a more complete expression might have helped him all my life i had been hungry for a complete response and at one time the lad thought he could give it he was then nearing twenty i have never been so happy in my life he said it was a blow to me when i found he had mistaken his own feelings but i was quite ready to accept what love he could give i also never dreamed of any sort of insistence on sexual expression with such love as he could give i was quite ready to make myself content the true measure of love wrote a uranian schoolmaster to me once is self-sacrifice not what will you give but what will you give up not what you will do for him but what will you forego for his sake i quote this gladly for the conventional english moralists regard an invert as some kind of deformed beast i can only say that i tried to realize the ideal which these words express no moralist would have helped me one whit the parents also separated us they have done much harm by their mistake how difficult it is for parents to allow freedom to their children their ideal is successful constraint not free self-discovery but in spite of them and in spite of the separation i know that my friend and i have helped each other there is one fear parents have which i believe is unwarranted as far as i have seen i do not conclude that the early expression of homosexual love prevents heterosexual love from developing later where this love is part of the individual's inborn nature it will show itself i do however believe that a noble homogenic love in early life will sometimes help a lad to avoid a low standard of heterogenic attachment the greeks did well 
at their best time in cultivating and ennobling the homogenic love amongst us as can be understood by all who know the working of society taboos it is the baser forms that are unhindered the noblest forms that are debased we yearnings are i think dependent upon individual love many of us i know need to work for an individual to do our best is this the outcome of the woman in the uranian temperament and the tragedy of our fate is that we whose souls vibrate only to the touch of the hand of eros are faced with the fiercest taboo of all that can give our lives meaning the other taboos have been given up one by one will not this the last taboos soon vanish i have known lives darkened by it weakened by it crushed out by it how long are the western moralists to maim and brand and persecute where they do not understand end of chapter three part ten recording by kirk ziggler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk dot com chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 3, Sexual Inversion in Men, Part 11. The next case belongs to a totally different class from all the preceding histories. These, all British or American, were obtained privately they are not the inmates of prisons or of asylums and in most cases they have never consulted a physician concerning their abnormal instincts they pass through life as ordinary sometimes as honored members of society the following case which happens to be that of an american is acquainted with both the prison and the lunatic asylum there are several points of interest in his history and he illustrates the way in which sexual inversion can become a matter of medical legal importance i think however that i am justified in believing that the proportion of sexually inverted persons who reach the police court or the lunatic asylum is not much larger in proportion to the number of sexually inverted persons among us than it is among my cases for the documents on which i have founded the history of guy olmsted I am indebted to the kindness of Dr. Talbot of Chicago, well known from his studies of abnormalities of the jaw and face, so often associated with nervous and mental abnormality. He knew the man who addressed to him the letters from which I here quote. History 26. On the 28th of March, 1894, at noon, in the open street in Chicago, Guy T. Olmsted fired a revolver at a letter carrier named William L. Clifford he came up from behind and deliberately fired four shots the first entering clifford's loins the other three penetrating the back of his head so that the man fell and was supposed to be fatally wounded olmsted made little attempt to escape as a crowd rushed up with the usual cry of lynch him but wavered his revolver exclaiming i'll never be taken alive and when a police officer disarmed him don't take my gun let me finish what i have to do this was evidently an allusion, as will be seen later on, to an intention to destroy himself. He eagerly entered the prison van, however, to escape the threatening mob. Olmsted, who was thirty years of age, was born near Danville, Illinois, in which city he lived for many years. Both parents were born in Illinois. His father, some twenty years ago, shot and nearly killed a wealthy coal operator. Induced to commit the crime, it is said, by a secret organization of a hundred prominent citizens to whom the victim had made himself obnoxious by bringing suits against them for trivial cases the victim became insane but the criminal was never punished and died a few years later at the age of forty-four this man had another son who was considered peculiar guy olmsted began to show signs of sexual perversity at the age of twelve he was seduced we are led to believe by a man who occupied the same bedroom olmsted's early history is not clear from the data to hand it appears that he began his career as a schoolteacher in connecticut 
and that he there married the daughter of a prosperous farmer but shortly after he fell in love with her male cousin whom he describes as a very handsome young man this led to a separation from his wife and he went west he was never considered perfectly sane and from october eighteen eighty six to may eighteen eighty nine he was in the kankakee insane asylum his illness was reported as of three years duration and caused by general ill health heredity doubtful habits good occupation that of a school teacher his condition was diagnosed as paranoia on admission he was irritable alternately excited and depressed he returned home in good condition at this period and again when examined later olmstead's physical condition is described as on the whole normal and fairly good height five feet eight inches weight one hundred and fifty nine pounds special senses normal genitals abnormally small with rudimentary penis his head is asymmetrical and is full at the occiput slightly sunken at the bregma and the forehead is low his cephalic index is seventy eight the hair is sandy and normal in amount over the head face and body his eyes are gray small and deeply set the zygomi are normal the nose is large and very thin there is arrested development of upper jaw the ears are excessively developed and malformed the face is very much lined the nasolabial fissure is deeply cut and there are well-marked horizontal wrinkles on the forehead so that he looks at least ten years older than his actual age the upper jaw is of a partial v-shape the lower well developed the teeth and their tubercles and the alveolar process are normal the breasts are full the body is generally well developed the hands and feet are large olmstead's history is defective for some years after he left kankakee in october eighteen ninety two we hear of him as a letter carrier in chicago during the following summer he developed a passion for william clifford a fellow letter carrier about his own age also previously a schoolteacher and regarded as one of the most reliable and efficient men in the service for a time clifford seems to have shared this passion or to have submitted to it but he quickly ended the relationship and urged his friend to undergo medical treatment offering to pay the expenses himself olmstead continued to write letters of the most passionate description to clifford and followed him about constantly until the latter's life was made miserable in december eighteen ninety three clifford placed the letters in the postmaster's hands and olmstead was requested to resign at once olmstead complained to the civil service commission at washington that he had been dismissed without cause and also applied for reinstatement but without success in the meanwhile apparently on the advice of friends he went into hospital and in the middle of february eighteen ninety four his testicles were removed no report from the hospital is to hand the effect of removing the testicles was far from beneficial and he began to suffer from hysterical melancholia a little later he went into hospital again on march nineteenth he wrote to dr talbot from the mercy hospital chicago i returned to chicago last wednesday night but felt so miserable i concluded to enter a hospital again and so came to mercy which is very good as hospitals go but i might as well go to hades as far as any hope of my getting well is concerned i am utterly incorrigible utterly incurable and utterly impossible at home i thought for a time that i was cured but i was mistaken and after seeing clifford last thursday i have grown worse than ever so far as my passion for him is concerned heaven only knows how hard i have tried to make a decent creature out of myself but my vileness is uncontrollable and i might as well give up and die i wonder if the doctors knew that after emasculation it was possible for a man to have erections commit masturbation and have the same passion as before i am ashamed of myself i hate myself but i can't help it i have friends among nice people play the piano love music books and everything that is beautiful and elevating yet they can't elevate me because this load of inborn vileness drags me down and prevents my perfect enjoyment of anything 
Doctors are the only ones who understand and know my helplessness before this monster. I think and work till my brain whirls, and I can scarce refrain from crying out my troubles. This letter was written a few days before the crime was committed. When conveyed to the police station, Olmstead completely broke down and wept bitterly, crying, Oh, Will, Will, come to me. Why don't you kill me and let me go to him? At this time he supposed he had killed Clifford. A letter was found on him as follows. Mercy, March 27th, to him who cares to read. Fearing that my motives in killing Clifford and myself may be misunderstood, I write this to explain the cause of this homicide and suicide. Last summer Clifford and I began a friendship which developed into love. He then recited the details of the friendship and continued. After playing a lit rhapsody for Clifford over and over, he said that when our time came to die, he hoped we would die together, listening to such glorious music as that. Our time has now come to die, but death will not be accompanied by music. Clifford's love has, alas, turned to deadly hatred. For some reason, Clifford suddenly entered our relations and friendship. In his cell he behaved in a wildly excited manner and made several attempts at suicide, so that he had to be closely watched. A few weeks later he wrote to Dr. Talbot, Cook County, Gowell, April 23rd. I feel as though I had neglected you in not writing you in all this time, though you may not care to hear from me, as I have never done anything but trespass on your kindness. But please do me the justice of thinking that I never expected all this trouble as I thought Will and I would be in our graves and at peace long before this. But my plans failed miserably. Poor Will was not dead, and I was grabbed before I could shoot myself. I think Will really shot himself, and I feel certain others will think so too, when the whole story comes out in court. I can't understand the surprise and indignation my acts seem to engender, as it was perfectly right and natural that Will and I should die together, and nobody else's business. Do you know I believe that poor boy will yet kill himself, for last November, when in my grief and anger told his relations about our marriage, he was so frightened, hurt, and angry that he wanted us both to kill ourselves. I acquiesced gladly in his proposal to commit suicide, but he backed out in a day or two. I am glad now that Will is alive, and I am glad that I am alive, even with the prospect of years of imprisonment before me but I will cheerfully endure for his sake, and yet for the last ten months his influence has so completely controlled me, both body and soul, that if I have done right, he should have the credit for my good deeds, and if I have done wrong, he should be blamed for the mischief, as I have not been myself at all, but a part of him, and happy to merge my individuality with his. Olmstead was tried privately in July. No new points were brought out, he was sentenced to the criminal insane asylum. Shortly afterward, while still in the prison at Chicago, he wrote to Dr. Talbot, As you have been interested in my case from a scientific point of view, there is a little something more I might tell you about myself, but which I have withheld, because I was ashamed to admit certain facts and features of my deplorable weakness. Among the few sexual perverts I have known, I have noticed that all are in the habit of often closing the mouth with the lower lip protruding beyond the upper, usually due to arrested development of upper jaw. I noticed the peculiarity in Mr. Clifford before we became intimate, and I have often caught myself at the trick. Before that operation my testicles would swell and become sore and hurt me, and have seemed to do so since just as a man will sometimes complain that his amputated leg hurts him. Then, too, my breasts would swell, and about the nipples would become hard and sore and red. Since the operation, there has never been a day that I have been free from sharp shooting pains down the abdomen to the scrotum, being worse at the base of the penis. Now that my fate is decided, I will say that really my passion for Mr. Clifford is on the wane, but I don't know whether the improvement is permanent or not. I have absolutely no passion for other men, and have begun to hope now that I can yet outlive my desire for Clifford, or at least control it. I have not yet told of this improvement in my condition because I wished people to still think I was insane, 
so that I would be sure to escape being sent to the penitentiary. I know I was insane at the time I tried to kill both Clifford and myself, and feel that I don't deserve such a dreadful punishment as being sent to a state prison. However, I think it was that operation and my subsequent illness that caused my insanity rather than passion for Clifford. I should very much like to know if you really consider sexual perversion an insanity. When discharged from the criminal insane asylum, Olmsted returned to Chicago and demanded his testicles from the city postmaster, whom he accused of being a systemized conspiracy against him. He asserted that the postmaster was one of the chief agents in a plot against him, dating from before the castration. He was then sent to the Cook Insane Hospital. It seems probable that a condition of paranoia is now firmly established. End of Chapter 3, Part 11 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah, voiceovers by Kirk.com.